Six weeks on from the Championship's previous contest at Le Castellet and Circuit Paul Ricard, we visit Spain for the second time in 2023. But this is a brand new venue in the history of the European Le Mans series, of the Le Mans series indeed as well. Never has it come to Motorland Aragon. We're not that far away from where we started proceedings back in April, about a three hour drive from Barcelona in the Aragon region of Spain. And uh, a great following of fans who have. Uh, frequented this venue throughout the course of the day. Qualifying held at 10.15 this morning through till just after midday. It's been a long, long wait until we get the chance to race into the night time, six o'clock local time start, all the way through till 10 p.m. Thank you for joining us, hopefully for the duration. My name's Johnny Palmer, and I'm joined as ever by Graham Goodwin, the editor of DailySportsCard.com. It's been a little while since we've been able to enjoy a night race in the ELMS, and here we are for the second time, as I say, to the visit of Spain. In fact, there's a, a, lot, a real Iberian sense of the championship because we'll end with a double header on the Algarve at Portimao, that to come in October. We've already been to Barcelona and Le Castellet, as mentioned uh, last month. And in September, there'll be the four hours of Spa, Francochamp in its traditional spot on the calendar. But yeah, night race returns, Graham. It does, and uh, great to be at a new venue. Uh, it's also great that the temperature has come down by a good 10 degrees or more uh, from the recent days. Thierry Bouvet there on the left-hand side, the technical director of the ACO. Uh, chatting to Niliani, Tatiana Calderon and uh, Juan Pablo Montoya amongst the well-known drivers on this grid, and there's plenty of them. This, though, is the 5.344-kilometre circuit. Uh, three sectors mixed between the tight and the technical, the challenging, and the absolutely uh, foot to the floor, 1.1-kilometre uh, straight down to a hairpin bend, and a tricky set of corners, uh, Johnny Palmer, before you complete the lap. Yeah, that high-speed S-bend, which really is spent acceler accelerating out of a very, very slow turn 16, but a great overtaking opportunity. You need to just gently guide the car through turns 17 and 18 and back over the line. There are three different classes of car contained within this championship, although four subcategories, because remember LMP2 is split into LMP2 standard, where you have to have a silver as part of your three driver lineup, and LMP2 Pro-Am, where there is a bronze as part of the combination. We're focusing at the moment on GTE, a brief glimpse of the championship leader for Iron Lynx and Claudio Schiavone. That car carries 25 extra kilos of success ballast because it's the championship leader, but also a good result in the previous two races. And just caught a glimpse there of the three drivers that will be at the wheel of the number 16 Proton Competition car. Qualifying didn't go all the way, for all the, the positive way for Ryan Hardwick. He had an off to cause a red flag, but was allowed to continue in the session after the car was buried in the gravel track on the exit of turn 15 but permitted to rejoin and actually posted a third placed time behind Formula Racing's Johnny Lawson and the 66 JMW Motorsport crew though and Martin Berry more crucially took the pole position again the 66 car then out front of a really fantastic 12 car GTE field yeah, and it's uh, the last half of the season to come for the last time for GTE, and we're going to be shortly hearing the national anthem of Spain. We wait for that, and uh, we'll pause for that, as of course we should. Quite blustery now as well as we're being cooler. It is, as you saw, still 30 degrees or so, but uh, windy as well, and it's a cool wind for the first time this week. So after the introduction, it will be a live rendition of the Spanish national anthem to really get us in the mood. Here we go.
Fuerte aplauso para getting the reception it deserves and everyone up and down pit lane with their round of applause as well. Staying in position though, I get the sense there's more to come. So this will be the national anthem of Spain, I would think. Here we go. I love a bit of bassoon. I was just about to say the same. Yeah. Much, much underrated instrument. It really is. I had a good mate at high school who played that, yep. and he was legendary in our uh, peer group. I tell you, the bassoon players often overlooked. It, it may I look like the like core a, on clay. Yeah, it, it may look like a brown drain pipe with a trumpet bolted onto it, but it's so much nice for sound. It is, it is, to the uh, fine-tuned ear. A little earlier today, the pit lane was open to the fans that are around the uh, Motorland Aragon circuit get their real first chance unless they've made the trip to Barcelona previously to see these Le Mans style cars up close and uh, not before time because of course we are waving goodbye to the GTE category at the end of the season and uh, in a couple of years time a year and a bit there'll be a significant change to LMP3s as well so so many photographs and autographs being done and a lot of happy customers as well and sensibly, a lot of the fans are sheltering beneath trees, but uh, plenty of them in the open grandstands as well. It is a lot cooler than the 42 and in some places 43 degrees Celsius that we've had to almost suffer in this part of Spain. And that's not usual for August. It, it's certainly very, very close to record highs for this time of year more akin to the mid to late 30s on a, an August summer's day. But the heat wave has struck not only Spain, but also Portugal, Italy, and particularly the south of France. But amazingly, at the end of this race, we will still only be halfway through the 2023 season. So there's still plenty of points on offer and also lots of action, whether you're here at the track live or indeed uh, able to watch as the races are live streamed. I reckon the last night race we had was when we went to Le Castellet Correct. a couple of years ago twice. It was the Le Castellet 240 uh, that ran a, a similar time. It was a 6.30 start, that race, Dark a couple of years wet, ago. I think, if I remember rightly. That yes, one. I think there was some remember, wet uh, weather as well. Ilames Santa, Mo Smith, turned up to the press room uh, looking somewhat bedraggled. In indeed. But uh, happy. I'm sure. The fourth-placed number 11 Euro International car is uh, in position on the grid. It'll be Adam Alley to take the start there after it was qualified earlier on by Matt Bell. And Michael Jensen, uh, sorry, Michael Jensen, I should say, for Team Virage in the number eight car will start from third position. We'll grab a sight of his car in a moment or two as well. So it'll start in daylight. Sunset is 8.45, pretty much on the nose. So a good portion of the remaining race will be in absolute darkness. Now there's a little bit of floodlighting around this circuit, picking out the apex, uh, the crucial apices of this circuit. But otherwise, I think certainly heading up the hill and then around turns 8, 9, 10 and 11, that could be in absolute darkness. And there was one free practice session held entirely, just about entirely in uh, darkness conditions last night for 90 minutes. It was an 8.30 start all the way through till 10 o'clock. But otherwise, yep. all the sessions have been held in the daytime. Oh, you popped in up to watch the cars trackside and uh, came I did. back impressed. I no, I really was, because having not spectated at this circuit before, my first visit, in fact, to Aragon, and sitting in the grandstand that overlooks Turn 1, they don't half approach at a high rate of knots, but then scrub all the speed off and then properly monster the kerb at that 90-degree left-hander. One thing we are going to get uh, with a lot of cloud cover, as you can see, at the moment. So darkness will fall just that little bit quick, more quickly. It'll be far less reflected sunlight and from the the canopy that the sky provides here. It's a uh, big sky, as they say. Very low lying. Yes. 
and uh, spectacular. We may not get that uh, sunset that the photographers have been waiting for the last five days. God, it was great last night. I know they do. And I've, I've overheard them. They haven't actually come pleading to me directly, but I have heard the conversations elsewhere in the press room. They love a sunset shot, do photographers. And if they're denied of that, uh, not very happy. Anyway, Sarah Lazito earlier on providing some incredible entertainment in the paddock with her abilities on a motorcycle. On a big motorcycle at that. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, not only that, she got the pizzas here remarkably quickly. <laughs> well, after that performance from the pizza shop, needed to show off a little more, you feel. Very, very happy customers indeed, having watched that. And a chance to sign some autographs afterwards as well. Chuckling with young fans and maybe some future stars on the on a motorcycle or indeed in car as well. This is a massive bike venue, having previously hosted the MotoGP uh, Aragon race and still does host World Superbikes as well. On board uh, with the racing team Turkey, the pole car in LMP Tipperan. We also saw Giorgio Roda just getting some shut eye and focusing himself in the second place car in LMP2 Pro-Am. Seventh and eighth uh, on the grid overall, but uh, that 34 car has taken an overall race win. We get into the LMP2 cars proper, the cars that don't feature a bronze rated driver, and it is the number 65 car alongside Sally Yorick in the 34 Racing Team Turkey. Then into the, the less well placed, put it that way, of the two. United, three United Autosports cars on the grid. 23 in the hands of Guy Smith, the 2003 Le Mans overall race winner for Bentley. 28, the Delage liveried Edex sport car, fifth on the grid. And it is Paul Lafargue, uh, a previous, another previous champion here. Yeah, 2019 with Edex. Paul Luc Chatin, part of the lineup. Memo Rojas also. Uh, in that trio, that particular successful year. Here's the 47 car, qualified earlier on today by Jose Maria Lopez, but it'll be Vlad Lomko who starts the cool racing car from the outside of the second row, and he'll be joined by Angolan driver Rui Andrade, Jonathan Aberdeen in that lineup as well for number 43. They finished fourth on the road at Le Castellet, but actually third within their LMP2 category. The other driver in car 43 is Ollie Caldwell, who will surely be left until fairly late on, until he takes over. Duquesne team lead the championship, as you just saw from the graphics there at the bottom of the screen, and they have qualified on the front row, which could be crucial, although it seems strange to be talking about championship after only a couple of races. There's still 104 points available, including today's race. It is, though, United Autosports number 22 car in the hands of Phil Hansen on pole position. Neil Yarny can play. He had a bit of a, an engine cut on his fastest lap. He reckons cost him three to four tenths. Remarkably, uh, Phil Hansen has done a, most, if not all, the races since 2018 and has been at the sharp end of an awful lot of them. His first pole position in the European Le Mans series, and that, that I found very difficult to believe. Checked it with Phil himself. He confirms that is the case. All too often, of course, sharing with the likes of Felipe Albuquerque, etc., but now stepping up as a lead driver. And we're about to get this Phil rolling behind the Porsche Taycan uh, leading car on board with Sally Olic. Now, if this race had been held a couple of days ago, then tyre wear would have been something that would be crucial. I think now that we have had some temperature ebb away and the fact that we're racing into the night may well help. There's also the chance of a passing shower, would you believe, over the next four hours. There were some dark clouds that look very, very threatening as I walked across from the media centre to our commentary we position. Uh, we did have some showers this morning, yeah. uh, isolated showers during the Ligier European Series race this morning. I was barely able to believe it after the absolute scorchio conditions for the last three or four days. I've never experienced weather like that, that, that sustained temperature over that sustained a period of the European racetrack. Yeah, it's uh, something to be experienced and hopefully not again in a hurry, but uh, I don't know, the way that uh, the weather or the climate is going at the moment, it's becoming more frequent, shall we say, particularly in this part of the world and even further south on the south coast of Spain, even hotter. So 
tough conditions definitely for a driver for teams but also for the poor old car that has to do the distance it does the full four hours remember and engines have been tested with their potential high temperatures in other categories there's a possible concern for lmp3 engines with their 5.6 litre v8 nissan power plant certainly teams within the michelin le mans cup were slightly concerned whether their engines would start to overheat but i do think the time that we are racing is certainly a massive helping hand there is the famous very high stone wall that separates the highest point of the circuit to pretty much the lowest well in fact the lowest bit of the track is part way down the really long straight at the end of the lap but a 50 meter change in elevation around this 5.3 kilometer circuit so running through the running order on the graphics here you will see one car completely out of position you're watching the qualifying show earlier you have seen the red flag that came out in lmp2 uh, for james allen in some trouble in the Algarve Pro Racing car that's taken a race win this season. That will start from the very back of the grid after James, we believe, the rear brakes jammed on on that car. We found that coming through turn one, it felt like the power was ebbing away. What it actually was, was the resistance from uh, the braking system. Matteo Cressoni, Claudio Schiavoni and Matteo Cairoli lead the LMGTE category with their number 60 Iron Lynx car, but only by three points over a couple of Proton Competition Porsches. In LMP, in LMP3, it is the cool racing crew of Marcus Siebert, Adrian Schiller and Alejandro Garcia who are out front again, though, by a very small margin of just a point over Jacques Wolf and Antoine Ducat. LMP2 Pro-Am convincing championship leaders in that by 19 points uh, are the duo, or the trio, I should say, of Louis Delatraz, Sally Golic and Charlie Eastwood. In that Pro-Am car, they took an outright victory at the start of the season in Barcelona. And the LMP2 team's challenge, led by Duquesne, as I've mentioned, for their drivers, Nico Pino, René Binder and Neil Jarni in the number 30 car. Yep, second formation lap underway. It'll be too long before they get these cars to close up. That uh, will be done. So the cars are in grid position, exiting turn 15, which is as they come down onto that long, long downhill straight, actually longer in one um, iteration of the circuit. We've got the, what do you call it? The, it's a very large bus stop. Uh, That's what I yeah. tend to call it, yeah. But uh, that, For want uh, of a better term. In testing configuration, can form one very long, very downhill straight, and there's very few places on the planet you will see sports racing cars go quicker than they will here in testing. It's quite something to see. So Martin Berry with his second pole position of the season for JMW Motorsport will make it an all Ferrari front row with Formula Racing up alongside Johnny Lawson. Then it's an all Porsche second row in GTE with Ryan Hardwick starting the number 16 car from Michael Fassbender in the 93 Porsche. Takeshi Kimura for Kessel Racing and their Ferrari 57 is fifth on the grid ahead of Christian Reed's Proton competition. Uh, Porsche at number 77. In LMP3, it's Miguel Cristoval to start the Inter Europol competition. Ligier, number 13, from Jacques Wolf, the racing spirit of Le Mans, number 31. Then Team Virage and Michael Jensen in the number 8 ahead of Adam Alley, who we caught sight of for Euro International, car number 11. The next couple, Matthias Luton, also for Euro International, uh, which is number 10, and Cool Racing's Adrian Schiller, number 17. LMP2 Pro-Am led for the third time out of three races on the grid by Sally Jolic for Racing Team Turkey, number 34, ahead of Giorgio Roda for Proton Competition, that's the 93 car. Rodrigo Sales and Francois Perodo come next for Nielsen Racing and AF Corsa, respectively, the 24 and the 83 cars. Alexander Matchell and Alexandre Quani are the bronzes there, taking the start for Team Virage and Cool Racing, respectively. And they will have to do at least an hour, as everybody will do in LMP3. That's the only minimum we have to worry about in LMP2, is um, everyone must do a minimum of 60 minutes. And in LMP2 standard, it's Phil Hansen with his first ever pole position. Of course, not the first pole for United Order Sports, but it's the first time he was actually at the wheel to do the time. Car 22, alongside Nico Pino for Duquesne. Rui Andrade starts the inter Europol competition 43, alongside Vlad Lomko with Paul Lafargue and Guy Smith in behind so the final positions on this rolling grid taking place now 
We will use the bit of the track that is the cut through effectively, not being used as the racetrack this weekend, but it's the safer way to feed them through the final portion of this 5.3 kilometer Motorland Aragon, Herman Tilke design circuit. And for the first time ever, the European Le Mans series is about to get rolling for round three of the 2023 season here at Aragon. What's the start going to be like for Phil Hansen on the right of your shot? Got the car stopped nicely, did the Brit, and ahead of Nico Pino in the green and black Duquesne team car, which it's the number 30 feeding into the sequence. Then it is Rui Andrade for Inter Europe on competition. So it's as they qualified with Vlad Lomko now under pressure in the 47, though, from Manuel Maldonado in the number 65 Panis racing car. So those top eight. Uh, LMP2s, well, seven really. We remember James Allen starting at the very rear of the field and having to work his way through. James had to start that car as the fastest driver within it this weekend. Yep, uh, looking racy, Malbone won the Nardo in the early corners of that lap. Keep an eye too on from the back of the grid. The number 25 car of James Allen has already made several overtakes in the GTE field. Will make rapid progress, but he's got to be careful. Sure footed, there he comes into the picture. Ready ahead of the 72, Aston Martin. And they come for the first time through this, through and into this bus stop section. Yeah, so already reached the middle portion of the second sector, about to burst their way into the relatively short uh, third sector, which is a, a straight that's about 1.1 kilometers. So a real chance to get the toe on the car in front and then dive either up the inside or we have seen overtakes around the outside at turn 16 through the course of the weekend already. These leading LMP2 cars will do around about 40 minutes on fuel. There's contact, is there? Or a bit of bodywork that gets loose? I think it was the inspection hatch on the P3 Threes. cars. I think it's the Euro International car. I think that may be the leading car of Adam uh, Ali. We'll keep an eye on that one. OK, well, it suddenly just popped out from its position, as a, either as a result of some contact earlier on in the lap, or it's just the air oh, getting underneath it. Oh. That was the 57 of Takeshi Kimura on Michael Fassbender, but Fassbender almost anticipated that contact and was able to keep the car just about straight, leaving turn 16 for the first time. Martin Berry retains the lead after lap one in GTE. Uh, James Allen already on lap two in amongst the LMP3s. So he's made rapid progress up the order. Rounding turn seven already on the second lap is Phil Hansen, slowly building a lead up to, up to one second now over Nico Pino. Rui Andrade in there in third position. There is the half yellow, half green car. And there's James Allen scything his way up the order of the LMP3. So it looks like he's managed to dispatch all the GTEs. Yes, he has. And there are now nine LMP3 cars sitting in front of him as he delicately works his way up the order. So he's trying to tippy-toe by, needs to get past, past, past them quickly, and uh, that's what I mean, the corner, but just had to make sure that he doesn't get tagged on his way through here. Some of these drivers will not be expecting him to be there perhaps this quickly. Don't think he's going to clear this LMP3 field in one lap here, Johnny. But uh, at the front of the race, Phil Hansen, away and clear, second plus to the good, Neil Johnny, apologies, Nico Pino hanging on in there, Rui Andrade in third, Vlad Lomko, Manuel Maldonado, Guy Smith and Paul Lafargue. So Pino just about holding with Phil Hansen, but remember, the way that United Order Sport have decided to cut this cake, they've put their gold in, or one of their golds, in the early stages. There's still Oli Jarvis as the platinum, of course, to come, but Marino Sato, who started a couple of races, I'm sure, this year, they are obviously holding the silver driver back, as now one of the Duquesnes in LMP3, which is the WTM by Rinaldi racing car, slotting or trying to get up the inside of probably Horst Felbermeyer, so that was Leo Weiss with a dominant manoeuvre towards the end of the lap. Of the uh, uh, awesome bronze talent to Torsten Kratz later yes. in the race. Uh, amazing run from him for Murphy Prototypes as a late replacement yesterday in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. Change in the lead order for GTE. Formula Racing go to the front. Johnny Lawson ahead of Martin Berry, then Ryan Hardwick and Michael Fassbender. Seems unscathed from that uh, rude assault 
from the Kessel Racing car. Yeah, well, to be fair to Ke Takeshi Kimura, although contact was made, he was trying to avoid it, I feel, and didn't want to spin the Porsche out in front of him. So thankfully, it may well be looked at, but at least both cars are still running in roughly the same order. But yes, Johnny Lawson now to the sharp end of GTE. Still two Ferraris out front. They've effectively switched places. Martin Berry started from pole position. He is now second, and it's still the two Proton Competition Porsches, third and fourth. I don't know if you'd noted it, Johnny, but uh, LMP2 Graham, HH, Shelley Yollock has fallen behind Giorgio Roda. So the Proton Competition car up to eighth position overall, leads the LMP2 Pro-Am. We're in full class order front to back with the exception of the recovering Algar Pro 25 Oracle that started from the back. Yeah, and uh, bear in mind, actually, we didn't have this scenario where the Pro-Am fastest car in qualifying earlier on was faster than the slowest LMP2, but even if that was the case, LMP2 would put, be put at the front of the grid, so there's a slight... Uh, not rejigging of the order, but uh, reassembly of the correct order to put P2s ahead of LMP2 Pro-Ams. From a long way back, that was more potential place changing into the turn 16 hairpin within LMP3. It is still Adam Alley who leads for Euro International with their number 11 car. He's now got James Allen not too far away either. And as soon as James passes Adam, we will have LMP2 cars from first all the way down to 18th position. But I would then expect James Allen to be able to work his way through quite a lot of the bronze drivers in LMP2 Pro-Am. Yeah, just looking, it is all the bronze drivers starting the cars in LMP2 Pro-Am. So, just seven minutes into this race. All action, but all clean with the exception of that brush between the two GTE cars, Johnny. And that's, to be blunt, not something we've seen of late. No, that's true. Well, maybe one or two feeling that they need to take it slightly easier on a track that not a lot of people know how it will race in a multi-class field. And, uh, yeah, I, you've got to be in and around a good result with about half an hour to go to make sure, you know, you get good points. So there's no point doing something stupid and throwing the car off in the opening 10 minutes. And Sally Yolich has got back in front of Giorgio Roda now. So That's the 34 and the 99 providing a really good race. And Roda, as we looked at the timing screen about uh, a minute or so ago, was in front. But yeah, Yolich down Oof. the inside at turn 15. A forceful manoeuvre, making sure that Giorgio couldn't continue on the track there and uh, forced out onto the kerb. But I would say legitimately there was contact, there was no contact within that moment. And the 34 car back to the front of Pro Am. So, Sally Yelich uh, threw into, again, the lead in LMP2 Pro-Am. And what is the gap from the seventh-place car in, in LMP2 proper? The answer is, it's about four seconds. So, they're hanging on in there. James Allen, by the way, has cleared the LMP3 leader now and is uh, was about five seconds back from the 17th-place decal engineering car of Andreas Alaskarat. That's another late replacement, by the way. Um, but is closing rapidly and will be in amongst those cars, well, I think within the next half a lap. Two illuminated amber lights on the side of Martin Berry's Ferrari, telling us that it is in second position. Just a single dot for Johnny Lawson, and you'll see three on the side of Ryan Hardwick's Porsche, as he is the best placed of the Proton Competition Porsches. They are currently third, fourth and seventh with Michael Fassbender and Christian Reed, the other drivers involved there. A glimpse at the Andreas Lascarata's driven DKR Engineering Orica, a car battling for ninth and tenth with Daniel Schneider, who had a big spin in qualifying earlier on and ruined a set of Goodyear tyres. But those tyres will have to be weaved somehow into the race strategy because each LMP2 is now from a long way back. James Allen's going to start to pick off some of these LMP2 Pro-Ams. So that was a move on. Daniel Schneider. So he's already by two of them. He is, wasting no time at all there. But yes, the point about tyres, you only get three sets, whether you're in P2 or P2 Pro-Am, to use across a four-hour race and the qualifying session this morning. So they have to be used sparingly. Team's keeping a weather eye on the weather radar to see whether or not uh, they do need to be fleet of foot in responding to the potential for some rain. The chances of it being heavy seem to have moved away, Johnny. But uh, every chance we'll see a sprinkling, and that could 
Bring drama with it. Rui Andrade and Vlad Lomko dicing away now for third and fourth positions. And Manuel Maldonado wants to be part of this as well in a slightly more distant 65 Panis racing car. Guy Smith's not an immediate threat. He's about four and a half seconds further back in the second of the United Auto Sports USA cars. So United are first and sixth in the overall. Then you've got Edex Sports, Paul Lafargue burning some silver time there. Paul will have to be driving for 60 minutes or, well, anything over 60 minutes will do the job. As now it's nose to tail between Henrik Hedman, Alexandre Kwani and Francois Perodo, a scrap for fifth position in P2 Pro-Am. He's picking up without a doubt. But, uh, sure the flags on top of the transporters in the paddock. Shows that very ably. What's the gap like in LMP2? It's actually opening up significantly. Seven seconds now, the gap. Oh, no, big pardon. Yes, I was right, 7.7 .7 seconds. Adam Alley back to Miguel Christophat. Closer for second to third, though. Adrian Schiller's now only 0.8 of a second off the back of the second-placed LMP3 car. So Cool Racing could be about to be on the move. And likewise, Cool doing OK in the LMP2 ranks, but what about Alexandre Kwani, who's flashing his lights? Also a Cool Racing prepared car, trying to distract Henrik Hedman on the run into Turn 16, and Kwani faints to the inside, but then needed to leap on the brakes even more, so he didn't run into the back of the Swedish driver. The only thing that's achieved, though, is it's put him into the clutches of Francois Perodo behind. So it wasn't a solid enough move for Kwani. He was he, 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 he fainted to make the move, but uh, rather stumbled through the sequence, and that's put Perodo in a position where he can now pressure the Swiss driver. Yeah, needed to get through in one move, really, because if you are a little bit half-hearted about it, then there's always a danger then of losing speed coming off the corner and being picked off. So Perodo, a wily old fox, was reading that situation perfectly can't increase his position just yet, but he's sitting in weight in seventh place in Pro-Am. So, LMP3, as Johnny said, six laps in, side by side here between the Ultimate Car and the DKR Duquesne. 435 stays in the same order. Looking, aren't they, at this stage with things settling down, where the passes might come, where the pressure could be applied. Jack Wolf leads a four-car train for fourth position in LMP3, so he is in the racing spirit of Le Mans, number 31 car, and then right in behind, the dark blue with the yellow door mirrors for Euro International and Matthias Luton. Alexander Bukantsov in the orange and black Duquesne, who is putting his car right in the middle of the track. There's a little bit of contact there from Eric Truyer, who may well have damaged one of his dive planes, though. Slightly misjudged the braking point yes. there. And yes, the dive plane not now sitting as flat as the one on the front left corner. This is going on. Fastest lap of the race, by the way, to Phil Hansen as this uh, battle is underway in LMP3. He's just pulled the, the lead gap out to just over two seconds now over Nico Pinho. Good news for Eric Truyer is it doesn't look like that dive plane's going to depart from the car, but it certainly bent it slightly out of shape. And now, again, a lead change in LMP2 Pro-Am because Giorgio Road has got back in front of Sally Jolic. These guys are having a great uh, opening stint to this race. Uh, it's arguable how much fun each one is having. Probably Giorgio is saying, I'm, I'm loving this, whereas Sally Jolic might be gritting his teeth thinking he's not back in front of me. <laughs> and by the way, Alexander Matchell right there. This is where the mm -hmm. pass took place. It's almost over the start-finish line. And it was around the outside into Turn 1. It's a gutsy move and cleanly done as well. Stayed on track. So as the DKR engineer, sorry, DKR, Team Virage, uh, third position in that LMP2 program with Alexander Matchell just watching this all emerge in front of him. They're pulling away from the pursuing group headed by Rodrigo Salas. In fact, Rodrigo Salas is in pretty much splendid isolation in fourth. This is James Allen making his way through the LMP2 Pro Ams. That puts him now up into 14th place ahead of Alexander Kwani with the two cars ahead of him in close order. Quicker driver will be looking to get through quickly and cleanly. 
So turn 12, 13, now the right-hander at 14, and then the oh-so-important turn 15 as all four cars there scrap over the kerb, and that causes quite a bit of vibration. I wonder whether the tyres are going to like that if you keep doing that over and over again because there's serrated edges, there's ridged curves to worry about. And although Goodyear tyres are built very in a very durable fashion indeed, it's uh, still a warm venue this, and also they take a real punishment, punishment uh, ride through turns 10 and 11. It's not quite as bad as senior corner at Le Castellet where we were last time out, but nevertheless, when you're turning at high speed pr uh, for a prolonged time as well, that can start to chew through tyres. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, still struggling to get by Francois Perodo. It looked to me like he was trying to move around the outside down at the hairpin. Don't think Francois had seen him coming, and I don't think either Francois realises who it is. Mm. Uh, and that was defended hard, as it should be. This is for position. Still, James Allen looking to get by Perodo. But it does get show, doesn't it, how these gentlemen drivers, these bronze drivers, can squeeze real performance out of these cars. Yeah, and particularly Francois Perodo has been driving LMP2 for several seasons now, but it might need a quick word in his ear via the team radio from AF Corsa to say you don't need to fight the guy behind. A, he's not actually in your subcategory, but also B, it's a gold looking to get ahead of a bronze. So pick your battles and don't waste too much time because the danger is for Perodo, he'll lose ground on those other Pro-Am cars around him. Battle here for third overall as the LMP2 front runners start to st approach traffic for the first time with 17 minutes in. This is Riandrad trying to fend off Vlad Lomko. Yes, I think we're going to see James Allen finally make his way by Francois Perodo. Let him go there, I think. And now Henrik Edmund is the next target. So from 42nd position, now up to 13th in 17 minutes. That's the real-time gap between the first and the second placed LMP2 Pro-Am cars. This is Giorgio Roda just starting to establish a slightly larger gap now, 0.8 of a second. And we are not quite halfway through a tank full of fuel for the LMP2s. But clearly, Giorgio Roda wants to try and build as much of a gap as possible ahead of the first pit stops, which should be just short of 40 minutes because we had two formation laps, remember. Uh, although they're not at full race pace, do burn fuel nevertheless. And in third position, Alexander Matchell should be pleased with his effort so far. The number 100%. 19 car sticking with the top two in LMP2 Pro-Am. Absolutely. So three cars in this lead group. James Allen, by the way, in pursuit as so he goes through and has gone by uh, Enric Edmund. He's got uh, just Rodrigo Salas to catch and pass before he reaches these three. After that, into his own class, LMP2 proper. So it's been a quick and solid recovery drive from the Algarve Pro Racing guys. The leading cars now start to leapfrog their way through traffic. Phil Hansen we caught a glimpse of making his way or trying to make his way past the GTE leader and has been another lead change in uh, Pro-Am. Well, there very nearly was. That was Sally Jolic, I think, I think with a lock-up. It was for a nanosecond. Yes. But uh, he couldn't get the car stopped. In the middle of the oh, hairpin. Oh, trouble. And now Michael Fassbender's facing the wrong way on the main straight. Green flag being weighed immediately after the stricken number 93 car. But how did the Irish-German Hollywood actor end up there? Drivers left, partly on the track, partly off it, with the front wheels on that green painted concrete. Now, can he find a reverse gear is the next question. He got, oh, it was oh. contact with Nico Pino in the number 30 Duquesne car. And I need to see that from another angle, really, to, to fully realise where the cars were on the track. But did Pino not give Fassbender sufficient room on the exit there? He can't cut a break, can he? That's, uh, we saw two major contacts with Michael Fassbender at Paul Ricard. And now in the wall, he brushed the wall, but I think it was just a brush. He may not be able to find the gear. Yeah. It's uh, 
it's often very difficult to locate a reverse gear, particularly when the engine is hot and these gearboxes can be a bit sticky at times. So race direction will leave him there for the time being, covering turn 18 with yellow flags. I think flags. he's just got moving, he has, he's moving. OK, so he's gone through the split to complete that lap. It's a 3.09, so it's lost him a minute and six seconds or so to his yep. nearest rivals. Just over a minute, and the contact between Michael Fassbender and Nico Pino on the main straight is now under investigation. I haven't seen, I've only seen one replay, and it's from a tricky angle, so very difficult to call that, but race control will have other versions of that incident that they can look at. Well, yeah, the key now for Michael Fassbender is not letting that rattle him. Crack on. Get so easily down. said that, but, but I, I, in I'm, reality, you know... I'm but, perfectly calm, there's no reason why you shouldn't be either. Well, no, OK. <laughs> as, a, in, as a commentator in an air-conditioned box, box, sitting next to uh, internationally renowned commentator Johnny Palmer, yeah. you know, it's, it's a happy place to be, Graham. Uh, but unfortunately... But I'm living the dream. Unfortunately for Michael Fassbender, I can fully appreciate now the red mist potentially descending. However, this scenario has happened to him many times before. He, sure, he does know now how to deal with that and to just sort of delete it from his brain and push on. Well, we saw the end of that incident. We didn't see the start of it. That would have been Nico Pino looking for a way by Michael Fassbender as he came through the final elements of the lap. But uh, the LMP2 car way out to the right-hand side, almost off the track and looking for space as Fassbender, I presume, was doing what he's supposed to do, which is keep to his racing line. Yeah. Yes, that, that's looked like it. I mean, he won't have expected an LMP2 to be on his outside coming out of turn 18. You are told in the driver's briefing that the GTEs, the slower cars, have to stay on the racing line and it's the job of the quicker prototypes to find a safe way by. But if the GT car runs a tad wide, then Nico Pino kind of has nowhere to go if he's put himself on the outside of that car. But... Um, it's very difficult to see or that, know exactly what happened in that incident without the build-up. We haven't yet been offered a shot of the build-up coming through 17 and 18. Race control, as mentioned, are looking at that now, and it is under investigation. A uh, run through the field. We've had a little over 20 minutes now of this third race of the season in the ELMS Championship. Yeah, and uh, the latest move is another one from James Allen, now up into 11th place, caught and passed. Uh, Rodrigo Salas in the Nielsen Racing 24 car, and so now needs to deal with the three-car battle for the LMP2 Pro-Am lead. Yeah, so Phil Hansen with uh, 12 laps now completed over Nico Pino, who did lose time in that incident as well, of course. 2.6 seconds, the gap between Hansen and Pino, with Rui Andrade in the Inter-Europol competition car number 43 in third place. LMP3 is led by Adam Alley with Miguel Cristoval in the Inter Europol competition number 13 car. Uh, the gap is now 18 seconds for Adam Alley over the Portuguese racer Cristoval with Adrian Schiller 1.4 seconds further back. Jacques Wolf in the racing spirit of Le Mans car is in fourth position. Uh, so, just an update, you will have noticed we're just showing you a camera position on one corner at the moment. Major technical issue, I'm afraid, for the broadcast truck. We're going to keep talking, tell you what we can see from the variety of uh, options we've got available to us, which include this picture and nothing else other than timing and uh, uh, the, the tracker, but uh, we'll keep chatting through it. It's like an old-school uh, PA commentary-type feel to it. I, I, I'm all right with this. It absolutely, it's like that, the old days of the Age of Le Mans series. OK, Commentating what camera? CCTV. Interesting. Uh, well, you know, hey, we, we're getting uh, some of the, uh, the race footage to you, and the beauty is, hopefully you've got a timing screen at home, and if you're not, then we'll tell you exactly what uh, we can see on our screen, with Johnny Lawson leading the LMGTE field, Martin Berry in second position with Ryan Hardwick running in third for Proton Competition. 
I can tell you also that the lights in our commentary box are going on and off and on and off, so all sorts Control of systems are being reset. Control lock, yeah. it's not just yeah. racing cars, uh, no, well, listeners and viewers. There have been a lot of mechanical failures, electrical gremlins for racing cars this weekend, and uh, sadly, with our broadcast truck, that's exactly what's happening. Bizarrely, though, on the coolest day of the weekend. Anyway, there we are. Uh, pit lane, by the way, for the number 43 into Europol competition car. Ryan Drad has pit in, that's very early. Um, James Allen now in the middle of those uh, three leading cars has gone by Alexandra Matchell as uh, Giorgio Roder is pulling away a little from Sally Ulrich. So it is still Phil Hansen leading this race. 4.7 seconds now ahead of the Duquesne team, 30 car of Nico Pino. Mm, racing Team Turkey getting very close to the back of the car guy machine. Some of the onboards still work then, clearly, as the Racing Team Turkey car for Sally Yolich trying to stay in touch with Giorgio Roda. They've managed to leapfrog because of the pit stop, Rui Andrade as well, in the inter Europol competition car. So this LMP2 Pro-Am battle is up as high as seventh and eighth overall now. Yeah, big win in the traffic there for, uh, for Sally Yolich, closed back right in onto the back of the Proton competition car, Giorgio Roda. Now we're getting back some more cameras. Well done, guys and girls. Frantic work within uh, our production truck. There are three or four of them here this weekend. Um, but sometimes the gremlins can get in. I do probably think it's heat related yep. after some... a sustained week of uh, tough conditions. I have told them multiple times, don't press the big red button. What does it do, though, Graham? Well, we know now. Know. You're not going to know until you press it. We know now. We do. All the answers have been revealed. Thank you for your patience, everybody. And we are returning to normal service just about. There was a glimpse of the United Order Sports car of Phil Hansen. He knows nothing about the slight issues we've had because he's pushing on now with a 151.5 last time around for his 14th lap of this. What will probably be a double stint, building a lead of five seconds now over Nico Pino, who must have been delayed in the incident with Michael Fassbender. Who is, by the way, on pit lane, so it's pit call for Michael Fassbender. That might well be tyres that are somewhat tired yes. after the incident that left him in to the pit wall. Speak of the devil, here is the 93 Porsche with a significant change of livery for 2023 from the emerald green of last year. So silver front, black rear and the yellow mid stripe. And it is four new Goodyear Eagle tyres. No restriction on tyres in the GTE category once again this year. James Allen with a bit of a tweak there as he's closing, closing, closing on Sally Yolich. Wants to get by, to get to and get by. Rian Drab, by the way, has rejoined back in 14th place. And also rejoining now is the number 93 car. And it is still Michael Fassbender at the wheel. So now under pressure, Sally Yolich is from James Allen. So Yolich running in the overall standings in eighth. James Allen is ninth, and if Allen gets ahead of the Turkish driver, that won't alter the racing team Turkey position within Pro-Am, but it will serve as a buffer between Sally Yolich and the man he's desperate still to get in front of, Giorgio Roda. So it's going to separate the LMP2 Pro-Am scrap, albeit briefly. James Allen still keen then to hustle on and try and get into the top six, ideally, before any of the pit stops happen. Uh, in terms of the other classes, if we stay on board and watch as James Allen tries to go to the rear and get by Racing Team Turkey, uh, Adam Ali still leads in LMP3 in the Euro International number 11 car. That's the car that's missing the tiny bit of bodywork, the inspection panel. And is this going to be enough? Or it is indeed enough for James Allen to get by. Again. Another place, and the next target will be Giorgio Roda. Again, Sally Yolich, wise to pick who he's fighting with so as not to waste too much time. He ideally wants to stay on the back of James Allen now, and it, once James goes for a move on Giorgio Roda, that could be where Sally Yolich can also capitalise and go for the same gap. This, by the way, is the lead battle in GTE. They are the lead four cars. It is Formula Racing's Johnny Larson, the number 50 car, the burgundy coloured car with the Italian stripes at the front. His 488 ahead of Martin Berry, the uh, pole sitter in the day glow yellow and black 488. Then it's the baby blue Ryan Hardwick pedaled 16 Proton Competition Porsche and then another day glow yellow car. Takeshi Kimura in the Kessel Racing 57, the car guy liveried car. 
Henrik Hedman, Alexandre Kwani, early stoppers as well. So they're getting one pit stop out of the way probably about five or even ten minutes before we would have expected LMP2s on pit road. Remember, Hedman and Kwani have to do a minimum of 60 minutes drive time in this race. So fuel going in and the car is refired. And Henrik Hedman, by the looks of things, staying on board that car. I didn't see the full pit stop, but it didn't look like a driver, an outgoing driver was anywhere close in that shot. So Henrik Hedman will continue on for at least one more stint. And Alexandre Kwani is doing exactly the same in the number 37 car. He runs in 10th place in Pro-Am. A little early still for those stops, but I suspect yeah. that's just to keep them out of the way what would become a very busy pit lane. And there's James Allen on the inside of Giorgio Roda for position to put the LMP2 car that started at the rear of the pack now ahead of all of the LMP2 Pro-Am. So James Allen up as high as seventh place overall. He will have a fair distance now to until he finds Paul Lafargue, 13 seconds up the road from this point. So it's taken him 30 minutes of this race to get from the back of the grid onto the rear of his own class battle. So on board briefly there with the 43 car, side by side with the 35 and the 4 car. That's been a battle that's been going on for some time as they're passed by the Edex Sport 28. 28, by the way, in the hands of Paul Lafargue, running in sixth position. A little bit splendid isolation there too. Five seconds back from Guy Smith, who runs ahead of him in the 23 United Autosports car with James Allen. As Johnny said, about 11 seconds back now. Tidy damage, it. damage there. A tidy little manoeuvre on the car that you spotted with damage, but it was Eric Truyer late on the brakes into the corkscrew to pick off Alexander Bukantsov. And was it not those two cars that got together earlier on, actually? Did, did, I mentioned the dive play. It was Truyer, wasn't it? was it? Really close. I think to Bukantsov, actually. And the it number was three that car. side as that well. That would explain that slowly the cheese wedge is working its way loose. It's still connected to the car, but not in the right position. So that will have to be looked at in the next pit stop. And they're always tricky things to reposition if they're just dangling by a thread, and sometimes literally a thread, because it's the cable that powers the tail light on those uh, bullets, as they're called. It's, it's seldom, if ever, since we changed to these 2020 spec cars, been the work of a moment. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And, uh, well, some teams are well versed in doing that at speed, but the problem is you've got hot components after... Well, the first pit stop for the LMP3s may not happen until about 55, maybe even 60 minutes in. So it's all very well doing that repair on a, a cold Friday, let's say, um, when the rate the cars haven't done that much running, but much further in the race, it becomes uh, an awful lot more difficult. So we'll see how that team deals with the situation. Johnny Lawson for Formula Racing cannot shake loose Martin Berry in the JMW Motorsport Ferrari. Ryan Hardwick is uh, again within touching distance as well. So first, second, third, fourth is that gaggle at the front of GTE and the gaps all less than a second there. In comes Sally Orch from the lead of, oh, sorry, from second place in LMP2 Pro-Am. This has not been the dominating run that uh, has been predicted by a number of people in the paddock in LMP2 Pro-Am. It's been a Great run from Giorgio Roda. Took the fight to Sally Olic. Sally took it right back to him. And uh, well, it'll be 33 minutes in. And the Turkish driver in the racing team Turkey car with his TF Sports team for the first routine stop. As predicted, there is a message on our screen now to say that Ale Alexander Bukantsov's car will need to be repaired when it makes its next pit stop for DKR Engineering. He's running in sixth place, but the runaway leader is Adam Alley for Euro International number 11. And the P3 stop, they'll have to make probably three stops between the start and the end of the race. Two of those have to be done to a minimum pit stop reference time. 
There is the third stop, although it doesn't have to be your third stop. It could be your first if you wanted, but that one can be as quick as you like. That's the Trouble. car. Oh, that's the 37 car, first of all. But I was about to say Eric Truier is still carrying the damage on the dive plane front right. But car 37 is the cool racing offering of Alexandre Quani. Uh, meantime, Minico Pino has been dealt a drive through penalty for the contact with car 93, Michael Fassbender on the straight. So that's been ruled against the passing LMP2 driver. We're going to see it again, Pino to the outside. One of the big problems for Nico was he wasn't even on the track. Yeah. He left, he'd gone over the white line, and Fassbender just didn't expect an LMP2 car to be out that far on his right. The, In, the quicker cars need to come on the inside of turn 18, over to the left, and then make the good run down towards turn one. New leader in LMP2 program, as we see two of the leading runners, two more of the leading runners down pit lane. It is Predator Competition's Giorgio Roda and Rodrigo Sales in the 24 Nielsen racing car that had been running fourth in that uh, main group. Alexander Matchell takes the lead, our third leader in LMP2 Pro-Am. This will be the spin for Alexandra Kwani, who's already pitted. That's uh, another recovery drive there. This is Nico Pino. He will require a drive through. Kwani with a heavy car, of course. It would have been pumped full of fuel. And also, well, they maybe didn't do tyres because they will have left that set of good years on. But nevertheless, they may have lost a little bit of temperature whilst he was sitting, waiting for the fuel to go in. But the biggest difference is that uh, all of a sudden that fuel weighs a great deal and uh, he has to drive accordingly into the first corner. Daniel Schneider in the 21, the LMP2 Pro-Am car this weekend for United Autosports, normally two, but there's one this weekend with a driver switch uh, earlier in the race meeting. And also the 20 Algar Pro Racing car running seventh in LMP2 around the hands of Fred Portad. That car too is on uh, pit lane. That is, I'm sure, the cheese wedge from the rear of the number four car, which has now pitted for that repair. So they've done that out of sequence, which will hurt them more. And it's ended up on the track at the fairly slow right-hander at turn seven at the very highest point of the circuit so the problem with those pieces up there chunky bits of kit you hit are. that you're gonna know it yeah they don't weigh a great deal being carbon fiber but they're solid and they're ramp shaped well that doesn't help either martin berry looking to the inside here isn't away past there of johnny larson but he's looking racy again now forcing the issue tries to the inside not away past there but uh, all of a sudden it's game on again in gte Blue flags being waved, interestingly. Well, all of these cars are on the GTE lead lap, but they are about to be caught by some LMP2 traffic. Actually, they all dive left, though, they into did. the pit. So, Team Virage, Alexander oh. Matchell is in. Block up for Ryan Hardwick, was no, that? that was for the leader. That was for Johnny Larson. And that, again, has allowed Martin Berry to have a good old sniff at the rear of the 488. This is proper good stuff in Look GTE. At these four. First, Wonderful. second, third and fourth all together. Despite Johnny Larson's best efforts and in the early stages, Martin Berry, they just haven't been able to depart from Ryan Hardwick, who made an error, a pretty key one, uh, during qualifying as there, showing the nose again, Martin Berry, as they look to head right at the top of the hill at turn seven. Here is Nico Pino arriving on the scene for Duquesne team for her, his first pit stop, and they're keeping Nico in there as well. So from the lead of the race, Phil Hansen is in for United in number 22. Pino in, as mentioned. Vlad Lomko, 47 cool racing pits from third, as does Manuel Maldonado in the 65 Panis racing car. That will leave Guy Smith as the new race leader. Yeah, Guy Smith ahead of Paul Lafargue. James Allen has not yet pitted either. Johnny Lawson in the burgundy and white Formula Racing Ferrari with Martin Berry all over the rear of this Ferrari. Fair play to the Proton Competition Porsche of Ryan Hardwick, which is carrying some weight this weekend, some success ballast. It doesn't seem to matter. We could have a five-car train very shortly because... 72, yeah. loitering, loitering in the distance, Arnold Robin in the front engine, Aston Martin Vantage. It's not going to take much of a delay for this uh, quartet for that to happen. This sign, again, up the inside, forces the issue more. This time, Martin Berry tries to get the power in. It's not going to work again, but he's forced the 50 car wider. That will compromise 
uh, the uh, Formula Racing car onto the start-finish straight, but I don't think it's going to be quite enough. But he's shown intent. Certainly, and worked out that he, that car is very stable on the brakes as well. So he doesn't necessarily have to be fully alongside in the braking area. It will just throw Johnny Lawson slightly off the racing line. And then if he doesn't get a clean exit out of 16 and through 17 and 18, could then be a sitting duck into the first corner on the very next lap. So Martin Berry has shown that he can be quicker in qualifying. The gap from the quality times, as mentioned, it was Martin Berry with a 157.022, and uh, he was a couple of tenths and a bit more quicker. 157.263 was Johnny Lawson's best effort. So Martin Berry, as we're getting further into the stint and these cars are getting lighter, showing that there's more speed in the 66 compared to the Ferrari that currently leads the class. Yeah. Oh, the, there was uh, that looked to me to this an LMP2 car lost it behind the 72. Realised there was no way through. Spun in trying to duck out. I think it looked like it could have been the 34 car. Sally Yolich, if that is the case, will check on the 34's times. That's not an out lap. He has been running a little, well, at least one lap since. It and was. Bang on. He hit the kerb and he wanted to try and dive bomb Arnold Robat in the Aston Martin, but there's a sausage kerb there which will majorly unsettle the car. He was worried, I think, Arnold Robin was going to swing across the yeah, nose as I think well. He, so. he was trying to duck out of a move he was committed to, and not disaster, but certainly not great news there for Racing Team Turkey. For the first time this season, having a tough race, indeed. Label that under could have gone better, I think, for Sally Yolich, but I could see what he was trying to do. And he's had a really good opening stint between he and Giorgio Roda. I think that's the pressure again that Roda is applying mentally, really, to say, you've got to keep up with me during this bronze double stint. And uh, Sally not wanting to lose any time in amongst the GTE cars. This is the lead battle now, because uh, Phil Hansen has cycled back round to lead. It's Rui Andrade is now on his tail. And that comes courtesy of a pit stop that was 13 seconds quicker for into Europol. Phil Hansen back to the lead of the race. He's made a pit stop, one minute and 11 seconds he spent in pit road, but yes, time gained by Rui Andrade. So I'm not sure what the delay was there necessarily, because they pitted at roughly the same sort of time, so it can't be a difference in the amount of fuel going in. Maybe did they have problems? Now, United have already had difficulties in restarting one of their LMP3 cars in the Michelin Le Mans Cup this weekend. Was there a problem with Phil restarting his car after the fuel went in? There's a lot of cars with a minute 11 and a minute and 10. I wonder if that's two tyres. OK, yeah, maybe. But those two tyres will have to be used again. Because yeah. You've only got three sets, 12 tyres in total. But allow them to cool down, perhaps. Bolt on. Well, this being an anti-clockwise circuit, you would have thought maybe two right side tyres or two rear tyres being replaced in the early stages. Now, what we will potentially see, if that is the case, is much better speed from Phil Hansen's number 22 car if it's got two newer tyres on it compared to Rui Andrade. Not unexpectedly, the number four car is now pushed into the garage rearward in order for it to have its uh, rear bullet replaced. It was already on, oh, so there must okay. be another stop. Interesting, right, so it's going into the garage at least for more mechanics to work on it. Yes. Sally Yolich has got to the front of this so, so dicey pack within GTE, and I was bothered about him having to be you able know, to overtake, what, five cars all in pretty close succession. What I can't work out is how, despite that spin, is Sally, Sally Yolich winning this race? Um, there must have been a drama somewhere along the line for Giorgio Roda. Because he's dropped back, hasn't it? It wasn't a poor pit... Well, it was ten seconds longer, the pit stop, and that is, mm. broadly speaking, the gap. So it is, it's the pit stop that's made the difference for the Proton car. So a one minute and seven second pit stop for Yolich. Compare that to the leader of Pro-Am prior to the pit stops, one minute and 18 seconds, so he's actually lost 11 seconds there as the two into Europol competition cars find one another. LMP2 lapping the LMP3 car. Yeah, can tell you, by the way, and, uh, we'll talk about uh, into Europol while we're looking at into Europol. News early next week around their plans for 2024. 
keep an eye on your regular news outlet. Singular. <laughs> Rui Andrade in second position then, and still sticking with Phil Hadson. There's a little bit of time being lost, and I, I'm wondering whether that is because Phil Hansen has two newer tyres, two fresher tyres beneath him compared to Rui Andrade, who will have just taken fuel. 72 car has caught this train, but in part that's because Martin Berry is just falling away a little bit from the leader. He was uh, very much in the clutches of Ryan Hardwick. So who else is in this little gaggle here? Well, it's all three classes, basically. LMP2 car coming by this train, and the, I think it might be Adam Ali behind them. Who leads, did lead, and still does lead the LMP3 category, up as high as 12th overall now. Adam Ali sharing the number 11 Euro International car with Matt Bell. Through goes the 24 car in traffic. And, uh, that is Rodrigo Sales, who's now third in LMP2 Pro Am. 72 car. What's happened there to Ryan? Hardwick, he's lost oh a couple dear. of places. Yeah, he has. So a slight error maybe on the brakes into the hairpin at the end of the long straight. And all of a sudden, gaining spots. The 57 car guy Ferrari is now. Oh, Rob Baz run a touch wide at turn one. So that should allow Ryan Hardwick to get a heck of a lot closer. That giant diffuser on the Aston Martin, which protrudes by what, about a foot from the rear of the car be careful when you're getting too close to an Aston Martin not to uh, pluck that away from the car and Ryan Hardwick keen to address if it was an error that slight uh, difficulty that he had towards the end of the previous lap Adam Alley is just streets clear of everybody else in LMP3 here We've got some of the pit stopping LMP2 cars from Pro-Am that have fallen behind the number 11 car but there's one, two, three, four, five, six Pro Am P2s now that separate Adam Alley, the race leader in P3, from everybody else. And obviously, Alexander Bukantsov has been in the woes. Uh, the four car is back in the race now, but that was a, was a 10 minute pit stop for car number four. Yeah, and particularly drama down at turn 16, but green flags flying again. Also, some tyre smoke at Turn 1, but it looks like everyone's still just about on the straight and narrow. So the high side of... Sorry, I keep interrupting you. OK, here. go for it. <laughs> the high side of the uh, number 12 car goes to the 30 machine of Nico Pino. Pino was second before the pit stops, remember, but he has lost that ground uh, because of the drive-through that he needed to serve after contact with Michael Fassbender. Right, your turn, Graham. I think that's, that's John Hartshorn just, I think, ducking out of the melee around him rather than in trouble. So going slowly, but I think that's because all the cars in the world are there right now. I think he thinks discretion is the better part of valour. Adam Alley, by the way, in amongst, in the midst of the LMP2 Pro-Am cars, and that's because, of course, the P3 cars, there he is. So it's two class leaders, Adam Alley and uh, Johnny Lowerson, together on track for a moment. But uh, all of these cars still owe us their first pit stop. Ultimate 35 Ligier in close proximity to the number 30 Duquesne team car that led the race for the Nico Pino, now down in fifth. 48 minutes in, we're getting within, what, 10 minutes of when we'll start to see regular GT and LMP3 pit stops. Yep, 60 minutes is oh, a good margin that was, to go. That was a touch. It's three abreast on the run down. Hartshorn is fully off the road. Can he get the Aston Martin stop? Yes, but given very little choice, but to head out to the scenery there in the, uh, in the weeds, pretty much. It was three wide. It was the number 10, the RLR car, and the RLR car, and trying to avoid the number 10, moving him towards the outside of the track, neither of them had seen, or certainly the number 10 car had not seen there was an Aston Martin, the place he was pushing the other car towards. Yeah, yeah. so unfortunately the RLR motorsport car into the side of John Hartzell, I'm sure that will be looked at, and all the dust being kicked up from the tumbleweed, which is way out wide on the approach to turn 16. Entirely the innocent party there, John Hartshorn. I think he was working hard to stay out of the trouble. 
Squirming and sliding is the LMP2 Pro-Am entry from United Autosports, although not Pro-Am this weekend, remember, it's been moved across because of an injury to Jim Maguire. I think, actually, the 23 is still running, though, with the sky blue backing on its numbers. Is it? I thought it was as it worked, crept through shot there. I'll check that in a moment or two to see whether they've uh, the 22. changed it. Yeah, that's the 22 with the red windscreen visor and red door mirrors. So this is Phil Hansen. Still, Rui Andrade sticking with him here, you know. It's a good run for Rui. Next challenge for them is traffic by way of the 44 GMB Motorsports Aston Martin that will later see Nicky team aboard. Right now, that car is in the hands of Jens Greno Moller. The gap for Phil Hansen to Rui Andrade still not significant. If they did do two tyres on the number 22 car, I think United Autosports were expecting slightly better benefit than they've had so far in this second stint for Phil Hansen. Loads of grass and junk now have been has been inhaled into that Aston Martin Vantage uh, front, uh, the grille itself, in between the two massive headlights on that Aston Martin. And uh, those down at TF Sport will be trying to attempt to clean that out. They've given it a new set of tyres as well, and it'll be sent back on its merry way. 50 minutes of this four-hour race. We're now at 18.50 local time. Two hours time, the sun will be down. The other thing to note about uh, the number panels is that they are being run with uh, the lighting within them yes. this weekend. So Le Mans style don't normally get that, obviously, for a European Le Mans series round because it, generally they are held in full daylight. But that will help our ID of cars because it's very dark in places around the Aragon circuit once we get beyond 8.45. This is Rodrigo Salas with Giorgio Roda closing in. We had a quick shot there in the Nielsen Racing Garage. Matthias Besch there. Uh, so earlier at Sven Thompson. Matt Bell looking over his shoulder at the team's engineering station. And then Stuart Mosley, their team manager, ex LMS racer himself back in the day. The incident involving James Dayson and Matthias Luton and John Hartshorn being looked at at the end of the long straight into turn 16. That goes without saying, really. Uh, the way I saw it, I'll say it, that's, that's what I'm here for. Um, I didn't see any fault in John Hartshorn. I saw pretty precious little from James Dayson, who was just moving away from a car, taking the ground from him. If there was fault at all, and if it's not going to be called as a racing incident, it would be the number 10 car moving to block on the uh, entry to that corner and being unaware that the car he was moving against had nowhere to go other than to the side of an Aston Martin. Yeah, yeah, but very tricky when there are three cars abreast into a very slow, uh, bra uh, a hard braking area to keep the cars on the straight and narrow when you've got uh, virtually cars from all the way on the right hand side to the left, but not excusing what happened to John Hartshorn. Uh, because uh, you know, he had literally nowhere to go by the end of that straight and had to, in the end, it's ruined the flow because the cars had to come in for a new set of tyres. The only other point to make uh, before we move on from it is that it is the quicker car's responsibility to get by safely. Mm -hmm. And in that case, they didn't. Agreed. There was a squirm there from the 12. Wockenspiegel Team Monschau, Rinaldi racing car started by Leo Weiss. Again, that uh, was also almost an element of him being out in the marbles. Sakari shares with Torsten Kratz, who's the rapid bronze brought into Murphy prototypes earlier on in the weekend to race in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. That was yesterday. And also Oscar Tugno with a pole position to his name already this year, although not at Aragon. That was last time out in France. We've got. Uh some pit stops underway early, though they may be, for LMP3s and GTE cars. It's a pass by the number 12 on the 31. Uh, the number 10, your international car, Matthias Lertner, is involved in that uh, incident. He's on pit road. So two is the number 18 Virage car. That looks to be like quite a lengthy pit stop for Michael, Michael Jensen. And uh, 57 Kessel Racing, you can see that on the screen right now, is on pit lane with the JMW Motorsports and the 72 TF Sport cars also in and out and now out of pit lane. So it's going to be a real mixture of strategies here, Johnny. There's going to be laps between them. Leading car in 
GTE continues to be the Formula Racing car. An impressive run from Johnny Larson. And he's about to have a gaggle of LMP cars to deal with. 81 and 20. Tussling away for sixth in LMP2 Pro Am, 15th overall. The Dragon Speed car in the hands of Henrik Edmund and Fred Pordad in the Algar Pro Pro Am car. Fuel going into the 57 Kessel Racing 488 GTE. So one of the early stoppers in the GTE category. Christian Reed's come in as well in the 77 Proton Competition Porsche. And also, as you've mentioned, a pit stop for Martin Berry and the TF Sports Aston number 72 of Arnold Robert. I'm sure at the 95 crew they will have turned that into a fueling stop, even though it was slightly ahead of when they wanted to stop. But when you're giving John Hartson a new set of tyres after they were dusted up quite badly into turn 16, you might as well give him a load of fuel as well and send him back out again. Uh, in the bronze, silver, gold or bronze, silver, platinum combinations in GTE, if you are the bronze, you'll have to do a minimum of an hour and a half. And the same goes... Well, the minimum time for a silver in that uh, scenario is 45 minutes, but it's really all geared around the bronze driver in each of the GTE cars, and until you've done an hour and a half, you will not be classified. Now, the way that Spirit of Race did it at Le Casale was they put Duncan Cameron in for sort of two 45-minute stints or an hour and then a 30-minute stint after that. I'm not entirely sure that worked quite to their plan because of various safety cars and full-course yellows. At the moment, I say this very, very quietly, we have stayed green from the start of the race. That will change almost immediately He's said it. because He's I've just said it. Said it. So I apologise, Internet, and anybody watching on broadcast channels. Uh, hashtag blame Johnny. Hashtag blame Johnny. And that was Henrik Edman having a bit of a moment. That's allowed Fred Porter to get alongside. Can he do get the move done? Can't quite get it done there. So Henrik Edman, known a very experienced bronze ranked driver, one of very few by the way. So have won, in his case, more than one ACO rules race in LMP2 as a bronze driver, other than in LMP2 Pro-Am, LMP2 overall. He's driven LMP1 cars as well. He has. Henrik Hedman, BR01, a few years ago now, also for Dragon Speed. Oh, that's, that's James, James Allen off Allen. the road. Yeah. Now, how did he end up there? That's the first corner of this 18-corner circuit. And uh, not a nice place to be sitting because that's his side of the car as well. That was all on his own. Did he clip the kerb? Or did he clip the barrier, perhaps even? Because uh, no, he wasn't quite close enough to the no. barrier, but it was too much kerb. That's exactly what I was spotting last night during the night you, session. You said that last night. I'll give that one to you. Car straddling the uh, grass crete, if you like, the green painted surface there. Yeah, there is a way through there where you don't even touch the kerb. I mean, you, you, you know, the whole car goes over the concrete rather than being on the track. And that did seem to be being allowed during free practice, although I didn't have a timing screen in front of me to see whether laps were being effectively deleted during FP2. I do think if cars start to do that consistently, then something needs to be done in terms of a warning. And if it gets even worse than that, then five seconds to be added to race time. I think, by the way, we've got big problems for the number eight Team Virage P2 car. That car has been um, in the pits for quite some time. Mm. Nailed to the bottom of the timing and scoring screen, uh, other than the DK engineering car that we know that 10 minute stop. Yeah. It's a driver change for one of the Euro International cars. That will be the number 11 car, so Adam Ali, after a very good stint indeed, is on pit road from the lead of LMP3. And Johnny Lawson is similarly on pit road from the lead of GTE. So time to give somebody else a go. GMB Motorsports 44. Aston Martin pits from second place. Overlapping in the braking area for turn 16. And again, this movement from the number seven car getting a bit spooked by Alexander Matchell. And what does the seven driver didn't know? That was Tony Wells. There was another LMP3 over to his right as well. So that was almost again the John Hartzorn situation where one car had to just jump off the circuit for fear of contact. We might get that a few more times over into turn 16. It's a mixture, isn't it? Battles for position, battles for, with traffic coming through. And in the case of three of them, that have half an eye on the fact they've got to be in the right position to get to the pit lane safely. Well, indeed, you've got to be over on the left-hand side of the circuit, leaving turn 18, quite a bit over there, to then 
take the slightly awkward entry into pit road, which requires a sharp left and sharp right tug of the wheel before you appear on a reasonably lengthy pit lane, easily occupying 42 cars this weekend, although you would want them all in together on the same lap. So just keeping an eye on who stopped, who hasn't. Crichton and Tudis, I think, is the only driver that's not stopped in GTE. When this pit stop cycle is complete, Johnny, JMW Motorsport are going to lead the race again. Yes. So and they're going to have a, quite a chunk of a lead as well. Three seconds gained over Ryan Hardwick in the pit lane. It was Johnny Lawson that Martin Barry was fighting with. There is Lawson to the outside of the 72 car and forced that wide at turn seven. So car 72 still with Arnold Robin. Oh, we're on this big off there for Johnny Lawson, who clatters the barrier not once but twice. We were focusing in and also drama for the second place car overall, Rui Andrade, who's ended up in the gravel as Someone's well. Hit him, but he's, he's hit the barrier. There's damage left rear for the 43 car. And I don't think that's going much further. Very dusty on the approach there. Racing Team Turkey just about get through the carnage. That and car, the fluid absolutely yeah. pouring out of the front it's done the of front the Ferrari. Yeah. That's, I think that's done. Let's see again what happened here. It's the 43 car, Lawson off the track, came past, and then there was a hit to the side, side to side between the Orica and the Ferrari, and it sent one car into the barrier stage right and one stage left. So Safety car, he unsurprisingly. He moved over to the right and further to the right, and Johnny Lawson just was not aware that that LMP2 car was there, and it's pinged him immediately to the left and smacks the barrier, yeah. mainly on the front right, which has popped the radiator, and that's why there's coolant now pouring down the racetrack. That's going to take some mopping up. And think about Rui Andrade, who was really the innocent party in that, and is frantic on the team radio now. He's uh, getting... Just listening into what's going on with that. He's blaming you, Johnny. It's what it is. I, I nearly said that in commentary. I thought, hashtag blame Johnny, it's coming back to haunt me. Here's the number five car off the road as well. James Dason, he'd already been involved in the collision with John Hartson, you, Hartson, you'll remember, and lost it with high speed coming through turns four and five and leaves the scene backwards. Oh, and straight into the gravel as well. Well, luckily, he's done it as a safety car's come out. True, true. Actually, that might be, you know, it's not uh, turn 12 because there's no massive wall over to the left, so I was right saying it's turn four and five. But what uh, a mess the front of Johnny Lawson's Formula Racing Ferrari is. As I say, it's done the radiator and that will be game over, I'm sure, for the number 50 car. It's got damage front and rear as well, for both front corners and the rear right-hand corner as well. And those guys for the Danish entry Formula Racing, although AF Corsa run, uh, were not in the top three of the championship, but they'd already scored 22 points. They had had a podium finish at Le Castellet. Red light, by the way, on at the end of pit road. Should mention, safety car automatically closes the pit lane for the first three laps, unless you're absolutely desperate for fuel, and clearly those LMP3 cars were. So you can come in for a five-second blast of fuel with the nozzle attached, but it then has to be released, and they'll have to pit again at the next available opportunity, probably when the pit lane reopens. Amazingly, Rui Andrade is going to try and limp this car back again. Crapping badly. He hasn't received any outside assistance, nope. strictly speaking. So this is fine if he can get it back to the pits and the team can then assess. There'll, there'll be a new rear deck, I'm sure, and definitely a new rear left wheel, but we're going to see Formula Racing take no further part. The opening hour of this race has been very intriguing, and I was about to say, before we entered the highlights package, incident-free. More recently, I cannot say that, but how about uh, feasting your eyes on the first ever start at Motorland Aragon, Aragon for a European Le Mans Series race. Nip and tuck through the first corner, but actually plenty of give and take and plenty of uh, fair driving there with lots of space given for that cluster of LMP2 and LMP2 Pro-Am cars. Sally Yolich and Giorgio Roda put on a fine show at the head of LMP2 Pro-Am. At times, the Turkish driver was in front, then the number 99 car for Italian racer Giorgio Roda had a spell uh, leading that category as well. 
Strong wind here at Aragon on Saturday evening. And the risk of that, of course, is that uh, maybe some wet weather may be blown across the circuit. So many of the teams taking a keen eye on their radar. This was a clumsy moment for Nico Pino making contact with Michael Fassbender, who just cannot buy a break in this championship at the moment. And it spun the Fassbender Porsche around once and t almost fully again. And he might have just nosed into the tyre barrier, but thankfully kept it out of the Armco barrier. And the number 93 car does still run in the race, although now down in 10th. Then there was nose-to-tail contact between Eric Trier and Alexander Bukantsov, which would do damage to both cars, namely the number four DKR Engineering Duquesne, though, which was trailing the rear left bullet, and that would need to be fixed. Since then, the DKR car spent 10 minutes in the pit lane. We were treated to an awesome scrap at the sharp end of GTE. One, two, three, four, and very nearly five cars involved. You can see Arnold Robbins, Aston Martin away in the distance, but it was Johnny Lawson who, who led at the time ahead of Martin. Martin Berry, Ryan Hardwick's blue and black Porsche, and the 57 car guy Ferrari of Takeshi Kumura. This, uh, well, Sally Yolich went for a move up the inside of the Aston Martin at the corkscrew, but it didn't work because he grounded out and rattled the kerb there, immediately spun the racing team Turkey car, and actually Arnold Robin did very well to avoid any contact on the exit of the corner. Thankfully got away scot-free. Phil Hansen has been steadily increasing his lead over, at the time, Rui Andrade in the half-yellow, half-green inter Europol competition car. And uh, as they made their way back up the hill through turns one, two and three, there was then a little bit of carnage on the run into turn 16. That was the squeeze as Alexander Matchell was trying to get by a couple of LMP3 cars and the concertina effect there as Tony Wells moved across slightly and very nearly ran into the side of Alexander Bukantsov. And then this has been the moment of the race really of late. Johnny Lawson to the outside of Arnold Robbins, Aston Martin. And as he looked to rejoin and get down the inside of the Aston, contact between Lawson's Ferrari and Rui Andrade in the 43 in to Europe or competition car would spin both machines. The Ferraris damaged beyond repair the radiator in the front right corner of his 488. So that car out on the spot. Here it is again from a different angle. And Rui Andrade did so, so well after the initial contact, then not to run into something more solid on the right-hand side of the track. Andrade has got back to the pit lane, unbelievably, but lots of damage on the rear of his into Europol car. Well done, Johnny. Uh, wrapping up what's been just over an hour of action, and uh, sadly, not all of it. There's a bit of Ferrari embedded in the barrier there, look. And uh, that will need to be removed behind the safety car. The 43 car is in the garage, and there's not a lot of attention going on to the rear of that car. I think that's done. Well, every credit to Rui Andrade for yep. getting it home and uh, trying not to do any more damage. But, yeah, the body language of everybody within into Europol competition, uh, very downbeat indeed. What could they do? They were running second. They were trying to work their way through a, a intense GTE battle. And I thought Rui had read it quite well, actually, to get well over to the right. He didn't expect Johnny Lawson to come his way. United Autosports USA, Phil Hansen's uh, run at the moment. Remember, we're on a safety car, so you can't really read too much into the gaps at the moment. And there will be a reshuffle of the order. But he's in front of Cool Racing's Vlad Lomko, Manuel Maldonado third, and Nico Pino fourth ahead of Guy Smith. LMP2 Pro-Am is led by Sally Yolich ahead of Alexander Matchell in the Team Virage colours. Giorgio Roda is third. LMP3, Miguel Cristova for inter Europol competition. So all of the efforts will go to LMP3 now for the Polish squad. He is in turn ahead of Matthew Richard Bell for Euro International and Eric Truyer. And then in GTE, it's Crichton Lentudis, Martin Berry. So AF Corsa lead JMW Motorsport and Proton Competition's Ryan Hardwick in the provisional podium spots. Yeah, still, by the way, with an hour and eight minutes on the clock, Crichton Dantudis has not been down pit lane. So that is the one car that's not yet taken a pit stop, and of course, behind safety car for the moment, it can't. Yes. I think that is signing off. We're done. That Abandon is, is often is. the French phrase, and uh, at Le Mans you would see the garage door rolled down. That's a real shame. Yep. And Sasha yeah. Fassbender, the team manager of Inter Europol, and I'm afraid the car we're looking at there was the cause of that. It was He was incited, but that, Johnny Palmer, was the very definition of 
and of an unsafe rejoin. Indeed, yeah, you've gone wide, you don't want to lose any more time, you get a bit frustrated and, uh, well, I think he was actually trying to position the Ferrari, Johnny right. Lawson, for an overtake on Arnold Robin. I'm thinking, well, I didn't get you at the first, at the turn seven, so I'll try at turn eight, but what he was oblivious to was the fact that there was an LMP2 car overlapping him at the time. And um, you've always got to have your wits about you in multi-class racing, and uh, the more ginger rejoin is often the more favourable one. So who does this help? Well, it certainly doesn't help Phil Hansen, uh, the leader, uh, because his six-second gap has now gone completely. Pass by has been performed, by the way. It helps Michael Fassbender, who True. lost time to the incident not of his making. So he will close back up with the pack in GTE. He is currently running down in 10th position behind Jens Rina Moller. And so we'll wait and see how that one is affected. Uh, it also helps, I think, James Allen to just... He was on the back of the LMP2 uh, train, but with time to make up and, of course, slightly out of kilter with his, um, his strategy as well. But it should it's helped him now become part of a seven-car train. And the top seven cars, by the way, in this race are all from the LMP2 class before we get into 10 uh, LMP2 pro -hams. The one car in the LMP2 group that is not in that train is what we believe is the now retired number 43 into Europol competition car. We'll confirm that when we see it, but I think that's what you were seeing on screen, Johnny, is that uh, that was Sasha Fassbender signing the paper that says we were, we're out. This is the reason why 50 car that have been leading GTE over to the left-hand side off track and when rejoining, well, that's, yeah, that's tough, that's, yes. A perfectly understandable reaction from Rui Andrade. You know, he was within touching distance of Phil Hansen. Safety car instructed to go at full speed. Safety car instructed to go at full speed. And a nice tap on the shoulder from the officials within the ELMS as well, realising, yeah. you know, how, how much of a, a troubled run that was for the guys uh, in the garage now. Yes, they still lead LMP3, but they were in the hunt for an overall Be advised victory. That even if the safety car pits, pit entry will remain closed. We are on the third lap, and that will be concluded when everyone crosses the line. Be advised that in this lap, the pit entry is still closed. So it's three completed laps from the safety car before you can then open, before you can then enter an open pit lane, but you'll have to complete this lap and go around again before the pit lane is available to you. Safety car in this lap, safety car in this lap. Be advised, pit entry will remain closed. And remember, we did have some emergency stoppers within LMP3, so they are likely to have to stop when we've completed the next racing lap Correct. to finish off their fuel fill. I can't believe we're not see, going to see Chrysler Zentudis either in for emergency service or in immediately the end of this lap. He still leads, by the way, in the uh, GTE class by dint of not having had to pit. Uh, with Martin Berry uh, a little way further back in the crew. You can see the uh, blue and white striped nose on the Ferrari, yellow shape band for that car. That is the car that leads, but is the only car that's not pitted in this field. And we're back to green flag running, Johnny. So over the line will go Phil Hansen with Vlad Lomko now looming large in the mirrors for Cool Racing, number 47. And uh, from quite a long way back there is a Duquesne overtaking one of the stray LMP3 cars. Why did that not gave, get waved by? Well, because it wasn't between the safety car and its class leader. So you only get the sort of half a, or nine tenths of a lap back if you are in that position. This uh, just behind John Hartshaw delayed, of course, with the requirement to pin after being forced off track lead uh, the, the effective lead battle once we see Lantunis down the pit lane is going to be between Martin Berry and Ryan Hardwick and they are nose to tail with Arnold Raban in that 72 Aston Martin from TF Sport very close to it was a squirm there I think from the number 24 car 
which had a brief moment on cold tyres. And yeah, all these GT cars stacking up together nicely. So the uh, JMW Motorsport car of Martin Berry with Ryan Hardwick in the blue and black Porsche trying to thread the other needle there, but also trying to gain some places back is the 83 AF Corsa LMP2 car. Is that still Francois still Perodo? Francois Perodo, yes. Fifth place for Francois. Francois will be thinking back to maybe Le Mans last year, when unfortunately he put, brought to an end one of the Corvettes running uh, on Sunday morning, wasn't it? So it he, was. And he's driven GTs before, so he will do this very delicately indeed. And Francois Perodo picks his way through without any contact, expertly done. So Martin Berry continues on running second. We wait to see if this is indeed the lap that Quite and Tudis will seed the lead. Um, and will tumble down the order because, of course, the field behind him are so closely spaced. Will not be by choice, I'm sure, to stay up this long with the three safety car laps. Yeah. It um, does, does, however, mean he only needs to do half an hour more behind the wheel. That's, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, well, no, even less than that. You've got to do 90 minutes as the bronze, so... 15 he, minutes. He just needs to do another 15 minutes, but that's quite awkward, really, from a, strate a strategic point of view, because you'll want to really plug a driver in for about an hour. Uh, uh, they'll find a way. LMP2 cars on pit road, 34, Sander Jolic, uh, also in the Team Farage car, Alexander Matchell and Rodrigo Salles. Franz Barbarodo, most of the LMP2 pro and field. The only car that's not stopped so far in the order is the 99 car lead to the race. Yes. In fact, it is the only LMP2 pro and car not to take to pit lane on this occasion. So remember, the pit lane is open now at the end of the first racing lap, and everybody just about lasted on their fuel load. Is it to make an 15 stop. for a P2 pro am bronze driver? P2. The minimum time for everybody, if you've got three drivers, is one hour. So they're all in that window now? Yes, correct. So, yes, regardless of your rating, if you've got three drivers, which all of the LMP2 teams have this weekend, all the minimum time we have to worry about is 60 minutes. We can now talk about this being a lead battle because Crichton and Lentudis did indeed join that train of LMP2 cars down pit lane. And this is the lead battle. Martin Berry back to the lead of the race being closed by the number 16 car in the hands of Ryan Hardwick. I'm sure he's enjoying his European adventures. This is a programme put together to service the automatic invitation to Le Mans that he won, part season in the WC, full season in the European Le Mans series with Proto Competition, and that is a cool racing car going into the box. That so will be the 37 car of Alexandre Quani, Yes, it is being wheeled backwards in on the dolly jacks. Uh, a, a plethora of driver changes, as we expected. So it's Ben Hanley now in the 24 car, which I thought a moment or two ago was having a, a squirrely moment, but under the hands of the outgoing driver, Rodrigo Sales. But he's up to second in Pro-Am. Also, Charlie Eastwood takes charge of the 34 Racing Team Turkey. It is Ian Rodriguez in the Team Virage number 19 car now. Yep. Uh, yes, 19. Oh, big lock up from Ian as well, and he's going to go wide. On presumably new, new Goodyear tyres, which don't quite have the temperature up on this outlap, and uh, that alongside is still Nico Pino. That car not stopping yet for the second time. He has done a drive through, of course, but he did a fuel stop, and he can clearly go a little bit further yet, Nico Pino. I did notice, by the way, when Alexander Kwani's car was in the garage at Cool Racing, there were two Gibson engineering engineers in there. That's so not something related. I'd normally see in a single car's garage. Engine related, quite possibly, then, for or, the Kwani suspected. car. Yeah, indeed, yes. And uh, I suppose better to have... Oh, some, clip change. Better to have knowledgeable guys in there about engines, so that they, I suppose that problem could be ruled out as well in a flash. But yes, rear deck being changed on the 23. Now, what, what colour are these number panels, if we grab a glimpse of them? Are they still the sky blue, even though this car's been entered into LMP2 proper? Very tricky to tell from that angle. I will have a look later. Fine. Although some of them are looking a little bit paler with the lights. Uh, behind them. Yeah, true, but I, I, I like that thought one. I'd caught a glimpse of it earlier on, but no, I, I, take, I take the point. 
As now rejoining is the 99 car, which stopped slightly out of sequence. That will have been a driver change as well. It's Jean-Maria Bruni, who's the new driver behind the wheel of the Proton Competition car. Yeah, multiple GTE champion for Ferrari. Le Mans winner in GTE for Porsche. Proton Competition hypercar driver, Proton Competition GTP driver in IMSA, and now aboard an LMP2 car. The jack of all endurance racing trades. And then the next phrase normally is master of none, but the problem is Jimmy <laughs> Bruni is a master of absolutely everything. Yes. He is so fast regardless of what you plug him into. Pretty uh, mean with a shopping trolley as well down the local supermarket from what I've heard. And happily, a really lovely bloke. Indeed. Drive yeah. through penalties coming to car five for causing the collision with car 95. That's been called against the RLR car. Yes, in the middle. Yeah. yeah. So that was the five of James Dyson, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So he was in the middle. He was getting squeezed from, I forget, an LMP3 car to it his the, left. It was the uh, Euro International car. The 23 has just gone through, and I'm still convinced it's got the Pro-Am numbers on it. Yes, it, it has. has. It's the slightly lighter blue. That was quite slightly confusing me. So if you see that, don't think it's in Pro-Am. It's not, because Jim Maguire unfortunately had an off earlier on in the weekend. It meant he wasn't able to race, and Jim's seat replaced by Garnet Patterson. And Garnet is silver, which will, therefore bumps it across into LMP2. The, the only thought I've got is that they may only have one set of the luminescent numbers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and one thing having the background vinyl. These are, these are not vinyls. These are pre-assembled pieces, and they will have had to have had approval to do that. Yeah. Because the colours, the markings, the numbers are all by regulation. Well, our graphics are right anyway. So if you're yeah, watching absolutely. the scoring tower to the left, you will see that car 23 is included in the dark blue numbers, which is LMP2, and is therefore gunning for an outright victory with the other United Order Sports USA car of Phil Hansen, who has now built a, another lead for the second time of asking. That's 6.4, now 6.7 seconds over Vlad Lomko. As we see the sorry sight, I don't really want to get too close in no. here because a Ferrari 488 is a beautifully designed car, but that is not as the designer intended. Should have been not suitable for work, really. Open wounds, never good. So great Repairable stuff. in time for Spa, for Absolutely. sure, though. And we will see that car back out again. Um, good stuff here from Martin Berry and JMW Motorsport. Good stuff, too, from Ryan Hardwick. They put up a real fight, and Alan Raban is not far away, with Takeshi Kimura right behind him. So it is still a four-car battle for the lead in GTE. It's just a slightly different four-car battle. Down the hill between turns 13 and 14 arrives this fight then between Vlad Lomko and Nico Pino, separated by just under half a second. Pino bringing with him, well, the flashing of the lights behind is a car that is a lap down. That was the car formerly driven by Alexander Matchell, I think I'm right in saying. 19. So that car has had a driver change to Rodriguez, that we mentioned. And he's getting, well, he will have just been overtaken, I guess, by Vlad Lomko and Nico Pino for to put that car a further lap down. Not on the overall leader, because Phil Hansen had been past him for a little while. They go over the line, the two for second and third. Pino looking slightly the quicker here. Vlad Lomko makes a mistake, and that's uh, Pino just sitting there on the gearbox of the 47 car. And pressurising for him from the mistake. Here comes Ian Rodriguez, thinking he might be able to gain some momentum as well from the slight off-track moment from Vlad Lomko. But in the end, Rodriguez cannot get by in car number 19, which is running fourth in LMP2 Pro-Am. So where did the error hit? Yeah, right into turn number one, carrying just a shade too much speed. Uh, Vladislav Lomko and out onto the kerbs on the exit of Turn 1. Cost him a great deal of time. Timon von der Helm has now been plugged into the number 65 Panis racing car. That was started by Manuel Maldonado. And Manuel, having done all of his silver time now, handing over to young Dutchman Timon von der Helm of the Netherlands. He's the gold. Yep, just keep an eye, by the way, LMP3 pit stop times. And there's 65 seconds, I'm sure we were told yesterday by Jeff Carter from the European Le Mans series, was the reference time for the European Le Mans series. It was 105 seconds. 
right. So a minute and 45 seconds, which means that only one, two, three, four of the cars have so far completed one of them. OK, bear in mind, on average, you'll be making three stops in LMP3 between the flag waving and the chequered flag coming out. Uh, all I'd say here is... Two of those stops need to be 105 seconds. Because of the timing of the safety car, um, the, the four teams that have made that long stop, as things stand, have got a massive advantage to come because uh, they've done a minute and 45 minimum. In fact, the, the quickest of those that have done the long stop is a minute and 53. And in fact, your international's number 11 crew did one in two minutes and 18 seconds, but still leads the race yeah. and will have a short stop later in the race. So that's a big advantage for the number 11 crew. Uh, the second place car hasn't done a long stop. The third place car has. So this will be topsy-turvy stuff <laughs> if we stay green. Martin Berry, Ryan Hardwick, third position for that car, Takeshi Kimura. None of these drivers yet have done the required 90 minutes. So can't get out of the car yet, but it does look like all the bronzes are trying to, or the sharp end at least, the bronzes trying to get their drive time out of the way in one slug. Some, uh, a quick snack there for one or two crew members in garages up and down the pit lane because we are at dinner time now, nearly 7.25 on Saturday night. Lumping right over the kerb there was Takeshi Kimura, maybe feeling the presence of Arnold Robin in the big Aston Martin with the yellow door mirrors. A car 72, the TF Sport That's run a change, advantage. Isn't it? Kessel ahead of TF Sport now. That's a change. Yes. Well, when they were running in that leading quintet, Kessel were ahead of Arnold Robin, but more recently the Aston got in front. It was it? definitely the other way okay. around. Zach Robichon enjoying that and uh, just checking out if we got his best side. Yes, we did, Zach. Yes, we <laughs> did. So the Aston Martin is not quite close enough this time to get the place back again. But after very good speed in the early stages from the Johnny Lawson Ferrari for Formula Racing. If you stepped away from the race briefly, you will have missed a nasty accident that involved the 50 car and the 43 into Europol competition, LMP2 car. And the net result of that is that both cars are out of the race. It's taken a leading contender from GTE out with it, but Johnny Lawson judged to be at fault. Although, to be honest, even though it was under investigation, uh, it doesn't really help either car. No. Certainly doesn't help Rui Andrade. Confirmed, by the way, by the team that it is a retirement for the 43 car. Suspension damage after that impact. Yeah. And uh, you saw the in-car with Ray Andrade, how just how frustrating that was when the car was running in such a strong position. Yeah, absolutely hammering the steering wheel and uh, shouting probably on the radio as well, but the team will have been shouting right back at him too. He's going, there's nothing we can do, there's nothing you could have done. That's unfortunately one that got away and a damaged race car in order to repair the next time we see that, which is likely to be in uh, about five weeks' time at spa Francorchamps. Possibly a late call here for Nico Pino to come on pit road. Tyres being prepared for Duquesne. Well, he's one of the last cars to come in for a second routine stop. The other one in LMP2 is the race leader. So Phil Hansen ahead of Nico Pino by eight seconds at the moment. Pino has had a second stop, but that was a drive through. So both the two leading cars have had one routine stop. And ultimately, with the safety car, what does it cost Nico Pino? About eight seconds. Yeah. So i would be expecting Phil Hansen in, uh, in the not too distant future. And also Nico Pino, here he comes now, in fact. So that will be 22 laps on the stint. Phil Hansen last time around managed, well, he goes across the line to complete 23 now. So clearly, United are getting some good fuel mileage there. They made 19 laps with the two formation uh, tours at the start of the race. But I do think next time around, Phil Hansen will also be wanting Dolly's some fuel. ready for this car. I'll be just to reposition the car. My yeah, apologies. Probably because the LMP3 car was yes. pitting nearby as well, so they, would knew, they knew that it would be a slightly peculiar angle and to straighten that car up. Thankfully, it doesn't look like it's going to need to be pushed into the garage. Strong run from Duquesne again. It's yes. been a great season for them so far. 
and uh, but a very strong run indeed from United Autosports. But we should remember they've started a gold-ranked driver. That's right, and uh, yeah, one of only a handful of teams that did that. So Phil Hansen has done more than enough driving time now. He only needed to do an hour, but he is the gold and outpaced everybody in qualifying earlier on in the day. They'll be looking to try and give Marino Sato uh, as close to the hour as possible. But the problem again is that that does not fit neatly into an LMP2 stint because P2s will do 40 minutes and then another 40 minutes takes you into an hour and 20. So it doesn't ideally fit. But Marino Sato is more than capable of doing a double stint if it's he that will be out in that car next. Yeah. That's it's the fray after another stop. James Dason in the RLRM Sport car, but that car's way down the order. Luca Lapier, by the way, rejoined in the 37. Cool racing car that was in the garage for a little wee while. How long was that stop for Nicolas Lapier? It was four minutes in the garage. Now the leader pits, 22 car, and Phil Hansen is out to the car. It's been Marino Sato in. Are they gonna... Oh, that was a touch between the 24 and the 30. Cold tyres for the 30 car as well. Rene Binder fully alongside, but it was the touch that spun the car. And he had very little traction then from those rear tyres. So Rene Binder uh, having to probably do a bit of a three-point turn to get going again and uh, rejoin the race. But it would be going so well for Duquesne up until that point, as you've been making the point, Graham. And now, disaster on the outlap for the new driver into that car. Yeah, and right at the point where they would have been wanted to put the, the, the screws on this car. With a new driver aboard as well. So, what has happened... It's still shown it's on its outlap, but it's not cleared the second sector. So should be around 5, 48, 50 seconds in that sector for the number 30 car, but it is tumbling down the order at the moment. We'll wait and see just exactly what goes on as the 22 rolls down pit lane. We'll wait to see who's going to come through in the lead of this race. I think Edex Sport may have taken the lead here. Sato, I'm sure it is, it is indeed. Lance Hurt comes through side by side with a P3 car, and I think when we get to the next timing, it is going to be Lance Hurt in the lead of the race from Marino Sato. There's about two, three seconds between the two of them. Finally, the Duquesne team car has come through to complete the lap, drops to 11th place, Rene Binder. That's a disaster for the number 30 car. So Marino Sato now needs to get his head down. In export, delighted with that. There is the unmistakable features of Nick Manazian. Amazing endurance racer in his time, now the sporting head of Edex Sports. He's put together this effort, given Jürgen Lanter from Germany his first full season opportunity in LMP2 and he's been delivering 22 and 65 that's for position as well so Sato down to third so that's, uh, compressing in the field under the safety car really did not do United Order Sports any favours whatsoever Morning flag, by the way, going to Jens Greiner Moller for abuse of track limits in a GMB motorsport car. We'll get to that at some point, but Marino Sato trying his best to get the heat into the Goodyear tyres. Get back with this programme. United team putting back onto the track, having just lost the lead to Lance Hur. He's lost a single place to Tiemann van der Helm in the number 65 Panis racing car since rejoining the race. There is Van der Helm, just the bottom of the picture. And where is the next challenger? It is Richard de Geris in fourth place. So LMP2 field sorting itself out. 
But uh, the story at the moment is Marino Sato dropping back as he tries to get up to speed. It's going to be Edex Sport from Panis Racing, then the United Autosports USA 22 car. Cool Racing getting involved in this as well. Lawrence Hur, though, is away and clear, and almost six seconds clear now. Uh, now not of the United Autosports car, but of Panis Racing number 65. These two teams have been amongst the form players in LMS Racing this year. And again, it's come to pass. A lot of this, Johnny Palmer, has come their way because the, the gap built by Phil Hansen negated by that safety car. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing is that you put the gold in, they build a lead, and then you have an incident. And you can blame me again because I did happen to say that we'd stay green. But um, there's always, I think, the higher probability is that you're going to get a safety car or a caution in the early phase of the race. And there's always the danger of not putting the silver in then at the start. The silver has to work a little bit harder after the caution, effectively. The 65 time and von der Helm car there. Uh, circuit, circulating through the tight hairpin at the end of the long straight. Laurence Hoare for Edex Sport ahead of Time of Onda Helm. And that gap's probably going to stay about the same. In fact, Laurence Hoare's previous form should tell us that he'll certainly be able to meet Time of Onda Helm's pace and maybe increase upon it very slightly. Well, like any young gun in an LMP2 car, and particularly in for a first year, given the opportunity to show what he's got in pace, he'll respond. And this is one of those moments, it's time uh, to show just exactly what pace you've got. We're going to hear, I'm sure, very shortly down in the pits. Yeah, so uh, Steph Wentworth have been stomping around uh, around the team that have been doing so well up until this point, recently getting out of the United Order Sports car. Let's grab a word with our former race leader. I'm with Phil Hansen, driver of number 22 United Autosport. You've just jumped out of the car, great stint from you, started on pole, came in from first position, so all good from your end. Yeah, almost all good. We um, That safety car kind of put a bit of a, a damper on the gap that I was able to build in the first stint, um, but I was able to build again a nice little gap at the end. Um, but ideally, we wouldn't have had the safety car and we could have just continued that one gap. Um, but yeah, you can't plan for those things, but um, I'm quite happy with where the car is, so I'm pretty confident that the that Marino and, um, and Oli can do a good job now and bring it home, hopefully. And in terms of the conditions, as we know, the sun is starting to set, so it's going to change a little bit. How prepared are you guys for what's, up, what's coming up? I actually haven't driven in the night, so I'm glad I'm done now. Um, but the other guys, they, they were quite quick in the night session, so um, I'm pretty confident in their ability. The thing is, I, it's just going to be a quite a hectic race for traffic, so um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see another safety car at some point towards the end of the race. All right, well, thanks for talking to us. No worries, thanks. Phil Hansen chatting to Steph. Clearly that was a deliberate ta tactic, therefore, to make sure that Phil was in the car purely for the daylight hours. They didn't even bother putting him into free practice two, which was held mainly in the night time. So Marino Sato, perhaps more comfortable with, uh, yeah, I'll take on board some, some night time running. And then the other guy they've got in the car is some bloke called Ollie Jarvis. Never heard of him. It's probably all right. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I mean, Sato, less experienced in these cars, so I'm, I'm intrigued as to why it's, it's a heavy, Phil. It's a heavy lift for him, but yeah. then again, if their strategy had gone the way they hoped it would, he'd be defending a bigger lead. True. And he wasn't defending a lead because he didn't lead as he left the pits. So that's exactly what Phil was bemoaning, but he was keeping a brave face on it. They're in the mix. You know, top three or four. Plug in Ollie Jarvis, and all joking aside, there's few people in this in this uh, uh, on this epic grid more experienced than Oliver Jarvis in endurance racing in a range of machinery. Yeah, LMP2, LMP1, DPI, you name it, he's driven it. It's uh, he's had a staggering career. And has uh, done stacks of nighttime running as absolutely. well across the IMSA. That's where the Tech Sports Car Championship stuff he's done, and of course at Le Mans as well. Um, so every confidence in what he will be able to do in the number 22 car and the beauty of sports car racing is you can have a plan and then it doesn't quite go as the way you would wish as phil's just said we didn't want, really want the safety car but they're out that's out of your control control the controllables is the old phrase so uh, just slightly adjust uh, now they've uh, plugged in the new driver into 22 marino sato and he will have to deal with most likely the sunset period as well which is 
an hour and what seven minutes away 8.45 new fastest lap of the race by the way it goes to the 37 car that had that uh, issue in the garage a little while ago back into the top 20 for Nicolas Pierre as he recovers back up through the LMP3s that new fastest lap is a 148.951 He's, uh, I think, reasonably, just looking at the caps here, he has got quite a chunk of time to make up to get back to the LMP2s. No message on the screen about full headlights needing to be on. Interestingly, the 81, uh, sorry, the Dragon Speed car has is it got... 81? It is the 81, thank you. Damage. Um, it may have damage, but it's also got full headlights on, whereas the two cars behind, I didn't think, had... Um, just marker lights. Yeah, maybe just marker lights at this stage. It's from Pablo Montoya aboard the 81 car. The um, side lights, if you like, yeah, from a road right, car. You are right, it is full beam. But um, I would imagine that we're going to get a message on the screen to say, right, full headlights on from this point, and it's going to be maybe 8.30 uh, when we're a lot closer to the night time. Well, the GTE and LMP2 headlamps, full endurance spec for those, it's... How can I put it? A small star uh, in each corner of those cars. Yeah. And the uh, high intensity rain lights on the rear. Oh, that's a hip check there between the 20. And a bit of afters there as well, I think. Who's aboard the 20 at the moment? That's uh, Ben Fiscal. And that was with the 23 car. So initial impact was. That is Garnet Patson. That's the pro car. Uh, I wonder whether it was the 21, actually, that there was the contact with. It was the one with the white visor just in behind no. there. 23's just got ahead now and is taking the fight back to okay. car 20. I think the side-by-side -side was actually with the 21. And who's at the Andy wheel of Merrick. that Pro-Am? Yeah, Andy Merrick getting stuck in as well. A little bit of physicality at this stage of the race. They try to sort out just what the running order is going to be as the sun goes down as we lose the natural light and they rely rather more on what they're carrying on board so very easy to pick out juan pablo montoya on that long shot of this really long straight into uh, 16 because he's the only one with the full blinding headlights illuminated at this stage of the race the 31 racing spirit of le mans lmp3 car is just heading now through the twisty stuff with Jean Ludovic Foubert at the wheel of that. It's in sixth position and trying to hunt down Eric Truyer. It's about 13 seconds that separate them. Busy oh, in the first corner, and there's a spin busy. there for the number seven car from Nielsen Racing. That's Tony Wells, who had to get through the corner at some point, but there was contact from one of the two United Order Sports cars. I didn't pick it which out which one it was I think at first. It was the first of the two, so that would be the 23 in the order that they run at the moment. Have another look. They're actually side by side behind Tony Wells, and you're right, it is the 23 car that makes the contact with the rear of the Nielsen LMP3. 21 has to run off the road. Mercifully, it was just one light touch and not a secondary impact, because that could have been there's another side by side impact. This is getting very hectic indeed. That's the DKR car, I think, uh, on one of that's the Racing Spirit of the Mon. Or Lima. Um, LMP3, and that's Ryan Hardwick miss, uh, losing a place. Is it still Ryan aboard that car? Down the inside of Hardwick goes the Aston Martin, 72 of Arnold Robban, and will pick the Porsche off in the right motorsports colours, although run by Proton Competition. Ryan Hardwick wanting to try and get back in front at the first available opportunity, but into the corkscrew wasn't quite offered the gap there from Arnold Robat. No, he's lost two places in about two corners there, and Duncan Cameron is closing and closing fast on this battle as well. I wonder whether an element of this is the safety car grouping all of the individual classes up, and then you've got quicker cars catching slower classes but in big bunches absolutely right and, and it's hectic it's, it's really frantic stuff here it's like the start of the race all over again it, it's, it most certainly is and the problem being you lose just that little bit of momentum and all of a sudden it's not one place gone it's three yeah in the case of ryan hardwick it's two and duncan cameron is right with him and drivers are having to make very quick decisions in medium speed corners for instance at turn one and that's the reason why you saw that very slight error from Garnet Patterson who tagged the rear of Tony Wells he was entirely the innocent party there Tony by the way has got back oh, underway and Good. is back up to speed also closing by the way on this group is 
car I don't remember mentioning apart from uh, on the grid, and that's the 77 Porsche Christian Reed. Yeah, he's, uh, uh, well, he's, he's had a relatively quiet race at this point, I suppose. We're used to seeing that car further up the order, and I'm trying to remember now whether that is one of the ones that is suffering with success ballast. Yeah, it's got 20 extra kilos for company, not the heaviest car on the grid, but nevertheless, that will be affecting its performance. Martin Berry, meanwhile, uh, is six seconds up the road from this fight, so he's had a cracking restart from that safety car period. Due a bit of luck. They've had some poor fortune this year in the 66 car. Now, one of the first stoppers in GTE is Michael Fassbender. And remember, he pitted, didn't he, after the spin, after the contact he with did. the number 30 car. They will have fueled it at that stage. So he is very much off strategy now. And if these figures are correct... Does he need an hour and 45 minutes? No, 90 minutes as the So bonds. he can get out of the car now. He can. So actually, this may go very much in his favour. He pitted well ahead of the other GTE cars because he needed a new set of tyres, basically, but they will have fuelled it for the full hour. And now we are an hour later from that first pit stop. It's going to be tricky to make the finish on this rhythm, but at least, you know, Fassbender can get out now go for the debrief he really did collect his thoughts very well indeed and I think the times were good after the contact with the number 30 car surely it'll be Martin Rumpin now for probably a stint and a half or so so frustrated Michael Fassbender not for the first time this season explaining to Sebastian who's the project manager the program manager for uh, Michael's five-year program with Porsche but I think once he's got that little bit of adrenaline out he drove very well after recovering from that. The smile is coming. There you go. That's what I want to see. Winning Hollywood looks. Come on. <laughs> Sebastian said something, and Michael replied, I know. And I, I think know. it was fully com it was complimentary and then some. And he said, yeah, you know, I, I, I put that incident aside and I continued on. And I reckon the average pace after the incident was probably just as good as it was before. And... Uh, Two or three years ago, I'm not sure he would have been able to clear that from his mind quite as successfully as he did this time around. Unfortunately, at times, that car does feel like it's been a bit of a punching bag through the various recent races and uh, absolutely through no fault of his own. But the 93 car is now in the hands of Richard Leitz, in fact. I suggested it might be Martin Rubb, but it's the Austrian driver who takes over as the platinum. You said earlier the, the, uh, the broadcast, Johnny, that uh, we, we had a, a, a delighting, a, a, that we were delighted that there were so many fans here. It was down on pit lane for the autograph session. Big lines with a number of the big name drivers: mm. Jose Maria Lopez, uh, Neil Jarni, and the '93 Porsche. Very popular, of course, mainly because of Richard Leeds. Always is. Never fails to amaze me just how much love there is in fandom for the rapid Austrian and his celebrity uh, buddy. Yeah. Well, you know, as Michael Fassbender's sort of sitting alongside him, then a few people Maybe. said, can you, can you sign this for Maybe. me as well? Maybe, could you do me yourself? Not many, though. But to be honest, the queue was for Richard, yeah. Mainly, mainly Entirely. Entirely. Car 44, Jens Moller now being report, reported to the stewards for the abuse of track limits. So that's nine times out of ten results in a penalty. Nice little dive from one side of the track to the other over Christian Reed for Marino Sato there to pick off the GT car. He's now, by the way, uh, holding off uh, Russian Giras and is closing back in on Tamin van, van der Helm. So whilst Lawrence Hur is retaining that six-second lead, Behind this field is compressing, and all of a sudden, the Palace Racing car is under pressure from the 22 United Autosports car. So Marino Sato has gathered himself and is now back in this hunt. Sweeping over the line, the former race leading United Autosports car, straight on there. It's team Virage for car. The 19 Virage with Ian Rodriguez. No, that was the LMP3 car, I it think, was. Within Vir for Virage, beg your pardon. And that is number eight, Nick Adcock. That's one of the delayed cars, isn't it? Yeah. Unfortunately, Nick at the moment, right at the back of the pack, but looking for somebody to fight with. Alexander Bukantsov will be the first name on the list, but he's about a lap behind, in fact, the DKR engineering pilot. 
out of turn seven they go over a slight rise and then homing into view is the corkscrew section through turns eight and nine lots of curb taken through the first element of that by the 47 car of Richard de Heeres to hear us uh, the Frenchman who has a pole position to his name already this season in the number 47 cool racing car and three amber dots on the side of the Aston Martin for Arnold Robin tells it tells us that it is into the podium positions now and looking to get a little closer to Takeshi Kimura three cars at very close quarters as well working their way through turns five and six with the high point at seven to come next and this is Juan Pablo Montoya fighting with Bent Viscal. They are running sixth and seventh in the LMP2 Pro-Am division. So we've been speaking a lot about the 93 Porsche and its outgoing driver. Richard Leitz now in charge, but let's have a word with the man who's just stepped out of it. I'm joined by Michael Fassbender, driver of the number 93 Porsche Proton Competition. Now, it was a difficult start for you, that contact that was, uh, was not your fault, uh, but you had a great recovery drive. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, kind of a crazy move around the outside in the last last corner going up the straight. And um, then I just couldn't, like, get it out of fifth gear. I had to get it down, you know, to get it into first to select reverse. But I just couldn't get it out of fifth gear, so I was stuck there for a while. Eventually, uh, managed to go through the gears. And then I thought I didn't reverse enough and it was going to be quite embarrassing and have to do an Austin Powers moment on the straight, but um, it worked out okay. And then the re recovery drive was a lot of fun. Uh, we got lucky with the safety car, but I think we're due some luck. Uh, you know, these last three races, just getting taken out like this, kind of a little frustrating. But like I said, I had a lot of fun, you know, on the recovery drive. And as you mentioned, you've been very unlucky, as you said, but you've got a lot of pace in this car and that's going to take you through very well for the rest of the season, no? Uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to lose, uh, you know, a couple of possibilities of podiums. You know, we really wanted to fight for the championship a, a bit this year, you know, go for it. Um, but look, I love it. It's amazing. Uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege. And yeah, just have to look at the positive. Thank you so much. To get someone with film star good looks, Steph Wentworth that was, and uh, and Michael Fassbender who uh, crowbarred in a film reference. I noticed there. Well done, Michael. Oh, I missed that. Uh, Austin Powers. Oh yeah, he wasn't yeah. in that though, was he? No, which is I think oh, that's oh, uh, his oh, agent. Or, his agent will be on to him. Uh, the next time you drop a film uh, reference, mate, make it one of yours yeah. or one of ours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, great stuff from Steph. Not that he needs to. I, I, <laughs> I feel for him because yes. he's so fast and he's, get, he's been getting better and better. Uh, often put in for the opening stint, which is the busiest. You know, he survived that first, those first few corners and was doing entirely the right thing coming through 17 and 18. And then why was there a P2 car way out wide off the track who eventually made contact with him? Anyway, By the, the 30 car was penalised, had to do a drive through, but that explains why he was sitting there for so long couldn't get it out of fifth gear. It wasn't the fact that it wouldn't engage into reverse. It was just so far far up in the box. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one uh, quick moment, and it's a significant one. Rino Sato through into second place now, uh, but it's 10 seconds back from Lawrence Hur, I think has got the hurry up to say, this guy's got some pace at this stage of the race. Hammer down, he's done that. So it's now Lawrence Hur, Friedrich Sport in the 28 car with a 16 uh, car on pit lane at the moment. So amongst a gaggle of GTEs there. Uh, he's got ten and a half seconds ahead of Marino Sato in the 22 United Autosports USA car. And then Panis Racing's team and van der Helm under pressure now uh, from Richard De Geras in the number 47 cool racing car in a battle for third. In LMP2 Pro-Am, it's Nielsen Racing lead the way. Ben Hanley, uh, sixth overall in the 24 car that was started by Rodrigo Salles. Uh, and he's followed by Charlie Eastwood, 1.2 seconds back. Uh, in the number 34 Racing Team Turkey car that's had a bit of an up and down race so far. Uh, that has led the race, as has the third place car, the 99 Proto Competition car, uh, which we know is in the hands of Jimmy Bruni. He's a further eight seconds back. LMP3 is still with the number 11 Euro International car. It's Matthew Richard Bell, not the Matt Bell uh, we know more, most often, the one that run, won the race yesterday in the Michelin Le Mans Cup, but another Matt, Matt Bell. Uh, second place is Inter-Europol competition and the Polish Bakers, uh, racing Bakers rather, are 
going to have to rely on the 13 for any uh, podium action after the with the uh, the uh, elimination of the race from the race in the 43 LMP2 car. Uh, it is Miguel Cristalvo in that car, and he is 47 seconds back and actually did the short pit stop, not the long pit stop. Yeah, okay. Uh, so W10 by Rinaldi Racing, Tosten Kratz is aboard that car, and some big gaps in LMP3, 48 seconds back for that car. GTE, JMW Motorsport, Martin Berry in, back into the lead and pulling away 11 seconds to good now from Duncan Cameron, who stayed out uh, that lap and is going to uh, come through in second place next time around Alvin Braban in the number 72 TF Sport car. The Aston Martin is in third, and it's a massive stop-and-go penalty for car 13. Two minutes and 40 seconds stop-and-go for disrespecting the pass-around procedure. So that must mean it did a pass-around that it shouldn't have done. Yeah, wasn't instructed to, and nevertheless did it. I mean, we don't know for sure, but that's a huge penalty. And it goes from bad to worse for inter Europol competition. They were leading at the time that they had the drama with the 43 LMP2 car. They were leading P3. And I was saying, OK, well, all of the um, concentration must now shift to the other part of their garage. Well, they're going to be two minutes and 40 seconds behind, together with the time it takes to come down pit road as well, more or less takes them out of any good result in LMP3 now as well. Disaster. Dragon Speed, meanwhile, trying to rip off the broken uh, dive plane on the 81 on the right-hand side. Ben Viscal have been trying his absolute hardest to get ahead of the car that he was battling with earlier on. It was... I forget now, but he was, he was nose to tail with somebody and now has been told, or at least reported to the stewards, for the abusive track limits car 20. So Viscal may well be about to have a penalty coming his way too. That was damage on the 81 Dragon Speed car as it rejoined that, with still Han Pablo Montoya at the wheel. Yeah, that was the attempt to remove the dive plane that went badly wrong in that car. The, off the track is the LMP2 Prime leader. That's the 24 car in the hands of Ben Hanley. Sixth place overall, and what has happened there? But uh, Ben Hanley rejoins the track, but that's delayed him enough for... Charlie Eastwood to take the lead. So Eastwood up to sixth place overall, but more crucially to the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am for Racing Team Turkey. Jimmy Bruni slots into second in the 99 car, and Alessio Rivera is up to third. So a huge loss for Ben, for ben Hanley, slipping down three positions. I've remembered who Ben Vizcar was battling with. It was Juan Pablo Montoya. That's why they're not together now, because Montoya has just made a pit stop. This is the achingly long two minutes and 40 seconds stop-go penalty for car 13 for disrespecting the pass-around procedure. That's them done in this race. Yeah, they were earlier on out front when the pit stop cycle was taking place. We had a dominant runaway leader in the form of Adam Alley, you'll remember, in car number 11. They're now taking charge of that Matthew Bell from the south of England rather than Matt Bell, who hails from Newcastle in the northeast of the UK. It's the 66 GMW car getting underway after the stopping from the lead. GMB Motorsport, who will always a pit stop, take the lead for the moment. So the top three cars in the order as it stood, 65, 55 and 72 were all on pit road. 66 is away. 72 is just about to get uh, new rubber. 55 is away. Richard Tigreiras then is now peeling off into pit lane for Cool Racing and also Charlie Eastwood racing Team Turkey into the pit lane for a scheduled stop as well. So those two LMP2 cars will slip down the order, albeit briefly. It is busy, busy, busy out there, isn't it? Right in the melee, car 25 for Algarve Pro Racing. That's the car, remember, that started from the back of the grid. It's got Barbadian driver Kiffin Simpson now at the wheel, and he's up to fourth position. LMP2 Pro-Am leader, 34 car, comes in for its latest pit stop. There will, though, be two drive-through penalties for significant runners. One of them, the 44 car that currently leads GTE, does always a pit stop, but currently leads. It's abuse of track limits for the 44 car in the hands of Jan Reina Mola. And the other one is the Algar Pro Racing car. You mentioned him before, Ben Viscal. It's a 
it's going to be a drive-through for that car as well, again for track limits abuse. Yeah, and uh, so often a penalty is moments away when we get the, the pink-backed message to say they've been reported to the stewards. That's normally cut and dry even before we get the official secondary message. So Juan Pablo Montoya and to his left hand side is that the 20 car again that's the 25 25 this okay. is this is Kevin Simpson now yes alongside the 81 car so this is the fourth place car overall and where is big slide there from the Elgar Pro car as it came through the hairpin just looking to see where Juan Pablo Montoya is in this order quite a way down 16th 9th in the LMP2 program class and a, la uh, a lap down so that was a lap going on the 81 from the fourth place car busy pit lane uh, there's the 28 of Laurence Hoare pitting from third position he was out front of course not too long ago 83 in from the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am as is Jimmy Bruni so Alessio Rivera and Jimmy Bruni the two Italians from the top two in Pro-Am, fifth and sixth overall. That was Lawrence Hurd pitting from the lead, so he's lost the lead yeah. as he's come in. So Marino Sato, who is, it does always a stop, as does Timon van der Helm and Kiffin Simpson, are now one, two, three, but will need to pit. Rene Binder uh, doesn't pit this time around either, and uh, he just comes through into fourth position for the moment. We are under a minute, Johnny, away from halfway through this race. Hasn't quit, has it? Certainly not. Yeah, an hour and 59 minutes on the clock. A really steady run at the start of the race where everyone was just finding the flow, but very few interruptions. We had a safety car intervention then just shy of the first hour being completed. And since then, it does seem to have got very, very busy. As, uh, as I mentioned, the various classes separated into significant groups. And then when you have the leading LMP2 cars finding a gaggle of, L of uh, GTEs or a gaggle of LMP3s, it's very difficult then to thread your way through safely. So the safety car period lasted 13 minutes. Since then, we have had nearly, nearly 19 minutes or so of the of green flag running since then. So... Again, a good run and a, a good yardstick, really, for the rest of the teams to work out where they may be on fuel mileage. So the 99 heading back into the race, that's Jean-Marie Bruni. Alessia Rivera has maintained the race lead in LMP2 Pro-Am. Charlie Eastwood getting between, though, the two pit stoppers on that lap. And how far away is Eastwood now from Rivera? It's 0.9 of a second, in fact. Yes, that's the Rivera-driven car just turning left, or is he ahead of him already? Just working out where Rivera is. Now, the AF Corsa car is just a bit further up the road from Charlie Eastwood. It is just slightly less than a second, 0.9 to be exact. So Nick Adcock in car number eight is the latest to be reported for abusing track limits. That car, though, is way down the order. Also, the incident we saw that saw Tony Wells put around with uh, Guy Smith involved in that at Turn 1, that incident is confirmed as being under investigation. So it is Charlie Eastwood ahead of Jimmy Bruni. This is a tight battle in LMP2 Pro-Am, and the recovering Ben Hanley is in fourth. But those four cars separated by four seconds. Car 11 is another two minutes, 40 second pass round infringement. That is our dominant leader. But we wondered why that was such a gap. We thought that was caused by the safety car. Yeah. But actually what it was, was those two cars passed around when they should not have done. Well, Adam Alley had uh, almost uh, taken the, the race by the uh, real stranglehold in the early stages, and that was down to sheer pace. It was well before the safety car, Adam Alley, led by a considerable margin, not the sort of margin we often see in LMP3, but it's obviously been made worse by the fact that they were not asked to pass around, and they did. Indeed. We can only assume. By the way, new leader in L and GTE, and that's because the Kessel Racing car has just gone around the outside of JMW, so Logan Hannafin loses the position to Greg, Huff, uh, Greg Huffaker with 
the Proton Competition car now in the hands of Zach Robichon in a close third as well. All sorts going on, Johnny. Yeah, that's right. So side by side Ferraris in the bright yellow livery. The Kessel Racing of Gregory Huffaker, or as I like to call him, Scott Huffaker, because that's how he likes to be referred to. I don't fully know. Still haven't had the chat with him, actually, no. about why he's known as that. But if you watch the World Endurance Championship, you'll see a Scott Huffaker in that racing for Kessel. It's exactly the same guy. But I'm he's still not he's entered, he's entered as Gregory <laughs> for some reason in our entry list. So I'll call him Scott. You'll see him on the graphic as Gregory, but it definitely says S Huffaker on the roof of the car when you get nice and close to it. David Perel in this best battle as well. And you're not far, much further back is the 51 car, Rui Agwash. The fire still burns for Rui. The Greek flag across the bonnet of the 51 car. GTE battle still fully lit here. Turning left and right at the base of the stone wall. And now heading slightly downhill into this tricky approach to 14 and 15. 15 by far the tightest of that little group of four corners. And there is a sausage curve sitting waiting to punish you if you take too much liberty there. And obviously if you continue to punish the curves that will really start to I mean the tyres are worn far more readily. It's less of a concern in GTE because you can keep chucking tyres at it for the Goodyear Eagles that they run on this year. So out of the tight corner at turn 16 goes the race leader Scott Huffaker with Lorcan Hannafin at close quarters. That gap is steadily growing. Tremendous battle between Zach Robichon and David Perel though in the blue Porsche and the green and white Ferrari. Biggest gap, by the way, first to, what is that, sixth in GTE is 2.3 seconds. And the smallest is 0.3. Matthew Richard Bell in pit road now in the number 11 Euro International car. So that's surely for this very, very long pit stop that he needs to serve as a penalty for skipping by the safety car when he wasn't told to. Depends, of course, where he was in the order, but generally the cars that are released are those that are trapped behind the safety car and in front of their class leader. Correct. He was the class leader at the time, so would not have been told that he could take the wave by. So he's gained himself even more of a, an advantage. This should equal things up quite a bit in LMP3. And strangely enough, it's that man we were talking about earlier on, Torsten Kratz, who will be the first to benefit in the Wokenspiegel team Monschau by Rinaldi, number 12, Duquesne. So remember, Torsten led a significant chunk of yesterday's Michelin Le Mans Cup race for Murphy prototypes. In the end, they weren't classified because Torsten pitted too late and didn't give uh, Will Bratt long enough behind the wheel of the car. I'm not sure Greg Murphy cared a great deal about that, though, really. I think no. he just enjoyed his day, I'll I be think, honest with you. Yeah, absolutely right, and uh, uh, he signed a cracking driver in Torsten Kratz. They really hope that Torsten is up for doing the remaining races uh, well, in the Michelin Le Mans Cup. There you Cup. go. I mean, uh, but it's better you still, by the way, for W10 by Rinaldi, because they're one of the, uh, the minority of teams that have already burned one of their long stops. So they may well have... In fact, they've just burned one of their long stops, that's right. And by the way, these um, stop and hold penalties will not count towards that. No, no. You could argue that they uh, they should. Well, we were in there for 105 seconds and even more time than that. But no, this is a penalty and therefore can't be worked in a positive way no. as, a, as a, a longer visit to the pit lane. It's effectively a lap and a half is what it comes down to with the time lost on pit lane as well. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have to be going really well to get anywhere close to that, to getting that back. Unless there's another safety car, of course. Yeah. But for goodness sake, if there is, don't take the wave by, <laughs> <laughs> which was the error in the first place. Making light of uh, a sorry situation for Euro International. Torsten Kratz is now officially the new race leader in LMP3 for WTM by Rinaldi. Alejandro Garcia for Cool Racing. It's about three and a half minutes further back. Well, mind you, that will be a gap that was timed as Matthew Bell entered pit road. So we'll wait to see. Glorious sunset just starting now. We're still about 35 minutes away from the official time that the sun sets on the horizon. We can enjoy these pictures now for a good half an hour or so. 
Canadian Zach Robichon continues to fend off the close attentions of the 55 Sprint race driver, South African David Perel. David in a busy time at the moment, not just here on the racetrack, but also noticed his, his name several times in the credits for the brand new Gran Turismo movie. He's the uh, sim racing advisor on that movie and uh, pretty clearly a principal consultant to it. And uh, known in the gaming community, not by his given name, but as Coach Dave. OK. Um, and provides all sorts of setups for all sorts of race cars in a variety of platforms. So we should be calling him Dave Perel then, really. Uh, Coach Dave, just Coach. Coach Dave. Coach. Oh, yeah, all right, Coach. OK, I'll uh, weave that in. So we've got Scott Huffaker, who's not Gregory Huffaker, but kind of is, but isn't. And then Coach Dave yes. can replace no, David no Perel. No confusion at all there. No, no, no. At all. I'll rewrite the memory banks <laughs> as there's the racing team turkey car, the number 34, bouncing around. Still not quite got the full headlights on, but the side lights are doing a tremendous job. This is the battle for the lead in an MP2 Pro Am. I wonder whether it might be. And yeah. it is four cars deep. This and is... oh, that's uh, helped actually to concertina things up because Charlie Eastwood was in two minds to overtake a car that he used to drive. It's still a actually, TS sport car, he yes. is. Yeah, and he used to be a, a mean racer in an Aston Martin. Did Charlie Eastwood? So he sort of knows the behaviour of that car. And sure. late on the brakes to pull off the overtake around the outside, Charlie Eastwood will retain the lead in Pro Am, albeit uh, for the time being. There is bad bad news for car 11 reported to the stewards for not respecting the stop and go penalty so they've served a penalty and it wasn't enough how long were Three they minutes in the and pits 48 ah did they service the car as well did they do that i hope not well did they did they service the car in fa uh, you know do that first and then they wanted to do the penalty to the side of it but you're going to run out of time because normally those penalties have to be served within 3 laps and if you if they just continued to pound round and then eventually when they did appear on pit road they just did a normal pit stop that's yeah they're going to look on that uh, not so positively no, on the not. race officials it's, it's very clear you come and serve a penalty you come back around and you perform your stop if you want to delay it the other way around you come in you do your regular stop as long as it's within three laps of getting the penalty the next time around you come yeah. and serve your penalty they so know better than that that That's... gets around an issue of you being short on fuel because you could say well we had to do a pit stop because we wouldn't uh, continue into the next stint but that's what the three laps are for. Correct. It does allow you to do a standard pit stop and then still come in to do your two minutes and 40 penalty. Next to the naughty step is going to be Guy Smith. Drive through penalty for car 23 for causing a collision with car 7. That was Tony Wells and the Nilsson Racing LMP3 car. So where is Guy Smith in the running order? Has he got out the car now? I think he possibly has. But nevertheless, the penalty is assessed to the car rather than the specific driver. So car 23... We'll still have to uh, still have to observe that. Meanwhile, are you talking about Guy Smith? Where that can't be right. He's, it says car 23, so it's car 23 that was. Yes, it was. Yes, it was definitely 23. Garnet Patterson that made contact with the back of Tony. So it's Wells. Garnet Pitt Patterson. My apologies, Guy. He knows I've got the greatest of admiration for him. I, I did say that at the time, well, I, you but know, it's also quite difficult to tell these uh, three United Autosports cars the same to me, these United Autosports cars, these racing well, drivers. I tell you, the 22's got a red visor, the 21's got a white visor when you look at it head-on, and then the other one's got a dark blue visor that matches the rest of the car, and that's the 23. But they don't necessarily have those in the right order. I'd be expecting a legal letter from Guy Smith's representatives. I would say that's a fair cop. I should think so. Go on, Guy, get it done. <laughs> just, just, to, just to frighten him. Back into the race goes the number 22, so Marino Sato from the race lead, pitting at the end of... That was a 22-lap stint. Shorter than Phil Hansen managed to go, although was the Hansen stint... Yeah, it had a safety car in the middle of it, so that's the reason why he was able to eke out a couple of extra laps. So, Marino Sato now in and out of the pits, came in with a minute and six seconds to the good. He'd pulled that lead out over Lance Hurt, who I think will have gone through into the lead here. 
or has he? It's flutter, be... of a, a flutter of a turbocharger there, which sounded superb in the background. We've just gone over, I say just 12 minutes ago, we went through the halfway marker. What a wonderful skyline it is here at Motorland Aragon as the sun slowly drops to the horizon. 22 United Autosports has just made a stop, but Marino Sata still out front ahead of Edex Sports number 28, Lawrence Hoare. Then it's Cool Racing, Panis and Algarve Pro Racing completing the top five of LMP2. Racing Team Turkey in the hands of Charlie Eastwood leads the Pro-Am category ahead of the AF Corsa and Alessio Rivera-driven prototype number 83. Third in that class is Jean-Marie Bruni. LMP3 now led. It's all been shaken up by these recent penalties. Torsten Kratz is in the lead in the WTM by Rinaldi Racing number 12, ahead of Cool Racing's Alejandro Garcia and Matthew Richard Bell, likely to need to come in for another penalty in the number 11 Euro International car, but at the moment he's third. And in GTE, the 57 Kessel Racing car of Scott Huffaker is led by is led from Lorcan Hannafin's JMW Motorsport car, the number 66, and it's Proton Competition's Porsche for Zachary Robuchon, the Canadian driver who got on board after Ryan Hardwick got out of car 16. A great job, by the way, by both Marina Sato and the United Autosports crew got that car back out in the lead, and a healthy lead from a charging Laurent Herr, who still sits set at second for Edex Sport. Cool Racing 47 car is third. This first car that got the um, 2 minutes 40 penalty was a 17 car, wasn't it? The Cool Racing car. And then we had the uh, the, the penalty uh, issued for the number 11. No, it was a 13 car into Europol car that got the, it uh, was the long indeed. penalty. Yeah, 17 was. is in the clear, as far as I can tell, at the moment. So Alejandro Garcia, that's a legitimate position for number 17 to be second. There are big question marks about what happens next with Matthew Bell's Euro International. Well, Jean-Baptiste Le Hay might be about to benefit for ultimate. Well, the... <laughs> The net result of the advantage that was drawn, or rather given away, is that that 11 car was just on pit lane with three and a half minutes, three, three minutes and 50 seconds, and still sits third. That, yeah, shows, like you say, shows the advantage they pulled out there. But uh, part of that lead was legitimate because of Adam Alley's pace in the opening hour, you know, yep. so they, they were well up. They were something like 12th overall before the safety car. So. I almost feel that that lead shouldn't be denied, that they shouldn't be denied of that um, advantage. And yet the playing field needs to be levelled to a certain degree because they took a massive jump ahead of everybody else in their class by taking a wave by that they, they weren't eligible for. Team manager, car 28, that is a second place car to the race director. And just after that, contact between cars 28 and 23, that is... Uh, the number the the Edex Sport car and one of the United Autosports car. That's the that is the uh, the car that has uh, Gallup Patterson in at pit entry under investigation. That was an hour ago though, if that timing is correct. Exactly an hour ago. Yeah, it took place at 16 minutes past seven. We're now at 8:16. I don't remember that contact. I have to Me say, neither. so maybe we didn't see it at the time. All of a sudden. The big guy upstairs has painted everything gold. <laughs> so looking glorious and uh, these paint schemes, the liveries do rather take on a different complexion. It's that golden light and a much more comfortable warmth as well compared to the last few days. 29 degrees we're at air temperature and the track's not far above that. 30.5 it's just dropped to. So almost ideal racing conditions. The tyres will like this lack of temperature when uh, earlier on in the week we had easily 50 degrees, maybe even mid-50s at track level. Scott Hoffaker has pulled away in the lead in GTE. Something like five seconds to the good now over Logan Hannafin in the GMW car. Identical car, pretty similar colour scheme, certainly yellow bits. Yellow with the white highlights for the car guy livery castle racing car yellow and black for jmw and scott huffaker in the 57 is the silver rated driver so 
There is a minimum time that he will need to be at the wheel of the car, which is 45 minutes. But it's also then a maximum for either the gold or the platinum, which I think everybody has got within GTE. Yes, they have. The gold and the platinum can't do more than an hour and 15 behind the wheel of the car. So often the silver has to make up that deficit. Once you've got the bronze time out of the way, which is 90 minutes, 45 minutes at least for the silver-rated driver, which most GTE cars now have. Number eight, Viet Team Virage car being pushed into the garage. They've had a torrid time this afternoon. They're already down in 40th place, the last running car. But uh, that looks like further woes for the number eight. So Nick Adcock, it was bringing the car in. Car 72. Car we've got in front here of the number 60 Iron Lynx Porsche. It's been riding high, but they've got a pit stop that is under investigation at the moment. Keeping our eye then on this battle for eighth and ninth within GTE. Maxime Robin took over from Arnold Robin, his brother in the previous stop. Matteo Crisoni, silver rated driver as Matteo Cairoli watches on. And he will be at the wheel of this number 60 car in the closing stages. It's the 60 that led the championship, remember, coming here to Aragon. And they would love to still be in the championship lead with half the season done. And amazingly, at the end of August, we're still an hour and 41 minutes away from the half-season point. Yeah, they've got a lot of work to do, though. Eight positions between them and the, the lead. Up the inside, it's a bit of a lunge there. Is that going to work? Not there, it's not. Aston Martin gets to the corner, gets to the apex. But big pressure now on the Aston Martin from a charging Matteo Crisoni. So looking for a way by... Maxime Robin getting more experience behind the wheel of a GTE car. He's the silver then, and uh, from a consistency basis, is marginally faster than Arnold Robin. But this is an intriguing fight here because Crisoni been racing GTE Ferraris for a number of years now, jumping across to the Porsche. Can he get the car stopped into the dipper at turns eight and nine? Right over the curves yeah. through the second element there. Don't want to be doing that on too many occasions because you will draw the attention of the stewards. Matteo Cairoli nervously leaning back in his chair as he watches this battle. He'd much sooner be in the car oh, and in yes. full control than having to watch his teammates. Oh, big dive this time, and I think he saw what more or less let him go. It's a very aggressive run here from Matteo Grassoni. It is. But uh, I think he's trying to impose his will. He's managed to do it on the Aston Martin driver. So that didn't look on, I have to say, coming through turn 11, but clearly um, Chris Oney was fully committed and eyes on stalks there, knew that the Aston Martin was a tad wide and just prevented the big vantage from turning in to turn 12. So that will give the 60 car eighth position. But yes, as you say, for the championship leaders, who led by only three points over the number 16 Porsche ahead of today, Got quite a lot of work to do to catch up with the similar car of Proton Competition. Yeah, watching those pictures, by the way, with uh, Matteo Caroli in the Iron Links garage. Do think that they should have somewhere in the International Convention on Human Rights that a form of torture is being a race car driver not in the car at the time that you're part of. It's just... It's just horrendous, isn't it? <laughs> the pressure, the stress. They'd much rather be doing this, wouldn't they? They'd much rather be behind the wheel and uh, dealing with the situation themselves, but that's the beauty of uh, sports car racing when the car is shared by some with two drivers, some with three, but when you've got the one driver in the car, generally the other two have just got to sit and either watch or they disappear into the back of the truck and just imagine the race isn't even happening. I could just tell them the, the, only, the only yardstick I've got is being the parent of a teenager. But uh, you know they're making mistakes. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and you just hope they come back home at the end of the night in one piece. In one piece. Uh, with whatever they've got completely intact. Turning right at the top of the circuit will go the fight for LMP3. And Torsten Kratz is being caught. And speaking oh. of LMP3, there's a drama there for the number 10 Euro International car of Glenn von Berlo. That oh, looks suspiciously why. like he'd already had a spin. And now he rotates again. So it was contact maybe for Glenn von Berlo. It he was, was side by side with a 31 of uh, Antoine Ducat at the been, time. There's been further 
dramas for that car because that's the that's been hit again hasn't it oh it's not it's the tire that's gone and taken out the rear corner that's what's happened he's had the spin he's got it going the tires delaminated and destroyed the rear corner so was that as a result of contact with Antoine Ducat as they work their way through the corner wheels can clash in these cars they're not actually open wheelers but nevertheless you can get uh, very toughly built wheels, but they just grind together, and often that can let a tyre go down. Right to the high side there That's was the Team Virage car. Not sure whether that was the P2 or the P3. It's P2. Beautiful light it's at the moment on the main fabulous, straight. Isn't it? Not the start-finish straight, but the long, long straight that leads into turn 16. I'm so glad we're in a darkened black room while that's going on outside the door. <laughs> Don't rub it in. <laughs> feel like Matteo Cairoli having to watch the Absolutely. race rather than being out in the uh, setting sun. Car 72 is now being given a warning flag for abusing track limits. You saw that as they crossed the line on the very large LED lighting system. And that is repeated at several points around the lap as well. So you've no excuse to say, I didn't see it on the start line. Well, it's illuminated about two other locations around this 5.3 kilometre circuit. So it's, uh, well, from what started as such an encouraging run for Italian squad, your international, it's fallen to pieces. That was a brief glimpse, by the way, of Oscar Tugno, who will be driving the number 12 car fairly shortly. Again, he is having to watch Torsten Kratz at work, his teammate within the WTM by Rinaldi squad. And Alejandro Garcia in the championship leading number 17, looking for a way by as they both head past the very, very slow Glenn von Berlo car. Oh, big moment for the 83 car. That car running second in the hands of Alessio Rivera was in contention for the lead. And the 37 car ran at the same same place. Now, I'm wondering whether this is... No, this, that was a lot earlier on, oh, because right. look at the light. Sorry, so my apologies. It's, it's, oh, it's a, a, various it's a incidents at two. That's what, there you go. It's a sequence. Well done, same guys and girls. It's a montage. Montage, I like that one. There you go. Montage of various spins at turn number one, and unfortunately for Glenn von Berlo, he is the latest to be added to that. And uh, it did look, actually, for Glenn, that it was the t a tyre going down that caused the spin rather than the other way around, and then that's done substantial damage to the rear, including removing entirely now that cheese wedge well, carbon fibre block. It's sort of not. Something is just ripping away, hacking away at the underside. It's it's the delaminated tyre that is just tearing away some yeah. frenzied criminal at the rear of that um, Ligier. But the, it's definitely departed the car, and now, now the problem now is it, gone. it sits on the racetrack. It's just 13. made a lie of you. You said it had gone, and then it said, no, I've not. Here I am. It had gone. Anyway, regardless, <laughs> it's academic. Is that now going to cause some sort of caution? Because it's it sitting could. in the middle of the road at turn 13. Look at that skyline. That is quite the look. Motorland Aragon. After the trials and tribulations of 40 plus degrees, look <laughs> what you've done. Yeah, you've this made is it, the reward for getting made through it, that. You've made it difficult to hate you. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know yet where we're going on the 2024 we calendar don't. for the European Le Mans series, but there is a chance that this will feature again. It's sort of semi-dependent on how this event goes, I suppose, but it's been thoroughly entertaining to this point. You did tell me earlier on in the week that we might even have a calendar by this time next week, or We've, maybe... I, I think it's every, every possibility. Uh, a couple of weeks' time. Ahead of Spa, because normally spa Francorchamps is where we see the new calendar for 2024. And there are whispers that we might get it between now and the next round. No guarantees, of course. Various logistics to work through. And it's also dependent on whether circuits have free dates when the ELMS actually wants to travel there. Glenn von Berlo's not going to get back to the pit lane. And a sorry sight again. We've seen this many times already in this race. This time, young Dutchman stepping out, sharing that car with Jacek uh, Zialonka. No, not the... The... no, he's not. Oh, uh, he's not. That's, that's a change. That's a change. 
Beg your pardon. So it's I'm looking Matthias at. Lerton. I am looking at a provisional entry list, and there were one or two tweaks to that. Well, the Polish driver unable to find a comfortable position in the car. Um, experienced radical racer, but uh, could not find a comfortable. And trouble as well for so another Matthias one. Matthias Luton, who we've mentioned, that's Antoine Ducan. Now that was the other car in the incident with Glenn von Berlo. So has that got a puncture on the other side of the car? We were all talking about the right hand side for the 31, the left hand side for Glenn von Berlo. And this is happening right now. Very, very slow coming out of turn seven. That was very nearly a huge problem for the Duquesne number 30 car as well, driven by Rene Binder. Binder's already had a spin earlier on when he first took the car over on his outlap. Absolutely. Exchanging text messages with the 2003 Le Mans 24 Hours winner at the moment, who's somewhat irritated that I misidentified uh, him with uh, Garnet Patterson. I think he so still loves our me. Our is going to be involved. No, no, it's OK. I've, right. I've, I've offered him something he likes, which is grovelling apology. It could just be an arm wrestle to decide it. it, it he got no chance. You've seen me, I'm ripped. Nose to tail for third and fourth between the Proton Competition number 16 and the 55 Ferrari of David Perel. So it's Zach Robichon under a stern amount of pressure there. Look at Hannafin, by the way, hanging on in there with Scott Hovick. And that uh, gap still around the five, six second mark. I reckon Richard Leitz has just got ahead of Gianmarco Liverato as well in an internecine battle, Proton Competition. They're separated by just 0 .4, 0 0.4 of a second, is it? Yeah, so it, uh, Richard Leitz has got another 11 seconds to, the, to get to the back of this pair. It's 90 minutes, 91 minutes still to go. We go down to the Brains Trust at uh, Proton Competition. Smile, you're on camera, they'll be saying. Yellow flags at turn seven and turn 15. Well, that will be the full course yellow is coming. And that will be for the recovery of the race, racing spirit of the mock car. That is coming in 20 seconds. If you're going to make a move, do it now. 15 seconds to full course yellow. So we will get the countdown as is usual Eight, from Eduardo seven, Freitas. Six. Five, 15 minutes four, away from official three, sunset two, time, but one, the first full, full course, course yellow, yellow we are under full during course this race. Yellow. We are intervening to get the car down out of the straights, yeah. which is on driver's left. We're snatching another car at T10. We're picking some debris at T13 and maybe other places on track. So a perfect time in the race, really, to do all manner of things that have been building up in the in-tray I reckon. So with this golden light to enjoy, but with everyone at full course yellow, the pits are officially closed at this point. We got underway at six o'clock on the dot this evening with Phil Hansen from pole position, level pegging with Nico Pino for Duquesne. Further back, Sally Yolich wasting no time at all in trying to pounce ahead of a couple of the middle order runners there. Sally Yolich from pole position once again in LMP2 Pro-Am. That's his third pole of the season in as many races. Oh, side by side earlier on, of course, as well, which uh, resulted in Michael Fassbender and Nico Pino making contact. And we heard at length from Michael Fassbender with Steph Wentworth. He got the car just about pointing in the right direction. But the real problem was, and the big delay, was it was stuck in fifth gear and therefore he couldn't get down the box and locate reverse. And in a tricky spot for several minutes there, Meanwhile, the scrap at the head of the order between Phil Hansen and Rui Andrade would continue on. Sadly, for the 43 car, it couldn't actually go much further than this because of an incident that involved a GT car that we will see very, very shortly. Diving down the inside, the number 19 team Virage LMP2 car, which gave Tony Wells the squeeze in the number seven car, and also the number four DKR Engineering, Duquesne, having to take slightly avoiding action into that tight hairpin towards the end of the lap. Up the inside would go Arnold Robin on Johnny Lawson, the former GTE leader. And look as Lawson then looks to dive up the inside of the Aston Martin. That's where the contact with Rui Andrade was made. It punctured the radiator on the Ferrari and would put the 43 car eventually out of the race, although the Angolan driver would 
actually limped back to the pits for the team to assess what needed to take place, but it had done so much damage to the toe link and probably the wheel hub on that rear left corner. 43 had to be signed out of the race under the guise of the race officials in pit lane and the sorry sight of Rui Andrade stepping away. There is the paperwork being filled in to take the 43 car out of the race and a real sorry situation for Inter Europol competition. It would get worse actually in LMP3. Their other car uh, called to pit road to serve a lengthy penalty because of something that happened under the safety car. Meanwhile, the 25 car in the hands at this point in the race uh, of Kiffin Simpson. He'd taken it over from the starting driver, James Allen, started from the back of the field. Brake discs glowing hot there as two cars touched on two separate occasions, the 47 Cool Racing and the number 65 Panis Racing cars down at turn number 12. And as the light started to dwindle, and we were presented with the sun setting. We've had some glorious pictures to revel in, in for all uh, four of the subcategories, really. Nose to tail GTE dicing, and it will stand long in my memory, this GT battle, where we had five cars in the early stages, absolutely nose to tail, and it's still pretty close. Scott Huffaker has muscled his way to the front now for Kessel Racing. LMP3 is led by Torsten Kratz in the number 12 car ahead of the number 17 of Alejandro Garcia. And LMP2 led for the time being by Marino Sato. So inside 90 minutes to go, Johnny Palmer and 76 laps under the wheels of the number 22 car. Marino Sato just said at the wheel of that car. 11 seconds to the good from the chasing Edex Sports Orica. Now in the hands of Ron Sur, as it has been for a while. Richard Dejeris in third place in for Cool Racing. In LMP2 Pro Am, led by Racing Team Turkey after torrid race in that class. It is Charlie Eastwood at the wheel of the 34 car ahead of Alessio Rivera in the uh, chasing 83 AF Corsa car. Ben Hanley, after spinning out of the lead, we believe after contact, in the 24 Nielsen Racing car sits third. Nine, We're going to be going eight, back to seven, Green Flag Racing. Six, Call the other classes five, when we do so. Four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Thank you. So back to Green Flag Racing, an hour and just under 26 minutes to go in LMP3 after two hefty penalties for cars that took a, a wave by, passed by under a safety car without uh, legitimately being able to do so. It is the WTM by Rinaldi Racing Duquesne, number 12. Currently got Torsten Kratz in the lead. Second uh, race he's led this weekend. Uh, the rapid German bronze rated driver. That car leads by under a second from Alessandro Garcia in the Cool Racing number 17 car. So it's game on in LMP3. That is the battle you're watching on track now. Third place, it is Jean Baptiste Le Hay. He's a further 40 seconds or so back in the 35 Ultimate car before we get to the Euro International number 11 car, which we think, in fact, just now gets a 20 second stop and go penalty for refueling during the stop, stop and go. Mm. I think they're remarkably lucky to get just that. Yeah, so 20 additional seconds for a refuel whilst the car was stopped for two minutes and 40 seconds. So that's going to cost them about 30 seconds more. Yeah. Uh, GTE, meanwhile, is led uh, after Scott Hoffaker took the lead from Lorcan Hannafin. Uh, by Kessel Racing 57 Ferrari of the long-time leading 66 JMW Motorsport Ferrari. Proton Competition's Zach Robichon in the baby blue, the 16 car, is in third and still under pressure from David Perel in the 55 Spirit of Race uh, car. That uh, group being closed in on by the delayed 93 Proton Competition car of Richard Leitz. So it's all beginning to come together nicely. There's a further penalty coming, this time for the next pit stop for car 72 for a pit stop infringement. So two 20-second penalties, one for the next pit stop for car 72. The other one is a standalone stop and go for number 11, your international car, for refueling during its earlier 2 minute and 40 seconds stop and go. 
Now, there was at least one car that came into the pit lane when the full course yellow was out. And remember, these days, a new rule for 2023 is that the pit lane is closed throughout a full course yellow. If that was emergency service, then there's no issue. The cars will have to have come back in again at the next available opportunity. I do notice that the Sebastian Montoya-driven Dragon Speed car has come back into the pits, and United Autosports have also done the same. Maybe it was the 23 car that I saw taking emergency fuel, and they've now flipped that to Paul de Resta for the closing stages. An hour and 22 still to go. We've still got one further penalty to serve, and that's my penalty to apologise again to Guy Smith for misidentifying him. Is he still messaging you? No, 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 he's not. It's just I think the correct thing is that I need to do at least do at least three times in case he's not listening. Right. But I am really sorry. And did you make the apology within three laps of that text yes. arriving? Good. That's all right, then. So we've ticked that off. Uh, Scott Huffaker slash Gregory Huffaker uh, leading the way. Gregory Huffaker the second, as is the graphic says. Is it the second says. or third? It says the second on the graphic, but yeah. the Gregory bit's not right anyway, so call him Scott and it'll be fine. Uh, I will get the full story on that, folks, at some point later on in the season. Lorcan Hannafin in a similar-looking Ferrari, but run by a very different outfit, JMW Motorsport, with their day-glow yellow car. Very wide there for the 77 Porsche, and, in fact, through the gravel for Gianmarco Liverati. Which, Liverato, the, which the sister car to this car had already done two laps earlier. On the lap earlier, it was uh, Nico Lapierre. Um, staggered down through the wrong uh, line in that corner and went all the way through the gravel trap before a uh, rather unconventional rejoin. This is the 47 car on pit lane from 6th in LMP2, 9th overall because there were three LMP2 prime cars ahead of them, all of which I think will owe us a stop because the previous leading car, Racing Team Turkey's 34, the hands of John Eastwood, is also on pit road right now. Still... The sky is painting beautiful pictures. But uh, some cracking images from down at track level as well as these high-level LED headlights pierce their way through the increasing darkness. An hour and 20 still to go. And uh, by the end of this, it will be very, very dark indeed in certain parts of the circuit. I did notice down at Turn 1 last night when I was sitting in the grandstand, there's quite a large floodlight picking out the apex at Turn 1. And I think that is repeated at various locations further around the track. But in others, then you really are out on your own, apart from those well, highly efficient headlights that should certainly pick out the road in front and indeed the cars around you that you're battling with. You're going to get glare, though, in the mirrors, I would imagine, so that's going to be an extra distraction if you've never raced at night. And also, for cars like the Ferrari, uh, rear visibility is notoriously pretty bad. That's why they have the um, rear-facing camera that sits in the middle of the dash, because it's just the bulkhead immediately behind you where the mid-engine sits. These Porsches are mid-engine these days, though, as well. I think mid-engine Porsche, but it was uh, especially weaved into the regulations so that the GTE cars could run with the engine and the gearbox effectively flipped through 180 degrees. So all sorts of issues in the modern era. As, uh, that is the change, the 55 car getting through and ahead of the 16. That's been a long, long battle, but David Perel finally makes it stick. Mm. Gets by Zach Robichon, and it's up into third place. So we've got a Ferrari 1-2-3. That's taken a bit of time. Hasn't Remember, it? the second row of the grid was all Porsches, but yeah, now Ferrari, 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 Porsche. And it is the two Proton competition cars that uh, started strongly that have net lost a place from their beginning positions on the grid. And Kessel Racing, the one to make ground. Well, David Perel as well. David Perel uh, in the 55 has slowly worked his way up the order. However, now it's going to be a drive-through penalty for David Perel for the abuse of track limits and a warning for the 95, Johnny Adam as well. But far worse is what's going to have to happen to the 55 now. Well, that uh, should put it puts that rubbish on back up into third place. It will also bring Richard Leitz up into fourth. And he is still closing. What was 11 seconds is now is that six and a half. Battling here between Cool Racing and Algar Pro. 
25 and 47. Alex Lynn and Jose Maria Lopez. Two LMP2 cars, two hypercar drivers. Fifth and sixth places. And yes, in uh, slightly less technical machinery, I think it's fair to say, because some of the gadgets on the hypercars these days uh, would blow your mind. But these are Aurora LMP2 cars. And uh, really down to the driver and how hard they hustle them through the tight and twisty stuffs, stuff of the Aragon circuit. So out of that uh, second S-bend that forms the huge bus stop towards the end of the lap, just before they enter the final sector. 12 and 13, or particularly 12, has been the scene on several overtakes. There's the race leader, Marino Sato. 80 laps now completed in total. The Japanese driver, I reckon, has done 36 laps, but he's, he can easily do about another seven or maybe eight laps on this particular stint, whereas the 30 car comes in, and that's the end of a 20-lap stint for Rene Binder. They are back-timing now to the flag because yes. they can do a 40-minute stint, pit stop, another 40-minute stint, and that should take them to the finish, assuming we don't have any more safety car or full-course yellow interventions. So an hour and 17 minutes to get back. Let's just wrap this up. There's going to be no further dramas here, rather. An hour and 17 minutes of endurance racing. I also noticed stickered Goodyear tyres going yep. on the number 30 car. So the final driver that we haven't yet seen is Neil Jarney, who qualified it earlier today. So the platinum being plugged in for this closing double stint for the Swiss. Uh, by the way, if you are joining us for the first time, I'm properly kidding. Anything, and I literally mean anything, can and probably will happen in our now 16 minutes. Great shot from the rear of the 93 Proton Competition car. As uh, through goes the LMP2 car. Sky, all shades of gold now. And that's going to be followed by black. The 19 car of Team Virage will be desperate for a stop pretty soon. There, oh, there we go, into the pits now. So that's a slightly false position for Ian Rodriguez to be in in the 19 car that was started by Alexander Matchell. But Tatiana Calderon will take charge of that, the Colombian racer in the closing stages. We've got uh, another camera available to us. We can tell you that Oli Jarvis is getting ready to get aboard the number 22 car. So it's going to be Jarvis versus Shatam in the latter stages of this race. That's something to look forward to. So this pit stop for the number 19 Team Virage will take that car away from the overall podium spot. It's Jock von Outert who slots into third position, although the car ahead of him now, Laurence Hoare, at the end of a 22-lap stint, will take his penultimate pit stop. This is a prime time to be pitting in an LMP2 car with a couple of stints still to go. Oliver Jarvis, as you say, with the gloves going on now, helmet already in place, and a very good set of Goodyear tyres, probably brand new. That is the case for United Order Sports. The stickers still visible on those as well. So driver change underway as well for the Edex Sport car that's been a part of the overall lead battle for much of this race. Great stint from Lawrence Hur. Couldn't eventually catch Bruno Sato, who's done a stellar job, by the way. Lost a couple of places after he got into the car, got his head down, and since then has moved back up to the lead and has held a talent like Lance Hur. Yeah. So that it, that bodes very well for United Autosports and for Bruno Sato. Three, four cars in this little group. And that is Marina Sato in the 22. The 34 was up alongside Louis Delatraz as well. Looked like picking off Sato for that position. Now, that's not four position. Delatraz is on a different lap, I think I'm right in saying. He is so the 34 all, he's, he's just unlapped himself. Just unlapped himself on the race leader. Yes. Yeah, so probably why Sato didn't push that too much. And that's, that's not quite as dramatic as it sounds because, of course, Sato does owe us a pit stop. Yeah. Uh, and that's likely to happen in six laps or so time. It's going to be interesting to see how United Autosports play this, because they can go deeper into this stint on fuel, but they'll probably want to get Sato out as soon as possible, although he's been doing some cracking times, as you've just made reference to. But Jarvis is wait waiting in the wings, and he won't need to do 
Well, he'll do a full 40-minute stint, and that will leave probably more like a 30-minute run then to the chequered flag, the other side of that. So, you know, all sports stand ready for what we presume is the 22 car, having seen Oli Jarvis suited, booted and gloved. Alex Lim, by the way, has just put in the fastest first sector of this race. He's chasing hard. Algar Pro have not given this one up, and why should they? At the same time, Philippe Albuquerque won't be too far away from pitting in the number 21 Pro-Am car. And then the other of their machines is the 23. And 23, well, it's sort of been in and out and in and out because Garnet Patterson needed to serve those penalties, but Paul de Resta took charge of it five laps ago, so they're absolutely fine on fuel now. The other car to keep an eye on is the car in third place, and that's the Oppenitet. He fancies a crack here at Paul of Chatan, and has closed that gap to tenths. Fastest lap of that car's race last time around into the 149s, as indeed is Alex Lynn last time around, and I think Alex Lynn is going to go quicker still this time. 148.951 is the current fastest lap time in this race. I think Alex Lynn is going to be close to that. Alejandro Garcia, the 20-year-old Mexican, is uh, in the lead of LMP3 for Cool Racing and has a cushion of five seconds back to Torsten Kratz in the number 12 car. As Again, GT machines at close quarters, Gianmarco Lavorato and David Perel nose to tail, so it's a Proton competition Porsche. Lavorato not too long ago, of course, went through the gravel at the corkscrew, and that would have uh, dirtied his tyres quite a bit and inhaled a load of stones into the grill of that Porsche. As Oliver Jarvis gets the word now to jump on board, there's Perel on the inside of Lavorato into the hairpin at 16, and David Perel has been getting inching closer and closer, although we're now getting a message on the screen about the 55 Ferrari needing to repair the rear light in the next pit stop. There will be another pit stop for that car, but how easily can they sort that out? It's not as if you can take the whole rear deck no. off a Ferrari like you can on an LMP2 car. Just keep an eye as well with that LMP3 battle as to who needs what stop. And I have a feeling that Cool Racing may be at a disadvantage here. I think they need a long stop. OK. I'm, I'm pretty certain that the 12 car doesn't. And that could be an advantage of 20, 30 seconds. I might be able to uh, find the details on that it car. It comes to 22 car. This is a vital stop. Away they go. Oli Jarvis aboard the car. A minute and 33 seconds they had to spare. Team manager car 10, by the way, coming to uh, being called to race control. That is a car that is out of the race now. Here comes the 22 to the end of pit lane. Oli Joe is about to rejoin the race. Walter Jakobsen, by the way, has just done the fastest lap of the race from 17th. He just clubbed aboard the 37 car. And Panis Racing it is that go through, because Job Van Uta has caught and passed. Paul of Chatan and has leapfrogged as well Oli Jarvis. So Van Utert on that lap from third to first. Tremendous effort. He, he did export through into second. Right, so on the 17 point, the first stop was a minute and two seconds short. for Adrian Schiller. That was the short one. And they have done a long one since then. So they do need to do another long stop. They've got to do a second long stop. So the 12 stop. car. Is the other one at uh, car 12? Is the one you? I have think they've done about. two long stops. Okay. There are purple and blue sectors everywhere in LMP2. As the, we're into a bit of a golden hour here. Uh, it was a. Uh, what did we say it was? 65 seconds. 105 seconds. Five seconds. So a minute and 40. Five. Five. Yeah, that's well, a two-minute two minute stop initially. They did, yes. So that's uh, when Leo Weiss handed the car over to Torsten Kratz. And his last stop was a 143, yeah. so they've done both of their long stops. Yeah. So they've got a sizable advantage, and they're only five seconds behind. So it is going to be advantage 
to the second place car when we get into that final pit stop. Again, to explain what we're talking about here for anybody new to this format, we'll keep talking about what's going on in Vision as, as well. When. Try to. So LMP3 has a rule set that says two of the three mandatory stops for fuel, driver changes, tyre changes, etc., must be at a minimum. And in this case, it, it varies from track to track, but it's at 105 seconds, a minute and 45 seconds. Nick Manazian talking at the moment to his driver, Bolluk Chata. You can phrase it like that, or you can say there are two mandatory stops in the race. Yes. And they have to be 105 seconds. The fact is, you can't actually do a four-hour race on only two stops. So the other one you do can be as quick as you like. Absolutely. And it could be the first, the second, or the third stop. Doesn't really matter. But as long as you do the two mandatory 105-second stops, no problem. Yep. Ollie Jarvis, by the way, is falling fourth behind Alex Lint. That push from Alex Lint has borne fruit. Top four cars, 8.8 .8 seconds, and we've got more than an hour to go. This is mouth-watering stuff, Johnny. On board with a 25 car, then, that is running in third position with the huge talent that is Alex Lynn. 3.7 seconds adrift of the race leader, Jot von Outert. And not sure how much running Alex Lynn has done around this place, but he will have learned it so, so quickly. I think there will have been a bit of simulator action before he even arrived on site. And then these guys get to grips with the track so swiftly, and already then they start to work through their minds about how to extract that extra little bit of pace. He's even got time to change the radio station yep. on the dashboard there. Could be classic gold, I'm sure. Without a doubt. Looks that type. So into the hairpin at turn 16 goes Alex Lynn, and that gap is condensing, 3.6 seconds. Proton on Proton action about to take place. Richard Leitz, we said, was catching this group. He's caught Zach Robichon. And the 93 car that was in the wall after contact on Michael Fassbender earlier on. There's been a fight back, which has included getting back to it from... Uh, Fassbender, and uh, into the final hour, it's going to be Richard Leitz putting the car back into podium contention here. That's been one heck of a fight back. Yeah, these two very evenly matched Porsches prepared from the same outfit, Proton competition, although the strong tie with Wright Motorsports of Ryan Hardwick running in the similar colours. Still, Zach Robichon pushes on. We haven't yet, therefore, had any of Alessio Picariello in the number 16 car, but they will be uh, pitting. Pits. 93 pits. 93 pits. 16, Zach Robichon stays out. And uh, a strong whisk, risk of being dazzled by those lights as well as uh, they head into pit lane, flashing amber and green. Something else to become used to if you're bolted in for a night stint and remember there was a full free practice session held mainly in darkness yesterday evening so 65 minutes to go lead battle 0.971 of a second between Job van Uta and Paul Loop Chatan for Palace Racing and Edex Sport respectively 1.8 seconds further back is Alex Lynn in the Algar Pro Racing car that won last time out the 25 car it's going to be a three-minute stop and go for car seven for pitting under the first three laps of the safety car. That is the Nielsen Racing car of Ryan Harper Ellen. So there's been a fair amount of lack of pit lane discipline, I'm afraid, and, and procedural discipline. And the hammer is being very firmly wielded by race control. Correctly so. Yeah. Real book's pretty clear. It's complicated, but it's clear. And that's the job, I'm afraid, guys and girls. And a lot of these penalties also are incremental, certainly from a track limits point of view. You know, you're given a warning, then you might be given another warning, then you report it to the stewards and you're told the next step normally is a drive-through penalty. But there's the, also the option for minor infringements to add five seconds to the next pit stop, ten seconds to the next pit stop. But it is all very clearly laid out in the sporting regulations for the championship. And the problem is, for repeat offenders, things just get steadily worse and more draconian. But uh, quite rightly so, because the message needs to resonate. Um, to a bit of an update. You sort of posed a question without posing one, but I can answer it anyway, which is Alex Lynn. Uh, Alex Lynn didn't test when APR came here 
with their recent test pre-event, but he did win a seat with G-Drive at a Dunlop test here in 2017, the first year of these cars. There you go. So, Well, thank you to whoever answered that. That's what Stephen Kilby. Oh, well, I think we, I might have heard of him. Yes. Does some quite good stuff on dailysportscar.com. Oh, they sound good. They're great. You They're get, great. You get, you get sports car news daily. Every day. Every day. That's why they call the it sports that. Car. Yeah. That's great. It says what it does on the tin. Jot van Aerte and Paul Luc Chatin are not separated by much real estate at all. In fact, you don't really need a timing screen because there they are working their way out of turn 16, squirming their way through 17 and 18 as well. The bugs, the moths in the air uh, will be a slight distraction in the headlights as well. It's a very similar situation to racing at Le Mans, I suppose. But uh, without that, well, we have got quite a long straight, but it's nowhere near as long as the Mulsan here at Aragon but uh, that wonderful sound as well, echoing around this track with a considerable amount of gradient change, 50 metres from high to low point around here, and it has proved a real challenge for some, hopefully an enjoyable challenge for those that are up at the sharp end of each of their individual classes. And Paul Uchata, well, actually, Jot van Aert starting to respond because he's just done his best, the car's best, first sector, a 27.3, which is six tenths of a second quicker than the chasing car. Yeah, Paul of Chatham making that 28 car dance at the moment. The gap 1.4 seconds, Alex Lennon further 1.7 seconds, five and a half seconds back then to Oli Jarvis and with Jose Maria Lopez right in the wheel tracks of the 22 car. This isn't done for any of the podium positions. We're not even into the final hour yet. So got two minutes to go before that happens. Bit of Le Mans flavour with a brake disc glowing. Do that's love what, it. That's what I love as, about nighttime racing as well. That happens in the day too, I'm assured, but it's uh, more difficult to pick out. Yes, uh, with the lessening light, and we are now significantly past sunset. In fact, a minute to nine o'clock, we're still going to be racing for another hour yet, but the teams are firmly focusing on when the chequered flag will fall and are they in a good position from a strategy perspective. LMP2s have been thinking about this for 20 minutes or so when many of the cars came in for their penultimate stops, but around about the hour mark, We'll be seeing the GTE cars come in. In fact, the top three on the road now all decide to pit. So Scott Huffaker for Kessel Racing, Lorcan Hannafin for JMW Motorsport, David Perel for Spirit of Race. They've all pitted on the same lap. And now this is a straight fight. Alessio Picariello has been put into the Proton competition car that Zach Robichon has just exited. And already the 16 car is on an outlap. But there's your top three in GTE, we mentioned they're all Ferraris and all pitting on the same lap. That's the gap in terms of time when those cars are released, plus the distance between them, it's seconds. 20 seconds to go to the final 60 minutes of this four hours here at Motorland Aragon. And uh, there is an awful lot still to be decided here. And that's before we get the trademark bizarreness that comes with the European Le Mans yeah. series. <laughs> Just always does. Yep. Something's going to happen, because it always does. I wondered whether Spirit of Race uh, had the wrong tyre or a, a damaged tyre, because it looked like uh, one of the guys had to run back into the garage there and bring another Goodyear Eagle oh, to the really? car. So I, I thought the 55 may have lost some time there. It was a 1 minute and 30 Ten seconds. stop lap, yeah. and Kessel Racing... Now, they've lost a few seconds, but it's nothing huge. Yeah, 1 minute 30, the fuel could not be still going in, of course, at that point, because it's fuel and tyres separately again these days. There was a period within the ACO rules history where we went back and you could refuel whilst changing tyres, but it rather removes a significant loophole in your options during a pit stop doing it that way. Further good times coming uh, the last time around, on ju just a complete lap, but John Fanuta, fastest lap for his car's race, a previous lap, 148.8. Paul Chatan, Alex Lynn, Oli Jarvis, Jose Maria Lopez, Louis Delatraz. Should I keep carrying on? Mathieu Vazafier, Matthias Besch, Neil Jarni. At some point, I'm going to find a name I don't recognise. I think you'll get all the way to the bottom. Absolutely amazing. If it's it, it, run it, out of names. You know what? 
But we keep coming back to this European Le Mans Series season and you keep looking at that list of names and you keep thinking it's, it's like the LMP2 version of your dream dinner party. It really is an absolute galaxy. And the best part about it is you've got established stars and you've got emerging talent as well, yeah. measuring themselves against them. I, I will still say that I think Jan Van Uta is one of the latter. I think that's a young man that does deserve an opportunity to show what he can do in a top-class car. Paul Upshatan, I'm lost in admiration for the, the length of time he's kept the pace and he's kept it. Alex Lynn on a turn with, of course, current hypercar and GTP form. Oliver Jarvis. Still, I think, the reigning champion in IMSA. OK. He won last year. Yeah. Jose Mario Lopez, Le Mans winner, world champion. Louis Delatraz just given his first full season ride next year in the Wayne Teller Racing GTP car in the IMSA championship. Mathieu Vazivier, firmly part of Alpine, and their new hypercar hit the track for the first time this week. And, of course contested with their fill-in programme with the old car in the hypercar regulations. Matthias Besch, another man who's never far from the lists of people that need to be considered. And, of course, with LMP1 uh, on his CV with Rebellion Racing. Neil Jarni, a world champion. And we get to young Jonas Reed. The first, if you like, yet to show what they've got in this kind of company. He's not really had a chance, Not yet. in fairness. But then there's got... nothing to stop him uh, in the future making uh, a real name for himself and uh, getting the trophy cabinet nice and full indeed. Jonas is 18 years old, yeah. so he hasn't had, uh, you know, the 30-odd years that Oli jo well, Oliver Jarvis has uh, not been racing for quite that long, but he does have a, an extra decade of experience on him. Well, he's ahead at the moment of Felipe Albuquerque, a current uh, Acura factory driver. Paul De Resta, current Peugeot factory driver. It goes on and on to really you know, Montoya. You name it, it just it keeps coming. It's an astonishing field. And the atmosphere is really building up now with uh, the full darkness to be enjoyed for the next hour. Let's get to Steph Wentworth, though, before we head into that final hour. I'm with David Perel, driver of the number 55 Spirit of Race. Now, that was quite an interesting stint for you. There was a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah, we had a really tough stint um, fighting with a Porsche, I forget which number, I think 16. Um, getting really close in sector one, struggling in sector three to get close enough to do the overtake. And then when I was behind him um, in sector one, there was a P3 stuck in the middle of the track, which decided to, to move. Luckily, when I was going through two, I, could, I caught a glimpse that something was stationary, just managed to miss him. Um, however, I made a huge, huge mistake in this in this stint. I haven't done it in a long time, and I'm massively sorry to the team because I got track limits in the slipstream of the Porsche. It was my fault, and uh, caused the drive-through penalty, and that cost us a chance to fight for the win. Obviously, things can change. It can still be a safety car, but we should be further up, and it's on me. It's my fault. The race isn't over yet, though. There's still a lot to do. You've got your teammate in the car now. Last hour of the race. Can we expect a podium, maybe? What are your hopes like? we have a huge pace advantage over the guys in front of us like quite a quite a big one and Matt has been on it this weekend so he's gonna hunt him down obviously we're gonna need some luck to counter my mistake so let's see all right fingers crossed thank you thank you very honest outpouring there it? from David Perel and he's taking that on the chin uh, you know a fair play to him because he as he said he very rarely makes those kind of mistakes so the team will take it as a team I'm sure and uh, pull ranks or, uh, or pull together I should say and Matt Griffin as he said has been really on it during the free practice sessions so far this weekend so let's see how he gets on in the closing stages uh, reminded by the way by Jeff Carter who's spending his entire time correcting my mistakes uh, this weekend and thanks it's Jeff. it's a full-time job it is absolutely that's Trudy um, but uh, reminds me, of course, Jonas Reed does, of course, have the form of winning the Daytona 24 hours this year, uh, which he did. Excellent point. Uh, so not a bad point, Jeff. Well done, mate. Um, but uh, lots more form to come. And uh, already revealed, by the way, on... Uh, we were talking about the website a little earlier. We won't mention it again. At least once. Um, Proto Competition looking to double up to two cars next year in the European Le Mans series and the Asian Le Mans series in the LMP2. Exciting lots, times. A lot more, lots more really good news to come in LMP2 and we'll hopefully be bringing a lot of that to you 
in news form in the coming days and we'll be talking about all of those stories I'm sure Johnny when we get to Spa for the next round before we get to what I'm really excited about is this double header at Portimao yeah. it's not the way the season was planned but the fact that it'll work out that way and in a season that's so close it could be a pretty amazing weekend busy track out there for Job Vanuta he's off the track and trying to get by the LMP3s but he is just managing to fend off the close attentions of Paul Chatan. It is now, what is that, 1.6 seconds, first to third overall. How close do you want it? I think that's about as close as you're going to see it. Anywhere in the dark, in traffic, proper racing, proper racing drivers, great racing cars. And loving it. To tell you that about conditions being more or less perfect, Marcus Sieber has just set the best LMP3 lap of the race so far. He's just done a 155.233, and that's every credit as well to the young Argentinian driver that is at the wheel of the cool racing car. So Sieber took over from Adrian Schiller, oh, sorry, from Alejandro Garcia, the Mexican driver. So you've got uh, a Central American handing over to a South American, and it was Adrian Schiller who did the opening stint for Cool Racing. It's looking good at the moment for those guys that are positioned very neatly at the top of the championship. They came here with a narrow margin of just a point. However, we are expecting the 17 car... Oh, no, it did do its 1 minute and 46, so that was going to be a long stop, wasn't it? It uh, was indeed. And we've now got a gap of 7.5 seconds back to Ryan Harper Ellum in the chasing number seven car. Is that, that should be a legitimate place as well, because all the LMP3s will well, have made their final stops by now. Well, that, that's come courtesy of the fact that it was a slow car, from, a slow stop from WTM by Rinaldi. It was a slow stop from them. They stopped. They could have stopped a lot quicker than a minute and 36 seconds, but they didn't. Yeah. So that's neither fish nor foul, is it? It's not a 145, which we had worked out. They didn't owe us, but therefore the stop, the quicker stop, needs stop. to be about a minute rather they, than a minute and 36. Well, the, the reality is they could have taken a minute out of cool racing, and they didn't. Yeah. Uh, 40 seconds, rather, out of uh, cool racing, but they didn't. They took 10. We have had difficulties with cars restarting this weekend. Again, maybe because of heat soak yep. over several days. Was that an issue for the number 12 car? In Could the, be. Because you have to turn the engine off for the fuel to be pumped into the car. And maybe it just wouldn't refire for Oscar Tuño, the new driver into car 12. He's now wasting no time at all in climbing all over the back of... Ryan Harper Ellum. In fact, he's got ahead of Ryan Harper Ellum in the darkness. So the WTM by Rinaldi Racing car is now ahead of Nielsen Racing. Harper Ellum down a spot. Oscar Tuño dealing with a gap of 5.9 seconds now to Marcus Siebert. Siebert's just set, as I say, the best lap of the race in the LMP3 world. So Siebert realising he's going to have to get a hustle on here and uh, turn up the wick in the closing moments of this race. The shuffle is going on in LMP2. Jan Vanuta is pulling out a bit more of a lead. It was tenths, it's down 1.7. Same with Alex Lynn, just dropped a couple of tenths back from Paul up Chatan. And all of a sudden, as they've got trouble for the number 13 car. Well, that 13 car was way down, wasn't it? Yes, he was. Yeah, because of the two minute 40 Correct. that he had to do Wyatt for Brickacek. the illegal wave by. And it's Wyatt Brickacek who took pole position yesterday. That car not hitting anything. Just it's pulling just to a hole. Just a yeah, mechanical drama. Uh, turn 12, so the bottom of the hill after the long left hander at 11. To complete the point, beginning now to close on the cars ahead is Ollie Jarvis. So he had extended that gap out to, what's it, six, seven seconds almost, back from uh, Alexander Lynn. That uh, was under five seconds last time I looked. It's just popped back up. and might be a little bit of traffic involved in that. But 7.8 seconds separates the top four. 11.1 the top five. And when you include Louis Delatraz, who's leading LMP2 Pro-Am for guess who? Racing Team Turkey. It's just under 12 seconds for the top six. 
some more overlapping, albeit briefly, as the number 19 Team Virage car slots by the Ferrari that is now being driven by John Lancaster in the 66 car. Lancaster and Martin Rump right together for third and fourth places. That's 0.6 of a second, the gap, peering back at the bright headlights of the Austin, uh, Estonian's car. Uh, actually, though, that, that flashing the lights was the 81 Dragon Speed diving down the inside of turn number one. Dragon Speed being driven by Sebastian Montoya. Michael Fassbender enjoying the final hour of this race. He gets to watch now as uh, Richie Leeds realises there's a camera involved. He's been used to that with the dramas that have been shown on YouTube this year. So Wyatt Brickacek from hero to zero, really. He was the star man in qualifying yesterday. First ever ELMS pole position for inter Europol competition. Flick of flame, I thought I saw at the rear of the 13. OK. Well, that's never good either. If uh, there is a, an engine drama for Wyatt, who is just 22 years old and his first season of ACO racing this year. He took part in the Asian Le Mans series He's also doing a little bit of IMSA racing here and there too, but um, has competed in every European Le Mans series race to date. And I assume therefore is signed up for the remainder of the season as well. Up until this point, uh, championship position, I think it was too bad actually on the number 13. I'll check that in a moment. But um, yeah, they are not going to score well in this third race of the season. They are third in the championship coming to this round. Full course yellow for recovery, I'm sure, of the number 13 car. Right, so whilst we go into another caution period of this race, we had one safety car earlier on, a full course yellow earlier on. This is the second of those. We can head to Steph Wentworth, who's got news from the pit lane for us. I'm joined with Alex Garcia, driver of the number 17 Cool Racing. You just jumped out of the car, Marco Sivo's in there now, but you've all had a brilliant since really so far. Yeah, it, like, you know, the start of the racing was quite hard, you know, it, it didn't went the way we wanted. We were like P8, one lap down. And, you know, when I jumped in, I was P8, you know, I just did the best I can. Uh, to be honest, we had very good luck with the traffic. I didn't have any any traffic in the, my first half of the stint, so I just pushed like hell, you know, trying to recover as much as I can. And when they told me I was P2, I was just shocked, you know. Great job, you know, from the team. And, you know, now I just, um, I'm just to see how Marcos finishes, you know, because we are there to win. And, yeah, I'm just, like, happy, you know. I delivered the car in first. And let's see Marcos. He just needs to put the cherry on the cake. And you guys are first in the championship for LMP3 right now as well. So that's definitely going to be in the back of your mind when you're fighting up at the front. Yeah, yeah. Very happy also because we're fighting, as you say, the championship. And this this was the best possible. Uh, possible outcome we could have, you know. Also, like, with our main co uh, championship competitor not scoring a lot of points, we are very happy. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Alejandro Garcia from the Cool Racing number 17 crew. Marcus Siebert now, as Steph mentioned, in command of that car. He mentioned the nearest rivals in the championship. That's the Antoine Ducan car, which is the 31 uh, so Antoine Ducan, Jean Ludovic Foubert, who hasn't done quite the, all the races, but Jacques Wolf is level with Antoine on 40 points. We're going to go out of the full course yellow in about 15 seconds time. But what began as this at this round as a one point Eight, advantage for Chile Garcia and Sieber is going to be so five, much more now four, if they can retain three, this two, uh, first place one. position. Full course yellow removed. Thank you. So we're back underway. Let's hope we can stay green to the finish now. That was our third caution in total. Automatically closed the pit lane, of course, as well as a full course yellow. The first of which, first of our cautions was a safety car. And uh, for all of the three safety car laps we had, the pit lane was technically closed, although we had one or two darting in for emergency service. Then we had a full course yellow at the sort of mid-race point. And since then, just now, another full course yellow. But otherwise, long periods of green. And uh, that's the reason why this race has uh, found quite a rhythm from about the hour mark uh, 
yeah, about one hour into the race. So there was well over an hour's running of green after that first safety car. And uh, the green flag period that had just come to an end was nearly 36 minutes. Nose to tail for the lead of this race. And this has worked for Paul Lipschatan. Goes to the outside, Jan van Utrecht taking the inside line, coming down to the, the hairpin here. And can he make it work? It's a long way around. Van Utrecht gets the corner. They keep out of the sight of each other somehow and comes out to the fore, cracking stuff by this pair. Where is Alex Led? Right there is the answer. Yeah, and is. so is Oli Jarvis. That gap, which I think I called as being, what was that, eight, nine seconds, is 1.5, not for the lead, for the top four, Johnny. Yeah, top four absolutely together. Edex Sport are applauding again, but they... But it's gone to, not... gone to the front, it's gone to the front. Has he? Yeah, did it through turn one. OK, yes, yeah, so Paul Luc Chatin and Jot van Outer first and second. Now, that, that was a slightly delayed reaction uh, for that latest move. And uh, even though we've had uh, a retake and then a repass again, it comes still Alex not Lynn. done. Lynn on the inside line into turn seven will get He's the 25 car ahead and into second position on Jop van Outert. So van Outert will be ruining that full course yellow. He was driving away a little from this group and they've caught and passed him. And now it's Oli Jarvis with Jop van Outert. It's going to be Alex Lynn to see what he can do about Paul Lipschatan. So Edex Sport lead in the hands of Paul Luc Chatin. Got Van Outert down to second position. We're waiting for those cars to work their way through the next split to confirm those places. But Alexander Lynn, who ran a touch wide then coming out of turn 10 of the corkscrew, uh, still being shown in third position. Now it's changed on the timing screen as they head into the third sector. So Lynn second, Van Outert in third. Oli Jarvis will be the next man, I think, to make a move, or at least attempt to, in the number 22 car. We've got... It's it's in full darkness. Headlights ablaze, obviously, but then the, the leading four cars, I think, are all blue, or have a bit of blue on them. It's so tricky to tell them all apart here. I mean, I find that difficult in the daylight conditions. So, four cars absolutely together, and they will occupy the main straight once again, as now darting to the pit lane. Was that Jarvis? Yes, it was, with 41 minutes left on the clock. Please. So, that is bang on the money. It most certainly is. And they will get their pit stop done at the earliest opportunity. That brings to a close for Ollie Jarvis a 15-lap stint, so relatively short. They're coming in as early as they possibly can. They're making sure they get the pit stop done in yep. case there is a late caution. So, ducks out of that uh, battle for the moment. That puts Jose Maria Lopez up into fourth position, but team manager car 47 has been called to race control urgently yeah i'm concerned about that message for pachito lopez and uh, those associated with cool racing there's the 28 car here's ollie jarvis making his final pit stop and that will have been just for fuel they did not do tires on that because they gave jarvis sticker tires at the start of his stint so already he's back out again that was a 57 second uh, stint so they're putting maximum fuel in the car oh well actually no it won't have burned through no. the full tank will it so just so topping it up really to relatively make sure short stop as minutes. well for them so 40 minutes we're inside 40 minutes to go before the end of this race Jarvis back in to the competition. He has fallen all the way down to ninth place, but that is because he's one of the earliest, if not the earliest, stopper for this final stint. There's the Jot van Outer driven Panis racing car turning left at the turn 16 hairpin. Chatan has dropped back, hasn't he? Alex leads the race now from Jot van Utter. It's Paul Luc Chatan. It's good drop from first to third. How did that happen? Ah, because he's pitting the car. Now, that's not Chatin coming in, it's Jot van Outert who's made the stop in the 65. So, Paul Luc Chatin, who was leading, and we obviously it's saw the Edex Sport car and the crew applauding like crazy, and quite rightly so. He must have had a minor off. Yeah. Because he went from first to third. Chatin now back to second, but 2.2 seconds back from Alex Lynn. 
who's flying along. It was a 151.8 last time around, which is about a second and a half slower than Alexander Lin. So Algarve Pro Racing now leading the way. They were victorious last time around. And let us not uh, forget, car 25 has come from the back of the grid yeah, could as be, well. Could be last to first here. It could. But what's this? Way out wide. That's the racing team Turkey under pressure from the 83 car. So they were overtaken on the road for the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am, have yeah. then pitted for their final stop and will go again. But at the moment, Mathieu Vazivier, third overall, owes us his final stop, but will pit from the lead after taking the lead on track. Yes. So, as you say, the, the, the move was made by the AF Corsa car, Mathieu Vazivier in number 83, and then Louis Delatraz, who'd just been overtaken, dived to the pits. Might that be an element of, well, he's got a pit at the... Oh, is there a problem here with the, with the 34 car? Fire extinguisher being summoned. Can't see the right-hand side. Is that a brake fire? Because it was certainly aimed at that part up. of the car. No light in the belly, no lights. Trouble. Extinguisher again being called, but not oh, needed on this is occasion. Disaster for the car that has dominated this class. Meantime, by the way, with the cars that have pitted back out on track, Oli Jarvis has leapfrog Jan van Uta. He's ahead of the Panis racing car. And he's ahead, by the way, by 13 seconds. The dollies are going underneath the 34 car. What are they going to do next with this? In comes the 25 car from the lead. Race lead. The drama here. It's Paul Upshatan still owes his final stop. 34's out of it. Louis Delatraz is going to be distraught about this. Yeah. These are, the, these are the moments that define a season. However good you've been, luck can play a part. You remember I said 20 minutes ago that anything, any drama can happen. Who would have believed that? I did, as soon as you said those words. But the 34 then wheeled into the garage. Louis Delatraz staying on board. They have taken two Pro-Am victories so far this year. But the third of those is slipping through their fingers now as Mathieu Vaxivier in the AF Corsa number 83 pits from the race lead of Pro-Am. And away goes Alexander Lin in the number 25. Right, who's going to get to the first timing? Uh, so Alexander Lin, how quick was that from Algar Pro Racing? A minute and nine. But it was a lightning pit stop from the United Autosports in 57 seconds. Yeah. 12 seconds picked up on Alex Lin. And he will lead through the first timing sector by what? I think it's it's 9.5 seconds with Paul Lepchatan still to pit. Uh, it's, at the moment, if Alex, uh, sorry, if Oli Jarvis can keep up this pace, that pit stop for United Autosports has won them the race. Well, it's, uh, it was over 10 seconds faster than the number 25 crew, but did 25 do tyres on that car? Here comes the 28 car. That's the key. I don't think they did. I don't think there's enough time for that. Here comes the 28 car from the lead. So Paul-Luc Chatin, after 102 laps in total, that brings to a close 19 laps on the stint. There's 35 minutes left on the clock. The other thought about Oli Jarvis coming in with 41 minutes to go, was that, was that in danger of being too early? I can't imagine United Autosports, with all their experience, would want to gamble in that way. But the key thing here is, Oli Jarvis, I think, can make it, but he'd like to be able to do it with not a lot of pressure from behind yeah. from immediately. That's where he can actually employ his race smarts, the lift and co strategies that have done time and time again in factory competition and will play such a, a huge part in a race like this if he's got the margin to do it. Yeah. Paul Chatan is rolling. Oli Jarvis is already through, though. I actually think a 22-lap stint, which an LMP2 car can do comfortably, takes 42 minutes. Yep. And Jarvis came I in with fine. 41 minutes left on the clock. I didn't see how long was left as he rejoined. Well, it was a 57-second stop, so there must be 40 minutes left in the, in the race. Easily enough, even if it goes to, to 42 minutes and the extra lap, so they've even uh, weaved that in to make sure there isn't a hiccup right at the death. If they've taken it like that, then it is a full team effort. That's the team. 
You know what, Oli Jarvis will get back if he wins the race and sees those faces, and he'll think they're the most beautiful people in the world. <laughs> I'm not going to say any different because they're big guys. True, but it'll be it'll be dark, so you know that's possibly why, why they look so gorgeous. Uh, team they... Racing Team Turkey, by the way, still in the garage, and I think that, that well, as a competitive run, it's done. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I feel that uh, Racing Team Turkey had an awful amount of good luck at Le Castellet to even get that race finish and are the racing gods now swinging the pendulum in completely the other direction for well, 34. But it's going to throw LMP2 Pro Am wide open, isn't it? You can still win a title even if you have a DNF. We've seen oh, it yeah. many times before in a six race, even when ELMS used to be five races in a season, one negative result, as long as you were strong there or thereabouts, finishing on the podium in the other four, then you could still win a title. But the problem is, if some, if another team doesn't have that troubled run, then uh, they will win the championship. So there's still so much to be decided. Spa next month, the double header at Portimao in October will give you a total of 78 points on the table remaining, and that's after the 25 have been awarded in this. At the moment, they look to be going the way of United Autosports after Phil Hansen's great performance in qualifying this morning to outpace Neil Jarney by, what was it, 28 thousandths of a second. And the 22 car is there now in the leading position. So Jarvis, six and a half seconds the good, 32 minutes left. The 22 car for United Autosports ahead of the 28 of Edex Sport, Paul at Chatan. He's got a further five seconds to the good the chasing Alex Lynn in the 25 Algarve Pro Racing Car. Job van Utet is two seconds back in the 65 Palace Racing Car. Jose Maria Lopez a further three seconds back in the Cool Racing number 47. Then it's the leading car in the LMP2 Pro Am class, CF Corsa car. We saw that car go by. Louis Delatraz's 34 Racing Team Turkey car on track before the red car came into pit, would not fire, is in the garage. And now, uh, also, a message from Race Control, they must repair the light left-hand side door panel, the lit number panel, at the next pit stop. What well, I would presume that means it's got to be now. You, consider, you could consider the current pit stop as being the next pit stop. So, yes, uh, why not get that sorted at the same time? But they've lost so much time now. They are the final car in the LMP2 Pro-Am order. Correct. Uh, in LMP2 Pro-Am, by the way, second uh, at the moment is Nielsen Racing. Matthias Besch at the wheel of the 24 car. 17, 18 seconds back, though, from Mathieu Vazavier. Third in the order is another United car. It's Philippe Albuquerque. Um, he is not on time going to catch the two ahead. It's about a minute back, but uh, third, and he is ahead of Jonas Reed by about nine seconds. LMP3, cool racing, number 17. Marcus Siebert, talked about this a little while ago. He's got a 14 second window ahead of the WTM by Rinaldi Racing, number 12 car. Oscar, Oscar Tinio and Mathieu Lahaye in the ultimate number 35 completes the top three. And in GTE, which has been absolutely stellar this evening, Kessel Racing, Davide Regan. I think it's Davide's birthday today. Someone, I think, told me I think he's 37 today. Okay. Happy birthday, Davide. For your presents, you get an, what is that? An uh, eight second lead over Alessio Picariello in the number 16 Proton Competition car, which is now, back, it's now ahead of the 93 of Martin Rimp. 26 seconds back. So Ferrari, Porsche, Porsche, John Lancaster chasing hard and with Martin Rump now in the JMW, uh, the JMW 66 car in contention for a podium position, a car that led for quite a while this evening. And uh, also in that group, the third of the three Proton Competition cars, uh, all three running in the top five, and that's in the hands of Julian Anzlauer, right with John Lancaster. Matt Griffin a further 14 seconds back after that car, I think, came in to repair, repair a rear light. Yes, it did, I remember. Uh, confirmed, Davide Regan's ha uh, birthday today. Happy birthday from me as well. I just needed to look that up before I was fully committed to it. 37 years young today.
and uh, still not lost an ounce of uh, pace for the Italian. He's not be he didn't race at Barcelona, but uh, back into the ELMS for this weekend. Oli Jarvis now five laps into what should be his final stint. Paul Chatin pitting what three laps later for the EDEX Sport after a still as yet undescribed or unrecognised slight error which lost him a couple of places. There's there's time yet for this to be run at one on pace, lest we forget. And uh, keeping a weather eye on lap times. The pit stop for car 17 is under investigation now for that's, Marcus Seaberg. That is the race leader, race leader in LMP3. That must be the last pit stop that they did. A minute and 46 seconds. Is it a minute well, 46 or a minute 45? Uh, uh, no, yeah, well, it doesn't really matter because that is a long stop regardless. It is exactly a long stop. Yeah. But now, it, this is... OK, the timing screen we have here is a summary. It's measured by the tenth. Yes, but 105 seconds is 1 minute and 45 seconds, right? Does that say 145 or 146? Well, it doesn't matter, because if it said 144, it doesn't round numbers up. Our timing screen doesn't round numbers up. If it's completely accurate. Well... We have seen it before. OK. On one occasion, okay. a 145 timed below it, I think by 0.1 of a second. If it was 144.9, then our screen should say 144. But OK, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And it, it, there could be further evidence well, supplied by race control that uh, any, suggests the timing loop is not quite in the right place or whatever. I don't know. Any penalty at this point, other than something that says add five or ten seconds to the next pit stop, which they won't have to serve, yeah. would cost them the lead. I don't think it's the time. I'm going to stick my neck out and say I don't think it's the time. I think it's something else that they might have okay. done which wasn't legal. So that could be too many people over the line. It could be something extra that they did during the pit stop that's, that shouldn't have been done. We may well get the information during the race. If not, it'll be a post-race affair. But it's still being investigated. So Absolutely. nothing in concrete just yet about whether the 17 car will have to make another pit stop to serve a penalty board with Martin Rimp and uh, he is attempting to catch well, in fact he's just been overtaken by Julian Anslauer so that's a change in fact I think he's been overtaken by both John Lancaster and Julian Anslauer so Martin Rump has dropped back in the order here as the JMW Motorsport car does indeed move up into a podium position again Meantime, all of a sudden, Oliver Jarvis's pace has moved up a notch. What was 5.86 seconds is now nine seconds. Yeah. He's in the 150s. Chasing pack is in the 152s. The next uh, car along, uh, Jan Venuta, I think, lost a little bit of time on that lap, probably with traffic. That is a change again. That is Julian Anslauer going by the JMW car. Or did he? Not quite, because on the fight back, or Got him on back. The, at the exit of the corner, the 66 just stays ahead of car 77. So Julian Anlauer looking for a way by again. He's right underneath John Lancaster, and Lancaster needing to be cautious to allow Anlauer the racing room and not force him into the pit wall. I think both cars right over the kerb, as I was describing they were doing last night. And now in the dust, Anlauer to the inside line, heading uphill through turns two and three. And did Anlauer get through the corner there? Yeah, but the Ferrari still got ahead. Brilliant I'm, racing. I'm not quite sure how they changed positions from the inside and outside there. There was no room. John Lancaster went into that turn on the outside and came through the turn on the inside. <laughs> I've no idea how that happened. Well, in that gap of darkness, who knows what might happen? But th that's the beauty of Motorland Aragon in not quite the middle of the night, but we are just after half past nine in the evening. It's Terrific driving from both John Lancaster in that Ferrari and Julian Anlau, who we know all about after his antics, both in the United States, but also I remember him first arriving at the 24 Hours of Le Mans and really surprising many people. John Lancaster's been out of the game for a little while, certainly within ACO rules racing. Been doing quite a lot of testing, John. 
Ah, oh, but he goes off. off the track now. And is that a legacy of running a touch wide and out into the marbles? Because all of a sudden, when he wasn't in under as much pressure from Julian Anlauer, he ran deep into turn 12, did just about get the car back to the actual track, though, and stays ahead. Uh, 34 car, by the way, back out on track, but way, way down 22nd place. Racing Team Turkey. Martin Rump now has a brilliant view of this battle. It so it's, just. it's for the podium and third, fourth and fifth right together oh. as Anlauer now charging his way down the inside on the brakes. And I think Rump might look into this as well because Lancaster can't pull back across the nose of the second Porsche. Oh, can he? No, he can. He slots between the two Proton cars. There's a lot you can say about John Lancaster, but being bullied out of the place is not in his lexicon. 93 car, Martin Rump, searing headlamps, goes up the inside, and I think with the 77 car there, he's going to make this, the, they made it look easy. Made it look easy. It was, 66 car was somewhat stymied into turn one, and the 93 car had a clear run through. I think that's just a few corners where Lancaster was forced off the ideal racing line, and you think we've done over three, three hours and a half of racing now. It's so dusty and it also into the marbles as well, where he'll be picking up tyre pickup. He just didn't have the manoeuvrability in the Ferrari anymore, and I think realised the game was up, heading down into turn number one. But good car placement for Martin Rump, realised the opportunity was heading his way, and he's now got ahead as the three cars tumble their way through the corkscrew. 20, um, sorry, 22 minutes remaining, over 10 seconds the gap now for Ollie Jarvis. From Paul Lubchatan, Alex Lynn is a further six seconds back. Jean Venute is falling off this battle now a little, seven seconds. A gap that was maybe three laps ago under two. Jose Maria Lopez, meanwhile, five seconds back. Neil Jarley, by the way, has been charging along. He's uh, working his way up through the LMP2 Pro Am field as Alex Lynn gets a warning flag for driving standards at 21.17. So that would have been in that melee. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's an element of driving standards. I also noticed the 25 car going very, very wide on the exit of the corkscrew on one occasion. He must have been about a, a full car width off the track heading through turn 10. I wonder whether that's been looked back upon. It was about that sort of time. But uh, Lynn did force his way up the inside of Paul Luke Shatter. No, it was Jot van Outer, wasn't it? As those two jostled yes. for position. But uh, all that looked fair. Although it's difficult to tell in this level of light, I have to admit. So this dust up in uh, GTE, Kessel Racing lead, Alessio Picariello in the other. These, these are the two of the, uh, the Proton cars, but the 16 car, the light blue car is second, they're separated by under eight seconds, then it's the Racing Team Turkey back, car back on track before we get to this battle. 77 in the hands of Julian Endlauer, Martin Rump in the 93, the silver, black and yellow car, and then John Lancaster in the number 66 Proton car. John Lancaster is being closed at the moment by Matt Griffin. He's got a little work to do, but Matt Griffin could be part of this battle. Mm. Yeah, so running in sixth, but uh, seven and a few seconds still to go. Oh, so she'll find rather, 7.3 it is to be exact for the Irishman. I seem to have had a number of times, I've had a sense of deja vu as I saying that. There's been a number of times we've had two, three, four cars and then you have to say, and they're being closed by. Yes. And then the inevitability is you've got a five or six car battle. That's happened in every class this afternoon, this evening. Yeah, well, when you're in a squabble, in an arm wrestle, you're not going as fast as you could do in clear air, and that just naturally, like a magnet, draws in other cars. Gianluca Roda, that's the father of Giorgio Roda, and uh, won the GT title with his son some years ago. The older statesman of the Roda racing family. Indeed so. Good to see him still absolutely glued oh, to yeah. the coverage of this race. He willing a great result for his son and the rest of the crew at Proton competition. So Proton run second 
third and fourth in GTE. Alessio Picariello taking over the sky blue and black car from Zach Robichon in the previous stop. And we know all about the Julian Anlauer versus Martin Rump scrap. Even though they run from the Proton competition awning, there's absolutely nothing to suggest Martin Rump's not going to try and get ahead of Julian Anlauer, but he's going to have to catch him first. This might be a good chance because caught up a little bit which behind some traffic that's just lapped the two of them these are prototypes that they are that are just ahead as they feed their way through turn seven and then up ahead is where the track drops away they swing right and left and through this brilliant part of the track at the corkscrew so you watch as well the radar system that warns what's coming where it's coming in the centre of the dashboard. Proton competition, just a moment to talk about them as we see the battle fourth here between yet another Proton car. Ernest Reed, son of one of the team owners, Christian Reed, co owns the team nowadays with his brother Michael, who looks after the technical aspects. But uh, third generation of the Reed family in racing. Gerard, the father of Christian and Michael, who's here as he usually is at the racetrack, taking it all in. But what a massive part of the GTE Formula Proton competition has been. I was talking to Christian Reed a couple of days ago about the fabulous 911 RSRs in the 2017 and 2019 versions. And uh, they're campaigning, I think, seven of those cars across their teams, plus the Iron Link to Nine Dames squads this year. Those cars owned by Proton Competition, not owned by Investor, owned by the team. Part of a collection of, take a breath, 16 Porsche 911 RSRs they have on strength. 16. More than Porsche have. Wow. It includes X Factory cars from the WEC. It includes X Factory cars from the IMSA with the Tech Sports Car Championship. It includes the Mon winning cars, WC, LMS, race and... Um, championship winning cars it includes the cars that Michael Fassbender has driven there are some history in that collection quite amazing a and fairly will... significant size warehouse I would think well, as well to well, store all of those well here's the point until after Bahrain this year those cars will never have been together as one collection in the same place because right. a number of them have always been going somewhere It's, Continuing uh, on, 16 minutes still to go, and uh, 112 laps completed now by the Oliver Jarvis-driven United Order Sports USA number 22 car. Incredibly, Jarvis has built the lead up to nearly 10 seconds now over Paul Luc Chatin in the EDEX Sport car with Alex Lynn and the Algarve Pro Racing number 25 running in third position. Mathieu Vaxavier in charge in LMP2 Pro-Am, so AF Corsa on course for a class victory there, a category win, because the gap back to Neil Jarney not in that class is 15 seconds, and there's a further five seconds back to the second-place car in Pro-Am, Matthias Besch. Vanuta is coming back again. That seven seconds is back under two seconds, 47 car off the road. And that is from sixth position for Jose Maria Lopez. Trying to work out where that is. It's turn one where there are yellow flags now being displayed to protect Pachito. So, was he going for a move? Yes, he was, and there was... Oh, no, it was contact it from was the, the other 37. Car. The cool racing cars it was Matt, it was, it was, have collided with one another. Matt, it was Malta Jakobsen. So oh, dear. Malta in the 37. Where was he in class? He is eighth, ninth in class in and 16th out. overall. But he charged down the inside of Jose Maria Lopez, and embarrassingly for cool racing, the two cars have made contact with one another and surely resulted in quite a bit of damage for both as well. More difficult to tell that they were in the same team colours in this level of light, but definitely the case. Absolutely. And Jose Maria Lopez took longer to rejoin the race. The 37 has stopped as well. So both cars in trouble. I think the 47 may have got back underway. It has, but it's the 37 that is in trouble. So that car is not a happy machine at the moment. 99 Proton Competition car working its way through the chicane, or the, the hairpin at turn 16. Jonas Reed then able to drive around 
the stricken car. Tristan Vautier is in behind Jonas. And the gap there is not too large at all. Reed under pressure here from Algarve Pro Racing's number 20 for a podium finish. No, for fourth position, I beg your pardon, in LMP2 Pro-Am. 37 has stopped on the racetrack, and that is Malta Jakobsen with clearly a lot of damage coming. on the front of that car. It looked like he'd, th there was damage from the, the hit, and I think he was in the barrier as well. So it's a full course yellow that is going to be coming in just under 30 seconds. I'm sort of surprised it's only a full course yellow in the dark. 20 seconds to full course yellow. I'm presuming they believe they can recover that car quickly. Yeah. But so uh, we've got 13 minutes Ten, left. Nine, eight, seven. So as they're calling six, this one down, five, lead gap, four, almost 12 seconds. Three, gap two, to, uh, to third, one, over 12 full seconds. Full course yellow, full course yellow. We're intervening at T1 on the runoff and on the track. We will be intervening at T1 on the runoff and on the track. When you say it's surprising, it's a full course yellow rather than a safety, safety car. car. I do think Eduardo Freitas and the rest of his team, though, would really prefer. They've said this over the years. I absolutely to, agree. To avoid a safety car this far into the race. The only reason I say it there is it's dark. It's the darkness. Yeah. And yeah, it's, but, you know, as, but as long as everybody behaves themselves. There's a clear message about where the incident is being yep. dealt with. Um, there are LED boards telling everybody as well that, uh, you know, it's, it's a double waved yellow effectively at the incident scene. And uh, marshals have been briefed about that, team managers have been briefed about that, drivers have been briefed about that. And I just think uh, th the danger is that, you know, United Autosports, Holly Jarvis have worked so hard to get into this position and the other two co-drivers, Phil Hansen and Marino Sato. Um, you really want to avoid, unless it's barrier damage or something crucial like that, circuit, uh, circuit infrastructure, try and avoid a late safety car because it will generate a, a false result to the race. It's so not always possible. Let's see how quickly this can be sorted. So it looks like it's recovering the car to the outside. It must be debris, therefore, to the inside. And I think the 37 car was in that barrier yeah. uh, at the inside. As a result it was a big of that hit. Impact. It was a big hit. I mean, it, it nerfed Pachito right around on the spot. And then I think it, it will have knocked out at least one of the headlights on Malta Jakobsen's car. But Ma it's a strange moment for Malta. It, you know, his form previously would tell me that uh, he wouldn't normally I'd make that sort of error unless it was a misjudgment in the darkness. Yeah, I'd like to see it again as to exactly... I mean, yeah, at the moment, looking at it, it looked like it was on the younger driver to the inside there it looked like that but I'd like to see it again to, to take another good look it's difficult to pick out in the darkness yeah well I, for me it was definitely um, Jose Maria Lopez on the outside in the 47 that was the car that was then spinning yes with the 37 on the inside yes. it just looked like just a bit too late braking from Malta Jakobsen uh, but a big clatter front right of if it is a 37 on the rear left of the 47 and actually, Pachito was able to leave the scene. And what was his... Uh, we're under safety car now, so can't look at his last lap times. But uh, clearly that car won't be quite in uh, as, uh, as good alignment as it was at the start of the race. Even less so for the number 37 car. Yeah. Well, the one remaining thing we absolutely know we haven't seen back from uh, race control that could be significant here is the investigation around a pit stop issue for the LMP3 leader. Indeed, we knew that that was under investigation and that was the one I was suggesting for my money wasn't down to the yep, time, but it was more about perhaps something that had taken place during the pit stop that is outside of the regulations. That remains to be seen, um, but uh, the number 17 car may well head across the line as the race leader, and then we might get something in the half an hour or so after the race once everything has been fully investigated. But that contact between car 47 and 37 at the first corner is now under investigation. The fact that it's between the two team cars is not taken into account. It's, uh, you know, they're... they're deemed to be entirely separate entities and if one car is at fault then there must be a penalty to be served. 37 now into a place of safety so that aspect of the incident dealt with. We did hear though 
they're intervening on the runoff and on the track. Yeah. So there may still be some literal bits and pieces that need to be dealt with. But I don't think it can be long before we're back to green flag running. And the nice thing about a full course yellow as well is that it's not a case of having to wait for the safety car to get back to the start finish line before you can restart. You can restart the race at any point around indeed. the track. And just count down into the time selected. So eight and a half minutes to go. Feels like we're going to be picking the bones out of this one for a, a couple of days afterwards, actually. Um, maybe that was always going to be the case, trying to unearth exactly what has happened in some of this late race incident. It was hashtag blame Johnny for the initial safety car many hours ago. I think hashtag blame Graham for saying something's going to happen because it always does. And, and we're going to get carnage in the final hour. And that's precisely what we've got. Mr. And more Goodwin. than once. Indeed. It's the, it's the other point here. More than once. And in, you know, as usual, bizarre circumstances. Yeah. Although you were, you were painting the picture as that being a positive thing about the European Le Mans series, because there's always a sting in the tail. There's that, always something you know, where, you know, with a lot of motor racing in the modern era, particularly single class stuff, when you get to the stage where it reaches a rhythm, it comes down to luck and good fortune. In sports car racing, because of the, the variations that come with the fact we're not watching one race, we're watching four and we're watching it in the dark, and we're watching it on a track that these teams are not that familiar with. And there are pit stops, and there's fuel and tyres and strategy that goes with that involved. It throws so many other variables into this that you can't take your eyes off it. Yeah. There's been at least twice I've been looking at something else during this, and I've not seen something absolutely crucial to a major change in position for a major position in one of those four classes. You can't take your eyes off it. That's why I love this so much. Yeah. And if United Autosports do convert this to the win, you have to say, brilliant for all three drivers, but as brilliant, if not more brilliant, for that team to turn that uh, car around in 56 good. seconds. We're moving full course yellow at 21.54 in 15 seconds. Uh, there's a late pit stop there for the number 95, Aston Martin. Ben Tuck, I just noticed, re-emerging from the pit eight, lane. Seven, and that six, was uh, five, oh, possibly a drive-through, actually. I 37 think that was seconds. probably emergency Two, service. One, yeah, full course yeah. yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. Yeah, because the drive-through is uh, slightly slower than 30... Uh, sorry, uh, slightly quicker than 37 seconds. But yes, because the pit lane is closed under a full course yellow, they wouldn't have been able to put much more than about five seconds of fuel into the 95. Five. They'll have to stop next time around, therefore. Yep. Well, the green flag is out as so many cars run wide on the exit of turn seven. I wonder whether there's a slight bit of slack involved in track limits now because it's so tricky to pick the road out in front of you, although you should probably know which way it goes now after, what have we had, 115 laps if you're an LMP2 car. Slightly fewer than that, about 105 for the GTEs. So as they come back up to speed, we'll call the gaps as we see them. Waiting for Paul of Chatin to clear a timing sector. The gap is 18 seconds, the lead. The gap between Chatin and Alex Lynn. Again, as he clears the timing sector, we'll call that one for you. That's 10 and a half. And then Job for Utet is a further 3.7 seconds back. So 30 seconds and change between the top four with five minutes remaining. AF Corsa's 83 car with Mathieu Vazivier is looking very comfortable in the lead of LMP2 Pro-Am now. Fifth overall ahead of the decaying car of Neil Janney and Jose Mira Lopez. It's uh, running in seventh now after that uh, brush with the team car. No change at the moment, but still wondering whether or not we've got something still to come for the 17 car that leads LMP3. It's cool racing from WTM by Rinaldi Racing and Ultimate inside the last four, uh, five minutes. And it is Kessel Racing from the 16 Proton Competition car. Ten seconds between those two. And then it is Julian Anslauer, ten, nine tenths of a second ahead of the team car and the 77 from the 93 car in the battle for the final podium position. Tristan Vautier ran very wide on the run into turn 16, the hairpin a moment or two ago in car 20. Jonas Reed is right with him now. So that is the fight for fourth and fifth in LMP2 Pro-Ams. We're homing in on that with our cameras for the time being. So Vautier 
being challenged in the closing stages by Jonas Reed in the Proton competition number 99. 99 formerly led LMP2 Pro-Am in the very early stages. Giorgio Roda. Yep. Yeah, when Roda was battling away with um, Sally Yolich in the 34 racing team Turkey car. And again, Vautier way oh. off the road. That's the 65, 65 car, is Jot van which is, was running in fourth position. And Jot van Uytert very nearly cleaned out by a few more cars that jet their way through turns 12 and 13. So it's getting very dusty offline, clearly. Vautier nearly lost it. Well, that car just ahead of him on the road. I think he may have lost a position there as well. What Jot happened van Uytert, here? Did all it on his own. own. I think Vazivier may have got past, past him there. OK. I didn't see another LMP2 car squeeze no, he's by, not. but... My uh, apologies, he's not. Five seconds ahead. Right, so... But the gap's massively come down then between Van yeah. Uytert and Vaxivier. I was about to say, Van Uytert looked like he was the one player here that might have made a difference in pace. He was closing the gap again, clearly pushing hard and clearly too hard to catch Alex Lynn, but that's not going to happen now. And what you've now got is a Panis racing car with filthy, filthy tyres yeah. and a fired-up Mathieu Vazivier, who fancies fourth place overall, might have a crack. Yeah, there's the scope for that to change. He doesn't want to jeopardise a pro-am victory, though, Mathieu Vaxivier, no. if Jot van Aert wants to force the issue. The last thing they want is very late race contact. Oliver Jarvis through the darkness emerges there, car number 22, turning left at turn 12. Two minutes and 20 seconds left on the clock. A lap time around here. Last time around for Jarvis was 1 minute 53. So there'll be less than that, I reckon, left on the clock by the time Jarvis heads across the line. This is the penultimate lap now for United Autosports Trouble USA. behind the smoke, or was that dust from a car running wide? Meantime, by the way, keep an eye on third place in GTE because Martin Rump came through the end of that lap under a tenth of a second back from Julian Anzlauer. 280 kph through the split there for Ollie Jarvis. Not an inkling that he is easing back. He doesn't need to either. There will be less than a lap time on the clock now. Rump has taken the position, the 93 car. Spent time in the wall after the impact from the Duquesne team, Orica, on Michael Fassbender. But uh, that has been recovered to a podium position with a great run from the 93 car. So the order in GTE, David Rieg on the birthday boy, number 57, ahead of the 16 Proton competition, Alessio Picariello car and Martin Rump fresh to the podium now, if he can hang on in the Proton competition, 93. And uh, Michael Fassbender well, was talking to Steph Wentworth earlier on, saying, well, I thought, thought maybe a podium might be on offer. He'll be grateful of that if they get there, but he'll be really kicking himself about what happened between he and Nico Pino in the very early part of the race, because it might have been a race win for the 93 car. They have run faultlessly since then. There's the overall race leader exiting the corkscrew through the left-hander turn 10, and then on towards this tricky approach to turn 12, still with plenty of cars up ahead. Jarvis reads the road perfectly and works his way now through the left and the right-hand flick with blue LED boards flashing to warn those that the race leader wants to get by. Last lap, 20 seconds on the clock. And Ollie Jarvis is going to come home for what was a full team effort here. Cars 65 and 20, by the way, under investigation for possible overtaking with gaining advantage. Yeah, OK. Well, I think that's off track. Yeah, overtaking off track down at turn 12. Well, mind you, the 65 was fully spinning with Jot van Aerter at the wheel. It might have been a different incident for the Panis racing car. Yeah. Out of the final few corners comes Oliver Jarvis. United Order Sports yesterday took pole position, a first ever pole for Phil Hansen, and they will win the very first four hours of Aragon as part of round three of the European Le Mans series. Well done to United Autosports, to all three drivers coming home as well for a class win is going to be the 83 AF Corsa car. Edex Sport come home, confirmed second, and in 10 seconds or so times uh, to complete the podium will be Alex Lynn. Second and third home, by the way, in LMP3. Cool Racing 17 still got a way to go before completing their lap. Alex Lynn does come through to complete 
the trio on the podium. Panis Racing, Jan van Utrecht, fourth. Fifth overall is going to be the Pro-Am LMP2 winner. Mathieu Vazivier completes that. In a race that turned into disaster for the 34 car that leads the championship. This will throw a substantial spanner in the numerical works. <laughs> particularly because equal second in that championship was the 37 car that uh, was involved in the blue on blue contact yeah and eliminated eliminated itself from the race in the latter moments unfortunately so we're still waiting for the finishers on the gte podium no, one of them's home so already seven and 16 come home well then 16's just crossed the line and martin rump having very recently got ahead of julian and lauer will make it a two three four finish for proton competition we were saying it was all about ferraris at about half you distance were. in gte well it is a ferrari that wins but nevertheless the 911 RSR 19 do get two of their cars on the podium and confirmation of the LMP3 victory uh, with the win going to Cool Racing and Marcus Siebert, although we still don't think we got a resolution from that pit stop that was under investigation. But well done to Cool Racing, Marcus Siebert, uh, Adrian Schiller and Alejandro Garcia, who we heard from late on with Steph, who was very confident that they would get a race victory and definitely a strong position now in the championship at half distance graham yeah indeed well what an event what a race the weather through challenges at us that we're not used to we're used to the wind and the rain even the snow at times but my gosh the heat this week has been blistering and that has been quite a few days for not just the drivers in these cars but the pit crews and the marshals at that mo uh, that point um in really a blistering heat here a lot cooler today but still pretty challenging the racing superb mm. plenty of incidents uh in every class all sorts of st storylines i'm glad i'm not writing about this one because i'll be here till about three o'clock in the morning just doing lmp2 well, that's true, but uh, fear not that uh, there will be plenty of coverage on that, that website that we've mentioned uh, plenty of times already, because uh, there's another bloke uh, up in the media centre who uh, probably will get a pretty late night now by the time he's finished. Aragon, multi-class racing, seems to fit together quite well, I it, would say. It, it does. I mean, I could have done without the blistering heat for three or four yeah, days. Yeah, but the but track layout yes. and uh, the, wha the fact that certain classes were clumping together and generating a real challenge for all sorts of cars, particularly in the faster classes. Uh, Ollie Jarvis, by the way, has not made a mistake here. He's been instructed to head down the pit lane in the wrong direction. And any other track, this would be the right direction with the pit wall to your left, but an anti-clockwise circuit and the pit lane on the inside of the track has posed one or two problems for particularly the GT cars in that the inlet, the fueling nozzle, has to go into the other side of the car. Indeed. And that's been quite a conversion. Yes, it has for some of the cars, um, and the, you know, cars that have never had to do it before, Yeah, of course. But uh, that was one heck of a run from United Autosports. At least a couple of points in this race, they looked nowhere. They looked as if that was never looking like a possibility. But the, the wing came back to them. Huge kudos, by the way, to Marino Sato. He's there to greet Oli Jarvis. Phil Hansen, brilliant start to the race from him after putting it on pole position. Marino Sato took a cautious start to his stint. Looked like he was losing pace. Looked like perhaps he was even outclassed at the start there. Mm -hmm. But he knew what he was doing. Took the fight to the rest and uh, great stuff 57 that's been a kind of quiet run to the end quietly efficient after taking the lead and just kept it there and no dramas just yeah, did it every credit to kessel racing for preparing that car to uh, again do battle in the uh, slightly less heat but uh, of course these cars have been here all week as well and heat soak has been a major issue there are the photographs that you'll be seeing on the websites and uh, forthcoming highlights packages as well of the three drivers that have taken victory it's a first united autosports overall victory since spa last year when phil hansen was part of the lineup but on that occasion he was joined by tom gamble and duncan tappy so it's been a bit of a wait a first win of the year for united autosports when they have struggled at certain times but it felt like United Autosport just fitted with this yes. this racetrack this weekend. Uh, started off so well this morning, 
Um, just before midday, when Phil Hansen, well, just after midday, by the, the finish of qualifying, those four separate sessions, Phil Hansen confirmed as the pole sitter, and they've converted it into a race victory. They're hopping out of the car, birthday boy Davide Regon. <laughs> few extra drinks perhaps tonight to celebrate the race victory as well. Happy um, birthday, David. It's been a tough year or so with recovery from a big incident he had in a GT car a couple of years ago. But to say he's back to form with the understatement, great to see him so happy. And look at the reaction from Cool Racing. That's Alejandro Garcia almost climbing on board the car as it drives past him to celebrate with Marcus Siebert who set the fastest LMP3 lap very early on in his stint when the car was full of fuel, actually, but it showed that the track conditions were steadily improving, getting cooler and conducive to better lap times. And that is Macho Vaxavier climbing out of the number 83 AF Corsa car with a big smile on his face behind the helmet, rest assured of that, enjoying victory with his teammates Francois Perodo and Alessandro Rivera. Let's see what it means to Marcus Siebert then, the uh, driver from Argentina, who will extend the championship gap, along with Adrian Schiller and Alejandro Garcia, the 27-year-old from Mar de la Plata, uh, now <laughs> ready to receive a huge hug from Alejandro Garcia. The Mexican and the Argentinian racers embrace and just shows how much it means to these guys we're only halfway through the season but a single event victory is massive especially because their nearest rivals in the championship have not scored so well at all I remember for a lot of these young drivers this marks a big change in their career track they've been down many of them the karting and the single seater routes this really does matter it's a shop window for a very exciting marketplace in uh, motorsport at the moment. Well, that's that done. We're going to be going down to Steph, who's got some of the winners from this race with her. I am with the winners of the race, LMP2 winners. Uh, Marina Sato, let's start with you. Uh, it was a real team effort for, from all of you today, wasn't it? And I'm sure you're all buzzing with this result. I think so. Um, yeah, from the Phil putting on the pole. And I think, uh, yeah, Phil started well kept our lead and uh, I think I drove a decent stint without any mistake. Oli finished it off really quick pace in the end so uh, very happy. All right and Oli has just jumped in here and um, congratulations you brought it home. Uh, what was going through your mind just towards the end of the race there? Uh, bring it home, don't make any mistakes, car was amazing. I mean these guys set it up for me, they did all the hard work so you know Phil with his pole, mega job uh, this morning, seems crazy that was only this morning. I mean Marino jumped in with the pros and did an outstanding job so I just had to make sure I didn't let them down and a good win for the team after two really tough uh, races to start the season. And Phil we spoke to you earlier but can you guys carry on this momentum now for the final half of the season? Yeah absolutely, like, like Wally said, two tough races at the start of the season but we're back to where we think we belong, a nice win and a point for poles. So we definitely think we're back in the championship fight from this way onwards, from this point onwards. All right, well, enjoy the celebrations. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we'll get the championship positions to you and the points in a moment or two, but it'll be interesting to see where the number 22 car is. Just bring it home rather, uh, I don't know, going light on the on Ollie's role in that because it was the most difficult stint, I would say, in the darkness, having to pick his way through some of the carnage. But then when you get into a bit of a rhythm, uh, then, you know, he's at home with a car that he admits was very, very well prepared by United Order Sports. And indeed, the, 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 uh, the role of the pit crew in that turning that car around, that was the defining mm. point there. It was so, so close to that point. And all of a sudden, making that call at the time that they, uh, they made it and turning it around in under a minute when others couldn't, that was the big change. It's been a long, long day. <laughs> on Saturday at Motorland Aragon. We were qualifying at 10.15 this morning. We got the race underway in full daylight at 6 p.m. and Phil Hansen from pole position managed to fend off any attacks from Nico Pino and from the second row as well, the Rui Andrade driven 43 into Europol competition car. Andrade would muscle his way up into second place later on in the stint, but couldn't shake Phil Hansen from the race lead. Meanwhile, very, very busy on several occasions into the hairpin at the end of the lap with the number 19 Team Virage car putting the squeeze on a couple of LMP3 machines. 
The number four not carrying damage at that point, but later on it would do. This was a horrible moment for Johnny Lawson in the Formula Racing Ferrari and for Rui Andrade in the LMP2 car. The two connecting on the run into the corkscrew at turn eight. It would put the Ferrari out on the spot. And although Rui Andrade would limp back to the pits, the team at Inter Europol competition would not be able to repair the rear damage and Rui Andrade stepping away from the car there, signatures confirming that the car would be out of the race. Meanwhile, for those that survived the opening exchanges, some great battling within LMP2, particularly in the LMP2 proper category or the uh, non-pro-am category with the silver drivers. And likewise, actually, a really good duel in the early stages between the Pro-Am leaders of Sally Jolic and Giorgio Roda for Racing Team Turkey and Proton, respectively. Diving down the inside there was the 47 car, and there was a bit of afters as well with the 65 Panis racing machine. So that was Timon von der Helm getting stuck in with Richard de Geras. GT's a super show in the early stage you had something like five of the gt regulars a, a line astern with the aston martin the ferrari and the porsche all looking competitive you can tell that the light was getting longer the shadows growing as well and that more golden light appearing as the sun started to move towards the horizon for an 845 sunset united order sports bolting on a new set of tires for their second driver marino sato and he would be charging his way up the order before eventually handing the car over to Ollie Jarvis for a couple of rapid stints on brand new tyres. Side by side action again into turns 14 and 15. That was a regular sight for the full four hours. As up through the gears there would go the Racing Team Turkey machine. I noticed that one of their pit stops, number 34, is currently under investigation, but they were not a podium finisher in the end in the LMP2 Pro-Am, so that will not alter uh, podium. There was a glimpse of Oli Jarvis coming out of the twisty stuff in the early part of the lap. A late pit stop as well for the number 28 car of EDEC Sport. And in the end, EDEC would finish in second place ahead of Algarve Pro. This was a horrible moment for Cool Racing down at the first corner with 37 and 47 making contact. Malta Jakobsen in the 37, Pachito Lopez in the 47 car. And both would, well, the, the 47 would limp away, the 37 out on the spot. And uh, yeah, first lesson of motorsport, don't hit your teammate. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case for Cool Racing. United Order Sports, though, with a first win of the season. So, 119 laps completed for United Order Sports USA, and they, in their number 22 car, take victory over Paul Lafarge, Paul Luc Chatin, and Laurence Hoare in the number 28 EDEC car. Algarve Pro Racing, after their victory at Le Castellet last time out, will get a podium from the back of the grid. 83 wins the LMP2 Pro Am. Uh, field, and that's the AF Corsa entry for Francois Perodo, Mathieu Vaxivier, and Lesia Rivera. Nielsen Racing in the 24 car was second, ahead of the 21 United Order Sports sister car. LMP3 won by Cool Racing in the number 17, ahead of Wokenspiegel Team Monchau with Rinaldi Racing and Ultimate in the number 35, finishing also on the podium in third. And in the GTEs, it's Kessel Racing with their 57 bright yellow car of Takeshi Kimura, who started. Scott Huffaker did the middle stint and Davide Regon bringing it home ahead of the 16 Proton Competition Porsche and the 93 Proton car. That the Michael Fassbender car that, remember, was in a spin after a collision with Duquesne. He was stuck facing the pit wall for over a minute. But amazingly, that car still is going to feature in the top three. Should mention, by the way, what a stint from Scott Hofficker. Took the lead and held it and pulled away. Defining moments there for Kessel Racing without a shadow of a doubt. On the LMP3 front, we've still got that thing we think is outstanding. But mm. I think the way this race finished means, with or without a penalty, they're fine because at the end of the race, they had a lap advantage. Crucial. So even if there is a time penalty, yeah, that doesn't actually change the fact that those cars were a lap apart. So this is the I'll go pro race. overall podium. Yep, this is. Yeah. We have an LMP2 podium and an overall podium, but it makes sense to do the overall first of all. So Algarve Pro Racing, their trio of drivers will be... Uh, Kiffin Simpson, James Allen and Alex Lynn. Second 
to Edex Sport and the 28 crew, Paul Lafargue, Paul Luc Chatter and Laurence Hoare. But here are the race winners for the first time this year. Marino Sato, Phil Hansen, who started the car, and Oliver Jarvis, who brought it home for United Order Sports USA. Here's the national anthem. United Order Sports USA, as they are officially known on the ELMS entry list, the Anglo-American squad, of course, firmly roots in Yorkshire in the UK, but uh, also likewise with uh, the USA as well. And I think they're still a British team in the World Endurance Championship, aren't they? I think they are. It's the co-ownership between Richard Dean and Zach Brown, of course, yeah. that uh, is that uh, international flavour to it. It is. Goodyear will be handing out the trophies, and correctly so. Great racing, LMP2. I was going to say, Johnny, the, the, the gaps we had at the, the flag there don't really tell the story of what a good race that was. That's true. They did rather open up in the final half an hour or so, I guess. But, uh, no, it, it, it was door handle to door handle for the duration, really, up until that point. That's why it's important to watch the race and not just look at the result chart at the end of the day. Absolutely. And uh, watching on social media as a number of people have been watching on with us and they've been thrilled by it, and quite rightly so. It continues to be a championship and racing of huge quality. Yeah. And with the numbers that look set to be coming to LMP2 next year and with the advent of LMGT3 next year, we've got a half a season of this and then another year of something deliciously different next year to come. But I think... As we continue to get races this good and this close, then the top layer of prototype driving talent will continue to be attracted to the European Le Mans series. And to Oli Jarvis, nearly getting knocked out there by a bottle of champagne that must have whizzed past his ear as fast as he whizzed across the line at the end of that race. But thankfully, he's fleet of foot and jumped out of the way. Duquesne will still lead the championship, but only by three points uh, from Algarve Pro Racing and Edex Sport. United Order Sports, today's winners, are only 13 points back now, 40 their total. So back, uh, right up into fourth position and in the box seat, shall we say, to capitalise on the final points that are available, 78 of them. Neil Jarney, Nico Pino, Rene Binder remain as the championship leaders over Alex Lynn, James Allen and Kiffin Simpson. And then it's the Lons or Paul Lafargue and Paul Chata combination. And then Marino Sato, Phil Hansen and Oli Jarvis will come next in fourth place. Let's get straight back to Steph with more reaction from the four hours of Aragon. I am joined by the 83 AF Corsa LMP2 Pro-Am winners. Congratulations, guys. Mega race from you. Was you expecting this when you came into it? No, not really. I think... Uh... It was a tough start for me. We could have done, uh, we were looking good for P2 because car 34 is always so fast. And unfortunately, they had an issue and uh, we seized the opportunity. So, you know, really, really good job from uh, my two mates and drivers and, uh, and the team in general. Super happy. And how did you enjoy the night race? Because it's completely different to anything. How did you manage to adapt to kind of the changing conditions? Yeah, we had the FP2 a bit to adapt, but to be honest, now uh, was a was a nice fight. And on the night as well, I have a nice fight with uh, with Louis. Um, so I think that it was a nice battle that uh, we end up in front. So I'm really happy about this was this was this. And uh, since the beginning of the race, the, the year we are quite uh, consistent. Francois they, they do a mega job since the beginning, and the, the replacement driver this this weekend I think did a mega job as well. Luxury so, replacement. So I'm really happy uh, for. 
all the team and uh, all the work that they are doing at the workshop and, uh, and yeah, finally the, the luck uh, turn and uh, yeah, so happy for us. And how was it for you, Alessio, jumping straight in there? How did you find it? I'm really happy to be back in the Zebra team with uh, Francois and Mathieu. Uh, yeah, it was a tough race, but the uh, car was really good. Uh, I enjoyed every lap. Uh, it was a close fight with the 34 car. They are always really fast, but uh, I think uh, we have a good potential and uh, I'm really happy for the team, of course, and also for me. All right, congratulations. Thanks, guys. Thank the you. super Thank sub, you. Alessio Rivera, replacing Ben Barnico, although he is no stranger to that team. They've raced regularly together. They've now had one of every result on the podium. A oh, second, wow. a third, and now a win completes the set for AF Corsa number 83. This, this is, though, the GTE podium. 93 crew already there. Martin Rumpu brought that car home and grabbed that podium position. Uh, uh, Michael Fassbender and Richard Leitz. It is the trio form the 16 car in second. Alessia Picariello, Ryan Hardwick and uh, Zach Robichon. But it is Kessel Racing that take the win, Johnny. And with their trio of drivers, Takeshi Kimura, Scott Huffaker and Davide Rigon, it will be the national anthem of Switzerland that we will hear on the podium. And the three Kessel Racing pilots joined by Kessel's team manager, Tiziana Borghi, on the top step of the podium as well. And uh, I'm sure that uh, she'll be straight there through the champagne in a moment or two as well to crack that open. I uh, should say, by the way, this means that in the four years we've had Michael Fassbender in this championship, he scored an LMS points scoring podium at least once in each year now. Okay. That was fourth place in 2020, but that was when we had a number of, of uh, guesting cars because of the late start for the FIWC. So he scored points for podiums uh, in every year from 2020. Yeah. And by the way, thoroughly deserved this one. He did. Uh, I think he deserved better than a third place, and uh, that was eminently possible had he not been stuck on the exit of the final corner for over a minute, and not his fault that he ended up there either. Stuck in fifth gear, couldn't get down through the box in order to locate reverse, and there was no option to go forward. But yeah, it would be nice for a season for Michael Fassbender to get a little more than just one podium a year, and there is still the opportunity to do that with three I races to that's go. that's going to happen. I, 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 from the start, when we saw him hit the track for the first time this year, there's something of the confidence there that we've not seen necessarily in the previous years with Michael. And the best part for him is we will finish with two cracks in his home track, mm. where he's always been quick. That's at true. Portimao. Yeah, the Irish-German man based in Lisbon. Yes. And does a lot of work in Hollywood. Yes. But, you know, he's well-travelled. Uh, there's now a two-point gap between the 16 Proton Competition crew, who I think did lead the championship coming into they here. Did. Let me just they check. Did. Yeah, they did. Yep. But that cap has come down by a point. So it's now 45 plays, 43 to Kessel Racing. And then in third position, the 77 crew of Christian Reed, Gianmarco Liberato and Julian Andlauer, who drove spectacularly well, although couldn't hold Martin Rump back in the closing stages. Then it's Claudio Schiavone, Matteo Cairoli. Uh, they, were, they were the championship leaders, actually, in the 60 car. So they've dropped considerably now back to fourth position. Let's have more reaction now from Steph Wentworth in the pit lane. 
Now I'm joined by the GTE winners, the number 47 Kessel Racing. Takeshi Kimura, you started off. How was that for you, the start of the race? Uh, thank you for EMS. Thank you for Ferrari. Uh, thank you for uh, good year. Uh, very, this course very, very tough. tough. Uh, qualify, I'm sorry, but uh, let's face it, uh, not uh, good. Uh, uh, happy. Uh, he is a uh, happy birthday uh, present <laughs> for you. Yes, first and foremost, happy birthday. You brought the car home. Great birthday present to yourself, and I'm sure your teammates are all buzzing as well. Yes, yes. I'm so happy to be here to have. Um, uh, a good present for this uh, birthday so he's uh, 37 years old now and I, I really have to say many thanks to Kimura san he did uh, a good start a great start a great race out of trouble uh, he was uh, really on the queue fighting for the top three and then uh, Scott did the rest uh, he overtake uh, the 66 uh, he pulled away so amazing job also from uh, all the team Kessel that uh, work so hard and Ferrari that uh, give a lot of effort so very happy Scott, middle stint for you, but it was quite eventful. You had a lot going on, didn't you? Yeah, it was a lot. Um, yeah, we just needed to pass the 66 for the lead, and then once we got that off the outlap, uh, yeah, we held the lead and gave the car to Davide, and then he brought it home. All right, well, massive congratulations. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. All I'll say is, all I'll say is, I told you his name was Scott, but the graphic still says Gregory Huffaker. I suppose that's it's his given wind, name. It's just in it to wind you up. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe so. Don't, don't rise to it, John. That, I think, is perhaps the drive for Takeshi Kimura in the early stages. I'm not sure he's done. He may have done an equal drive, but nothing better than that. You know, It was a great team performance, Like wasn't Davide it? said, it was the foundation laid by the bronze driver, staying out of trouble and then handing the car over in one piece to Scott to do that middle stint. And you quite rightly said, Huffaker then really did make some did. decent ground in that middle portion of the race. It, it was the perfect GTE race for the European Le Mans series. All three of those drivers completely delivered on what the job was to do. The team turned them around brilliantly. Tiana and the, the uh, ladies and gents at Kessel Racing set it up nicely for them. This, though is going to be our LMP2 Pro and Podium. And it's another United Autosports crew, another guesting driver, Felipe Albuquerque with Andy Merrick and with Daniel Schneider. And then in second place, it's the Yilsa Racing Trio. 24. So this is Rodrigo Sales, Ben Hanley and Matthias Besch to the far side of the podium. And second place, but the win going, as we've already heard, for the AF Corsa trio of Francois Perodo, speaking very well, as he always does, with Steph Wentworth, Mathieu Vaxivier, and uh, returning to the Zebra team, as Alessio Rivera so expertly put it, uh, the Italian racer, who is the platinum. Big smile on his face as well to get such a good result. And the old band getting back together at AF Corsa and pulling off a tremendous result. Yeah, uh, Ben Barnacoats elsewhere. I'm well, just reading on my email that he's had a pretty good day himself uh, with his regular drive in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, but great stuff from the 83 crew. You're quite right, they had to take the fight to the 34. They overtook that car on track, let's not forget, before... of Italy, of course, for AF Corsa. And well done to Francois Perodo, Alessio Rivera, and Mathieu Vaxivier as the bronze, platinum, and gold drivers, respectively. That should put them right there in the championship again because of not such a good result for the 34 crew. Finishing ninth in LMP2 Pro, and at Lonnie Gleenan's two points versus the 25 that the 83 car will get, and an overall position of fifth, which is tremendous to be right up there in amongst the LMP2 regular teams. There are those that say splitting these classes doesn't work. I don't agree. 
And if that means that we have a bit of a topsy-turvy race and we've got a Pro-Am car in amongst the top cars, then so be it. Yeah. I also like which something I've forgotten actually earlier this morning because it's been a long day, but the fact that uh, the LMP2 Pro-Am is a bronze-only session as well, so it gives uh, re more responsibility to the bronze element. AF Corsa take the championship lead, amazingly, after the two victories for Racing Team Turkey. It just shows, after a sketchy result, that can plummet you, well, not exactly plummet you, three points it is, but after all the hard work from the opening couple of races, Racing Team Turkey with work to do now as we head to Spa with Charlie Eastwood, Louis Delatraz and Sally Jolic behind Francois Perodo and Macha Vaxavier. It's Ben Hanley, Matthias Besch and Rodrigo Sales for the 24 Nielsen crew in third, ahead of Ben Barnico, who's not been here this weekend. And then the cool racing squad of Alexandre Coigny, Malta Jakobsen and Nicolas Lapierre, who sadly did not get a race finish today after that damage to the 37 car. Well, that's one... Uh cool racing crew let's hear Steph who's down with another from LMP3 well, now I'm joined by the number 17 cool racing the whole team LMP3 winners let's start with you Adrian Chila you started off the race a great start from you Yes, I enjoy this race. It was fantastic. I'm so happy to be here. And Alex, we spoke to you before. You were very confident you guys were going to get the win. How happy are you to have secured it? Oh, really happy. As I told you before, this was the best outcome we could have. Today, everybody, Chila, me and Marcos, did the perfect thing. The team didn't didn't make any mistake and we just did what we had to do, you know, just uh, drive uh, safely, don't do any mistakes and at the end we did and at the end I think we deserve this win since a long, long time ago. And Marcos, you, you brought the car home at the end, you were pumping out massive laps, uh, are you buzzing with this win? Yeah, it was amazing. First of all, what he says, my team were amazing all the race, they make mega stints. I had to, to finish the job. Uh, it was good for my side also in the night and yeah, like he said, we really deserve this victory from round one we are really strong with the team no mistakes so yeah we stand the championship leave and yeah let's go to spa with with this rhythm you know all right thank you so much guys thank you thank well you. it's the second win of the season for marcus Sieber, adrian schiller and alejandro garcia after they took victory also in spain at the start of the year at barcelona so they will retain their championship leave and they will m massively increase it actually because of a poor result for the 31 crew uh, of uh, racing spirit of le mans can also clear up by the way they were penalized for not grounding the car at the pit stop 20 seconds added to ah. their race time but because of where the overall leader crossed the line that will not affect the overall result. Yeah, they were locked into position because the nearest car, WTM by Rinaldi Racing, a full lap down. So almost you can give them any sort of time penalty and it doesn't affect the race win. So they'll be very, very grateful for that. 12 crew and the 35 crew already on the podium for LMP3. Let's, give you, let's give you the names then. Ultimate, Eric Troyer, Mathieu, Luhay, Jean-Baptiste Luhay. That's what it means to call racing who win the race. But the WTM by Rinaldi Racing crew, Torsten Kratz, Leo Weiss, Oscar Tugno. And it will be the national anthem once again of Switzerland that we hear for cool racing taking victory in LMP3. So the second time during this podium sequence, the national anthem of Switzerland after Kessel Racing's success, LMP3 going the way this time of cool racing and a tremendous uh, result for Adrian Schiller, Marcus Siebert and Alejandro Garcia. Adrian Schiller, very excitable during his interview with Steph Wentworth, I thought. And he'll be even more excited when he sees the latest points standings as now the trophies are handed out by the Michelin 
correspondent. These cars running on the French rubber, of course. So very smart silver trophies now to Torsten Kratz on the right of shot, Oscar Tugno on the left, and standing in the middle, Leo Weiss. Go. There's the reaction then for the race win uh, down at Cool Racing. Again, LMP3 kept us guessing because of the timing of those longer mandatory stops, Graham, choosing to do them in different places, but uh, it all came neatly together at the end. I think the fact that they, they won by a lap is misrepresentative it is. again. It is. I mean, ultimately, I'm sure the Rinaldi crew will rue that. Just that timing, it would have been an awful lot closer. Can't take it away, Cool Racing played the game. Won it on the road. I didn't think they were there with an hour or so to go, but they came through and did it. And uh, they're going to get the dividends not just from the trophies of the champagne, but actually more important for the season with the points as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, they'll open up certainly on their nearest rivals in the championship coming here to Aragon, a massive 25 points. So it's now 66, plays 40. Incredibly, the 31 racing spirit of Le Mans crew, who did not get classified at the end of that race, are still in second, three points ahead of the second place finishing team, WTM by Rinaldi Racing. It's Euro International's number 11 car that will be fourth on 28 and then into Europol competition, just a point back. So these are the drivers, Adrian Schiller, Alejandro Garcia and Marcus Siebert jump from 41 points all the way up to 66 and have a 26-point advantage. That's more than a race win uh, over Antoine Ducat and Jacques Wolfe. Three of the top five in the championship failed to finish this, uh, this, this evening, and that's why the points difference is what it is. But remember, Johnny, we're only halfway there. I know, I know. There's a song in that. Uh, 75 points in total for race victories, plus the three extra for the pole positions. It's been quite a day, and uh, I take Oli Jarvis's point entirely in the fact that it didn't feel like qualifying was even today, but it definitely was early this morning. The night race returns for the European Le Mans series, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it, Graham. Oh, absolutely. It's been a bit of a hit. I think there's things to think about in terms of the timing of this event, but it's been a great welcome from the staff here at Motorland Aragon, and uh, the region is beautiful. Uh, we've been well received, and uh, I look forward to what happens when we see the calendar for next year in just, I hope, just a few years' time. A few, a few days' time. A few days' time. Well, certainly uh, maybe a month's difference in terms of where this race fits in the, in the year might make a slight change in the weather. September date, maybe, for Aragon next year. We'll wait and see. We hope you've enjoyed it. From Graham Goodwin at DailySportsCard.com and me, Johnny Palmer, we'll see you in a few weeks' time at Spa-Francorchamps. Bye-bye for now.